The word democracy comes from the Greek words of demos, which means people, and kratos, which means power or rule. So, democracy basically means the rule of the people. Democracy first started as a direct democracy in Greek cities, notably ancient Athens, where people came together to speak about their concerns and opinions in front of rulers of the city-state, and directly voted on new rules and laws. Here is considered as the birthplace of democracy. For the very first time, decisions were made by the people instead of rulers. But sadly, the ancient Greeks did not see all people equally. Slaves, women, children, and the people who did not have a land weren't allowed to vote. This is what we call a flawed democracy today. After the Greeks lost their power and influence in the first century AD, their early forms of democracy were also fading away until the Magna Carta was signed in 1215 which prevented the King of England to do whatever he wanted and said that even the King had to follow the country's rules and laws which were written in the Constitution. Today, most democracies are indirect or representative, which means that you can't vote for a new law yourself, but you can vote for people who then become lawmakers and present your interests. But democracy isn't just about voting. It's about everything to protect the best interests of the people, no matter what is their race, gender, political opinion, or religion. These interests can be human rights, quality of life, infrastructure, and many more. Modern democracies divide power into three different branches. The legislative, the people who make the law, the executive, the people who make sure that you obey the law, and the judiciary, who judge you if you commit a crime. These three are independent and work following the process, checks and balances, which means all the work must be clear and fair. And very important, the people who have power also must follow the law and not exceed their authority. In addition, a democratic government must work in a way that reflects the wish, feeling, desire, and values of the society that it governs. This is also known as the general will, which is a concept developed by the famous Swiss philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. One of the problems of democratic voting is that the biggest groups of people always have the most power, and that's why a good democracy also has laws to protect the rights of its smaller and weaker groups. A democracy where the majority chooses to separate, expel, or injure its minority is not a functioning democracy. So what do you think now about democracy? Winston Churchill once said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. Do you agree? Thank you, Minute Videos. And yes, folks, today is September 15th which the United Nations designated as the International Day of Democracy. Also, since this year falls under the elections of 2020 within the United States, including the office of the President of the United States, this may, it makes this video even more special. So, in this video, I'm going to explain, be explaining to you all, with some help of course, on how to save America's democracy. Alright, so now let's get started on, with this first video. What is democracy? And I know what you're probably thinking, the video at the, fr the, vi the first video. The first video that, that was shown, shown probably explain what democracy is. Yes, but for some it may, but for some it may be hard to understand. So, it was a, it was a short introduction, and and for some it may be hard to understand. So we're gonna, so for this, so for this one, il, illustrate, YouTube user illustrate to educate is gonna. Is gonna explain his th his or her thought thoughts about democracy and what it means to him or her. All right, so let's get started.
Daniel Zim correction Daniel Zimmerman create what is democracy created and written by Daniel Zimmerman so look look we have to get with the basics first in order to understand in order to help in order to save de America's democracy you need to know understand what democracy is okay so let's get let's get started heard it now What is What is democracy? Democracy is a belief that focuses on the people. But more importantly, it focuses on the individual. It revolves around you. In a democracy, we take into account our own self-interest, or what we want, as well as what is best for the common good, or best for everyone. Democracy is not only a belief, but also a great power when it is put into practice. Democracy gives the people power to have a voice, which is important because we all want to be heard. However, equally important to being heard is the responsibility to listen to each other and respect others' opinions. But in the end, we have the right and freedom to make our own choices. In a democracy, you have the power to choose. The superhero Spider-Man taught us that with great power comes great responsibility. The power that we have to make our own choices comes with a lot of responsibility in a democracy. Our responsibility in a democracy starts with us. First off, if he's <clears throat> if he's referring to the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, it was it was Uncle Ben that Ben Park Ben Parker that uh, taught taught Peter Parker how, about great power comes great responsibility. That was just a correction status. So let's continue. <clears throat> it means that we take responsibility for our actions. Unlike some people who don't at all. For example, when we break certain rules or laws, there are consequences that follow. On the other hand, we can be educated and informed about the world so that we can make positive and worthwhile contributions as citizens. Agreed. In a democracy, it is important that we do our part by being contributing members of society. One way we can be helpful in society is by doing service in the community or helping a neighbor, friend, or someone we do not know too well. As you become an expert at democracy, you can understand your role as a citizen of the United States of America. E pluribus unum, or one out of many, is the motto of the United States. It suggests that even though there are many people of different race, culture, religion, and beliefs, you are one, and one person can make a difference. Just like what Stan Lee said. <laughs> I still wish he was here, here today. Your voice counts. Your choices make an impact in the world. Now it's up to you to do your part. Thank, thank you. All right, this next video shows how you how elections within the United States work. Current currently work. Who votes? Where, why, and how? The US Congress and presidential elections. Voting. 
the people's chance to decide who they want to run their country and represent their interests. But how does it work in the United States of America? Across the pond, voting is quite different. Like the UK Parliament, the United States Congress has two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Unlike the UK, there are public elections for both houses, and a third, separate election is held to choose a president. In the US, the president is both the head of state and the head of government. In the UK, these roles are carried out separately by the monarch and the prime minister. The House of Representatives in the US Congress is designed to give a voice to the people of every local voting region of America. Members of the House of Representatives stand for re-election every two years. Each state is split into districts and each district votes for one representative. The number of districts depends on the population of each state. For example, California, the most populous state, is split into 53 districts, so has 53 representatives. But Alaska, which is huge but has a really small population, only has one district and therefore only one representative in the House. Like the UK House of Commons, the election system is first past the post, so the candidate with the most votes in each district wins a seat in the House of Representatives. The party that wins a majority of seats in the House takes control. The ideal situation for a president is that the House is controlled by their own party. However, with elections held every two years, there's always a midterm election in the middle of a president's time in office. If the public thinks that the president's not doing a great job, they can vote in more members of the opposition party, making it more difficult for the president to pass laws. The Senate in the US Congress, like the House of Lords in the UK Parliament, is sometimes called the Upper House. George Washington described the Senate as the saucer that cools the coffee meaning that it's their job to scrutinise and question all proposals made by both the House of Representatives and the President, before voting to decide whether they should proceed as law. Senators, like members of the House of Representatives, are also elected to their seats by the public. Senators serve six-year terms, and elections are staggered, so... Sorry. Senators serve six-year terms, and elections are staggered, so every two years, a third of the senators run for re-election. Each state is represented by two senators, regardless of its population. And again, the first-past-the-post voting system is used, so the candidate with the most votes wins. So how do Americans choose their leader? Well, presidential elections take place every four years. The two main parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, host big get-togethers where they choose their presidential candidate, the person they think will be the best leader for the nation. The winning candidate then chooses their vice presidential candidate, also known as their running mate, to help support the campaign. Presidential candidates usually choose someone with different areas of skill or knowledge so they present voters with the best package. Together, they're known as a ticket. Presidential candidates from both parties then start out on massive election campaigns to gain as much voter support as possible. They travel across the country and hold great big campaign rallies where they set out their policies and their ideas for the whole country. These campaigns cost money, lots of it. So both candidates have large campaign teams who help raise the tens of millions of dollars needed to keep them afloat. When it comes to election day, the public go to the polls to vote for one presidential ticket. So far, so easy. However, the public don't vote directly for their choice of president. Instead, a system called the Electoral College is used. Each state is allocated a number of electors that will make the final choice. A state has the same number of electors as it does senators and representatives. In most states, all the electors will vote for the presidential ticket which receive the most support in the public vote. Finally, the presidential ticket with the most Electoral College votes becomes President and Vice President of the United States of America. So that's how things work in the US. A democracy like the UK but on a much larger scale. Okay, thank you. Now this video, now this video is for those with special needs. Now this <coughs> mainly for teen, teens with teens, or actually those who are legal, who can leak who are at the age where they can legally vote, but have special needs and general education students alike.
is important. All right, so let's take it, take it away. Hello, I'm Susan Traw, author of Transition to Life and Daily Living Skills. And today I want to talk to you about voting and elections, because elections matter. Your vote matters. It matters. And because of that, I want to talk to you about how to vote and how to vote safely during this pandemic. So let's get started. What, you say? Elections don't matter. What are you talking about? Politicians are all alike. Elections are just about voting for the lesser of two evils. But think about this. If you're a conservative, you're happy that Trump won the last election because he did things that you approve of. One, he appointed two pro-life Supreme Court judges and some hundreds of pro-life federal judges throughout the country. He has vowed to reverse Roe v. Wade, and those judges go a long way to fulfilling that pledge and enacting other conservative decisions for decades to come, because each judge serves a lifetime term. Number two, he enacted tax reform that lowered corporate tax rates from 35% to 21% permanently and provided a temporary benefit to many individuals and families. Number three, he defeated the ISIS caliphate, thereby making America safer and keeping his promise to fight and defeat terrorism in the Middle East. Number four, he is providing law and order while he sends in troops to fight the riots in cities like Portland. But it and that's from a conservative point of view, which is no, not the case. Case. Anyway, if you're a liberal or a progressive, as represented by Joe Biden, the Democratic presidential candidate, you see things very differently. Number one, Trump's executive orders have set back women's rights. LGBTQ rights, transgendered rights, and the rights of people of color by decades. Number two, his refusal to acknowledge the science regarding the COVID-19 pandemic has cost over 180,000 American lives and caused the largest unemployment rates since the Great Depression, while his attacks on the Affordable Care Act have threatened health care for millions during a pandemic. Number three, by reversing clean water regulations, the Clean Air Act, logging and drilling on federal land, and auto emission standards, the Trump administration is ignoring the warnings of climate change. Number four, he is turning a blind eye to the real cases of police brutality and systemic racism in this country, despite unprecedented protests throughout the nation, while at the same time supporting dictators around the world. Two very different views of our country. And yet, the election was decided by just a slim margin of votes with Trump winning by about 80,000 votes in three key states. And George W. Bush won the presidency in 2000 by only 540 votes. 540 votes. That, and that was with the Electoral College, not the, they didn't win the pop, those two didn't win the popular vote. Does each vote matter? You betcha. Millions of people all over the world have died for your right and their right to govern themselves, to make the decisions about who represents them and what happens in their country. It is our sacred right, 
our responsibility to honor their sacrifices and use our power to determine what kind of country we are. These are scary times. There's a pandemic out there that makes voting a risky business. So you need to make a plan. If you can, vote by mail or absentee ballot. Vote early. Mail in your ballot early or deliver it to your official ballot drop site. If you must go to vote in person, allow plenty of time. Wear a mask. Social distance. To find out how to vote in your state, go to nbcnews.com forward slash plan your vote. For deadlines, vote by mail directions, and specific information on voting requirements for your state. And if you need more information on voting, Daily Living Skills has a bundle pack to help you become more educated about the voting system. Voting teaches about the act of voting, defines Democrats and Republicans, and explains how to know if you tend to lean conservative or liberal. Understanding Government describes the three branches of government and their duties along with your responsibilities and rights under the Bill of Rights. Fact or Fake News helps you understand what fake news is and how to spot it and not fall for it. It also provides resources to get the facts about issues and propositions. Find these books and a free voters packet on my site at www.teacherspayteachers.com forward slash store forward slash Susan dash Traw. Now is not the time to sit on the sidelines and run from your responsibilities. You know that I always encourage you to be your best self and to move into adulthood with responsibility. Voting and knowledgeable voting goes a long way toward being a responsible adult. You can do this and you should do this. Here are the websites you need. Educate yourself and then go out and vote. Thank you. And I really hope to see bunches of you with the I Voted sign up on your chest. Congratulations on becoming an adult and good luck to you as you go out and become a responsible citizen. You're welcome. Susan Traw. You better think, think, think about what you're trying to do to me. Think, 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 that you might go let yourself be free. Oh, freedom, 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 freedom. With the tw Okay. Okay, with the net. Okay, the net. Okay, so here's the bad news about America, United, the United States. It isn't a true democracy. It come, and for those who don't believe me about that, here. Those who don't believe me, here's the proof. Here's the pr here's the proof. With the 2016 U.S. presidential election in full swing, many candidates have been praising American democracy. In an interview with Time, Hillary Clinton said, we have to knit this democracy back together. 
Clearly, the presidential election is the purest expression of the democratic process, right? Well, not exactly. In fact, not only is the election non-democratic, but America itself is not a real democracy. It turns out that there are almost no modern countries which would be considered true democracies. Instead, countries we consider democratic are actually forms of representative democracy as opposed to a direct democracy. In a representative democracy, citizens vote for elected officials who collectively vote in the place of citizens and are expected to represent their best interests. Although that's a step above having a monarchy or oligarchy you didn't vote for, it isn't a direct democracy. A direct democracy enables citizens to vote directly on every law, ordinance, and appointment. Only in Switzerland are there small regions with forms of direct democracy, although the country as a whole is still representative. In the United States, citizens instead vote for congresspeople who represent their constituents. In the case of the presidential election, citizens don't even vote for the president. Instead, they vote for their state's position in the electoral college. This is where every state is given a certain number of votes, and in most states, all of those votes go towards whichever candidate is chosen by the majority. The state's electoral votes are intended to represent the state's population, but the country's popular vote doesn't decide elections. In the year 2000, Al Gore lost the US election, but actually got more votes than George W. Bush. So doesn't this subvert the Founding Fathers' original intention? No, it was the Founding Fathers themselves who made sure there was no direct democracy. In the Federalist Papers, James Madison wrote that democracies were spectacles of turbulence and contention and incompatible with personal security or property rights. The problem with a direct democracy is that it often leads to the tyranny of the majority. This is when small groups are oppressed because the majority is unaffected by their oppression. Instead, modern representative democracy allows disproportionate representation and protection to those minority groups. There are also certain rights which are enumerated in the Constitution instead of allowing the public to vote on them. This system combined makes the US a constitutional republic and not a true democracy. In a nutshell, the United States and other modern democracies have no real reason to be truly democratic. Not only does a representative government function more smoothly, it takes care of those who would otherwise be ignored. With the exception of some local governments which do see direct democracy from their citizens, the rest find it easier to choose someone who represents their interests. So why isn't America a true democracy? Because according to the Founding Fathers, a true democracy simply doesn't work. On another note, this episode is brought to you by Squarespace, which will help you build a website even if you have no idea what you're doing. They'll give you a free domain name when you sign up for a year, and if you type TestTube in at checkout, you'll get an extra 10% off. Squarespace, you should. And you should also be glad that while the US isn't a real democracy, it also isn't a dictatorship. There are still a lot of countries that have dictators, and you can check out which ones by watching this video. The word is often used interchangeably with terms like tyranny, monarchy, totalitarianism, autocracy, despotism, and even sometimes with words like republic and democracy. For example, North Korea's full title is the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea. Thanks for watching. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button for more Test Tube News videos every day. Thank you. Now the next. Now the next video. Eye symptoms keep coming back. Inflammation in your eye might be to blame. Now the next video is going to tell you how how should demo is it like a question. How should democracy really work? Well, let's find out. The term democracy has taken on many different meanings throughout history. Today, the term is so broad that even countries with seemingly undemocratic political structures still call themselves democracies. So then, what is a democracy? Well, simply put, a democracy is a system of governance where everyone in the group gets an equal say in what happens to the group. That's why the roots of this word are demos, which is Greek for people, and kratia, Greek for power. The people hold the power. The ancient Greeks from around the 5th century BC are generally credited with officially establishing this as a political philosophy, but it may have emerged even earlier. The concept of democracy is simple, fair, and pretty much common sense, except when it's not. Take for instance the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, aka North Korea, or the Democratic Republic of Congo, 
Despite their names, they are among the least democratic nations worldwide, according to the Economist Intelligence Unit. Both of these countries have long-standing authoritarian rulers not elected by popular vote. Even the United States, a famous beacon of democracy, does not reportedly give all people equal power in the government. A recent Cambridge Journal report found that the economic elite call most of the shots, and that the popular majority does not rule. Political commentator Noam Chomsky also says that the lower 70% have no influence on policy whatsoever, and that America is not a democracy, but a plutocracy, aka a government by the wealthy. The word democracy doesn't really have a definite meaning anymore, because the spectrum of governments to which the term is applied is so broad, and essentially no major government actually fits the bill of a true democracy. Instead, many nations have democratic aspects to their government. Scandinavian nations like Norway, Sweden, and Iceland are usually considered the most democratic in the sense of government accountability to the people. In general, democracy is important to every nation's political system. When people have a voice in the government, they have more trust in it. This can reduce social unrest and civil wars. The EIU reports that progress towards democracy worldwide continues with globalization, increasing education rates, and the growing middle class. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe to TestTube. We're going to be looking into other forms of government soon, and we want your input. Chime in with your suggestions in the comments down below. And if you want to check out our new channel, Seeker, check out this video about how the board game Monopoly was originally created as propaganda. Thanks so much for watching. We will see you in the comments. Thank you. Now, after this next video, we're going to take a, we're going to go to commer, we're going to go to commercial. So, so this video should be taken into account, taken heed for future for not only this election but also future elections whether they be the president president of the united states congress senator or anywhere else around or anywhere else around the world so so take heed on this so take heed on this video as robert reich explains the seven signs of tyranny if they if they're gonna if they act like a if they're addicted if they're going to be a dictator when, when in power, don't vote for them. As tyrants take control of democracies, they typically do seven things. Number one, they exaggerate their mandate to govern, claiming, for example, that they won an election by a landslide even after losing the popular vote. Criticize any finding that they or co-conspirators stole the election and repeatedly claim massive voter fraud in the absence of any evidence in order to have an excuse to restrict voting by opponents in subsequent elections. Number two, they turn the public against journalists or media outlets that criticize them, calling them deceitful and scum, holding few, if any, press conferences. Instead, they communicate with the public directly through mass rallies and unfiltered statements. Number three, they repeatedly lie to the public, causing the public to doubt the truth and to believe fictions that support the tyrant's goals. Fourth, they blame economic stresses on immigrants or racial or religious minorities and foment public bias or even violence against them, threaten mass deportations, registries of religious minorities, and the banning of refugees. Fifth, call anyone who opposes them an enemy and hit back hard at them, questioning their motives or their character. Attribute acts of domestic violence to enemies within and use such events as excuses to beef up internal security and limit civil liberties. Number six, they appoint family members to high positions of authority, appoint their own personal security force rather than a security detail accountable to the public, and they put generals into top civilian posts. Finally, number seven, they keep their personal finances secret and draw no distinction between personal property and public property, profiteering from their public office. Consider yourself warned thank you thank you robert reich does any of those facts sound familiar <laughs> sounds like trump in the worst way
All right. All righty, we're gonna. We'll be right back, folks. Welcome back, everybody. Now, now this video is going to be is an almost an hour long. It's an exam. It shows how Hitler turned Germany into a from a democracy into a dictatorship. The reason the reason I'm showing you this is because if it can. Just 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 a just a second just a second. Oh. My mother wanted me to know what what I'm on for dinner. Anyway, if we can, if we get, if we find out, find out how we did it, we can prevent it in the future. We can prevent it in the future for all countries, but mainly the United States. Biggest one. All right. Alrighty. So we prepared 52. All right, 52. Fifty two minutes and twelve twelve seconds and that and that start and that starts now and that starts now. I mean fifty two minutes and twenty seconds, not twelve seconds. <laughs> Sorry. That starts now. The image of Adolf Hitler, the Fuhrer, leader of the Nazi Party, casts a long shadow over the second half of the twentieth century. A vision of incomprehensible evil that endures today. But behind this figure was an ordinary man. A master manipulator whose talent for public speaking and deep understanding of how to effectively use propaganda propelled him to ultimate power. That's their propaganda machine. In power, Hitler and the Nazi party would build a propaganda and terror machine to persuade, coerce, and ultimately mobilize the population of Germany. Defining the Nazi state through the notion of strength through unity. One people, one Reich, one Führer. Power and persuasion. Hitler's appointment as Chancellor of Germany on the 30th of January 1933 was celebrated that night by thousands of party members marching through the streets. An instant and overt display of Nazi party power and influence. But in reality, he was the head of a coalition government with only two other members of the Nazi party in his cabinet. Hermann Goering and the lawyer Wilhelm Frick. Hitler's first radio address as Chancellor on the 1st of February 1933 had to be approved by his cabinet and revealed the new role he would play, that of the moderate politician. For a time after, after Hitler became Chancellor, he seemed to tone down his rhetoric a little. There was very much a sense of, OK, now we're in power, we'll do things more by the book. In this speech, Hitler avoided anything that wouldn't appeal to a broad base carefully chosen language conveying a positive outlook. Conspicuously absent from this speech was any sign of anti-Semitism. Two days later, his speech to German Navy and Army commanders had a markedly different focus. In it, Hitler declared that only battle can save us and everything else must be subordinated to this thought. What Hitler did was really not present a consistent image, but a whole number of images. Depending on the audience, there was a civic Hitler for the civic-minded. There was a revolutionary Hitler for the revolutionaries. There was a holy Hitler for the church, implied at least. So everyone could, in other words, read into Hitler what they wanted to see. 
What followed was a year of considerable change, in which Hitler would establish absolute power through propaganda of persuasion and terror, compelling Germans to flee, comply, or convert to their cause. Exerting control over every aspect of German culture and ideology. On the night of the 27th of February, 1933, Hitler would be given his first major propaganda opportunity as Chancellor. When a fire broke out in the Reichstag, Germany's parliament building, a young communist was arrested at the scene. The fire fed neatly into Hitler's narrative of anarchy, his promise to restore order, and the communist as enemy saboteur. Hitler capitalized on this by issuing a decree on the protection of the people and the state, suspending the right to assembly, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press. It gave his regime the power to suppress publications and arrest political opponents without specific charges. They made it clear that anybody who um, resisted them was going to have a nasty time. And uh, that very quickly established their authority. Never underestimate the weapons in the, in the hands of the state um, that can be used to dominate a population and control a population. Less than a month after the fire, Hitler stood under the looming presence of the swastika and presented his enabling act to Parliament. Dang ads. The Hold on. Managing your projects shouldn't feel like this. The bill would allow the Nazi party to bypass the usual parliamentary due process, the country's constitution and the president, to pass their own unilateral laws. The Enabling Act was passed by the majority of the Reichstag. While armed members of the Nazi party's own police and military forces, along with right-wing paramilitary group, the Steel Helmets, stood at every door and surrounded the building. Hitler had finally gained legislative control of Germany, aided by the Nazi party's intimidation tactics. Basically, he took over the engines of power. So the police, the administration, everything which gives a state the power to exercise power. Um, and he used it very ruthlessly. Using the Enabling Act, Hitler would enact a range of legislation aimed at marginalizing, disempowering, and removing the Jewish population of Germany. On the street, his intimidation apparatus was trading off the persuasive power of fear. Groups like the SA, who had merged with the Steel Helmets in June 1933. The Gestapo, the Nazi secret police headed by Hermann Goering, founded to monitor and quash political activity dangerous to the regime. And Hitler's personal bodyguard, the Schutzstaffel, or SS, which had grown by 1933 into an elite group of 52,000 men, led by Heinrich Himmler. The role the SS, the SA and the Gestapo played as far as Hitler's attempt to create a kind of image uh, of the Reich was of strength, but also of violence. And this element of violence or the threat of violence was very much a part of Hitler's politics. The SA, SS and Gestapo were an extension of the Nazi propaganda machine, agents of control and chaos, instigators of violence and protest in the streets, Enforcers and security men marching in unison at rallies and demonstrations. As alles es heilt, die große Zeit ist jetzt angebrochen. Deutschland ist nun erwacht. Da möchte ich euch jetzt danken, dass ihr nicht Banken geworden seid, dass ihr mich in der Zeit nicht verlassen habt. Denn nur euch allein ist ja das alles zuzuschreiben. Wenn ihr damals gegangen wärt, niemals wäre Deutschland mehr gerettet worden. For weeks after Hitler was made Chancellor, the SA and Nazi Party members had been assaulting and imprisoning Jewish people targeting their businesses for raids and violent attacks. 
On the 1st of April 1933, Goebbels formalized this into an organized campaign, orchestrating a boycott of Jewish businesses across Germany, using his resources as head of the new Ministry for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. Heute Morgen um 10 Uhr hat der Bankrott begonnen. Er wird bis um die Mitternachtstunde fortgesetzt. Er vollzieht sich mit einer schlagartigen Wucht, aber auch mit einer imponierenden Manneszucht und Disziplin. Hitler realized that he had a, a real asset there, somebody who understood modern communication, who understood modern media, who was very much thoughtful in the way in which he was organizing things. So he gave him quite a lot of power in organizing the party propaganda machines. In 1933, when the Nazis seized power, anti-Semitism became the doctrine of the state, the state ideology, and the anti-Semitic regulations were immediately put into reality. Crucially, the core element was the notion that whilst not all Jews represented some kind of criminal threat to Germany, nevertheless there was, in a sense, some abstract collective Jewish threat to Germany. Some Germans didn't comply with the boycott but it was considered a political act to walk into one of these shops, a stand many weren't willing to make. So, in a sense, there was both genuine persuasion going on here about this notion that the Jews were a genuine threat. At the same time, there were huge incentives to go along and support this kind of propaganda, uh, whether one really believed in it or not, because it was the propaganda that showed what the regime believed and how the regime was operating. While it was only one day, it served its purpose as a statement of propaganda and policy. Fear in the Nazi regime became one of their most potent persuaders. I sometimes think that um, fear is underestimated, not in a direct sense. I mean, for most people, if you kept your nose clean, then you could get on with your life. You'd have to make the regular gestures, you'd have to raise your arm. Uh, you know, when he went into state offices and that kind of thing. Otherwise, the regime, you know, on the whole wouldn't, wouldn't bother you. But, at the back of your mind, it seems to me, if I'd been living in that regime, I would have been aware that if I did step out of line, then nasty things could happen to me. The party perpetrated the idea that if you stepped out of line, if you were seen to not be a good German, they would come for you. And come they did. The first concentration camp near the town of Dachau was opened on the 22nd of March, 1933. The first inmates of the camps, which opened as soon as he took part, were communists, they were liberals, they were conservatives. So he literally defanged the opposition by physically eliminating it. Many, of course, fled into exile. They were the clever ones. By July of that year, Dachau and other hastily established camps around Germany held almost 27,000 people. Many had been denounced by friends and neighbors. None had been indicted or convicted at trial. At odds with this reality was the pervasive myth of the benevolent concentration camp rehabilitating its inhabitants. A stark example of how the Nazi party used propaganda to make their policies palatable, masking their true intent behind a facade of righteousness. Hitler was also fixated on unifying Nazi ideology and German identity, using carefully managed plebiscites to legitimize his policies and actions. Now these figures of course can be challenged, but insofar as they are a measurement of public opinion, they are worth considering. Manipulating public perception, using one of the pillars of democracy as a propaganda tool. The first of these referendums would seek endorsement for Hitler's foreign policy. 
the referendum asked Germans to literally internalize Hitler's rhetoric. Do you, German man and German woman, approve of this policy of your Reich government? And are you prepared to declare it to be your own view and your own will to solemnly profess your belief in it? Ich hoffe, dass heute alle mit Ja stimmen und die nationalsozialistische Bewegung wählen. Es gibt keine andere Entscheidung mehr. Of the 45 million Germans who voted, over 95% said yes. The question and the response were both products of a state where every poster, picture and slogan reminded you to conform to the notion of one people, one Reich, one Führer. There is one particular poster which I think encapsulates Adolf Hitler's imagery. And that's a famous poster in which he's painted. It's not a photograph, he's standing there in full colour, in his brown uniform. And the slogan is, one Volk, one Reich, one Führer, one people, one empire, one leader. And nowhere on that is mentioned the government or the party. It's linking those three key elements of Nazi propaganda, the people, the Volk, the Reich, the empire, and the Führer, the leader. It's a remarkable example of how the Führer is portrayed as almost godlike, bestriding Germany beyond the concerns of day-to-day -day bureaucracy. Behind the propaganda, the Nazi party were taking steps to align the realities of government with this vision. A revolution of power that involved intimidating, coercing and otherwise persuading Germany's remaining political parties to disband. Within a matter of months, Hitler and the Nazi party had completely dismantled Germany. The most dang, common dang question it. we get is what's the difference between level 3A and our exclusive level 3A plus? Germany's democratic multi-party system. While Hitler's power and influence grew, so too did the Nazi party's own paramilitary forces. But Germany's army viewed this privately controlled force that by mid-1934 was four times their size with unease. Army leadership saw the SA as a potential barrier to their own expansion. Hitler didn't want that at all. He wanted it to be subordinate to the party, simply a strong arm sort of movement for the party to basically beat up opponents and march through towns and generally give an impression, an image of strength and determination and action and so on. But he didn't want them being military. It was a problem Hitler would have to resolve. On the 29th of May, 1934, he ordered the SA to cease military exercises. This was followed over June and July by a violent bloodletting of the SA's command, including Ernst Röhm, one of Hitler's closest allies since the early years of the party. Röhm was very useful as a bully boy, a tough guy on the street, led the SA. But his belief was you wanted violent revolution, you seize power, you repeat the coup. And for Hitler, this was dated. This was out of fashion. It wouldn't work. Largely orchestrated by Hitler, Goering and Himmler, this period would later be known as the Night of the Long Knives. At least 70 party members were killed, but the figure was possibly as high as 400. And so after that, the SA was totally tamed and became really unimportant. It was replaced by the SS. They took over as the main sort of enforcers, the main terror organization of the regime from then onwards. Presented to the public as the quelling of a threatened revolt, it was widely supported as restoring order to an organization viewed as difficult to manage. What the depiction of an event does is uh, give us the regime's view of it. Uh, it doesn't tell us the truth of the event. The depiction of the event can be changed by the alchemy of propaganda into something entirely different. The interesting thing is that the German people were not prepared to interrogate these very uh, pastiche justifications. They looked the other way. They just accepted this uh, fait accompli of something absolutely appallingly degenerate, the random murder 
of a lot of key figures in their political civilization. Hitler capitalized on the narrative value of these events, declaring certain death for anyone who threatened the regime. Himmler benefited greatly from the coup. Already in control of the Gestapo, the Nazi secret police, his inimitable SS force was made its own independent organization, making him second only to Hitler. Hitler's path to absolute power was completely cleared when, on the 2nd of August, 1934, President Hindenburg died. Two weeks later, Hitler held another referendum to gain support for combining his position as Chancellor of Germany with the now vacated role of President. While turnout was low, almost 90% of voters agreed with his proposal. Hitler was now head of state and head of the government. In response, the Nazi party generated a cacophony of celebratory propaganda in images, radio, and print. Posters were distributed with such slogans as, Yes, Führer, we will follow you. The Nazi propaganda narrative of one people, one Reich, one Führer was finally reflected in Germany's power structure. While Hitler was consolidating power, Goebbels was using his propaganda ministry to gain control of German art, culture and education. The Nazis' control of art and culture was a fundamental part of their propaganda. Art has traditionally been a way in which dissent is expressed whether that's in the form of poetry, uh, music or indeed um, painting. But the Nazis were very quick to take full control of art, abolishing some or banning it on the grounds that it was decadent. On the 12th of April, school organisations declared a period of cleansing that would end in a ritualised burning of blacklisted books on the 10th of May, 1933. Bonfires were set up in Berlin, Munich, Frankfurt, Dresden and Breslau and lines of torch-wielding students and SA members flung books onto the pyre. Goebbels and other key party members watched as these un-German works were burned in front of the Berlin Opera House. He declared to the crowd that, out of these ashes, the phoenix of a new age will rise. These ritualized ceremonies held by torchlight, with singing, chanting and oaths made, were broadcast by radio around Germany. The Nazis targeted education as an important facet of their propaganda machine. Education was used to shape the nation and what the Nazis called the national community. So it was about fostering a sense of creation and belonging to the nation. And this took the form of all kinds of different um, changes to the, to the curriculum and to school textbooks. The National Socialist idea of the national community was in fact an exclusive club meant only for strong, healthy Aryans. Educational content produced by the Nazis provided a framework for justifying this. Textbooks began to incorporate anti-Semitism disguised as objective, biological or anthropological fact. One of them was called the poisonous mushroom. And again, it was just about really trying to show a whole gamut of allegations. So the Jew as a communist, the Jew as a financier. Classrooms became an important frontier for perpetuating Nazi ideology, disguised as education. The way that German was taught was also important too, so that there was a focus in education, in German lessons, not just on the language, but on the literature as well, and on folk tales and German myths and legends, as well as on components of the blood and soil ideology that meant that people were bound up to the nation and to the land. Germany's youth were considered incredibly important to the National Socialist movement. Their exposure to Nazi propaganda took place in and out of the classroom. The Nazis had a concept of 
total education. Um, this meant a combination of formal education in the school system, complemented by informal socialization, we could say. Membership in the Hitler Youth grew from around 100,000 members in 1932 to over 7 million in 1939. Groups like Hitler Youth and the League of German Girls indoctrinated children through exposure to Nazi publications and participation in Nazi party rallies, summer camps and almost militarized games. It was the idea of each German girl or boy playing their part in the nation, almost as building blocks to create an organic whole. And this organic whole would be the foundation of the future. So the youth were absolutely essential to everything that the Nazis did. In late 1933, Goebbels expanded his control over German culture by establishing the Reich Culture Chamber, or RKK, through his propaganda ministry. The RKK was made up of seven chambers, literature, film, theater, music, visual arts, press, and radio. You can see this is a pretty ambitious program Goebbels again brought his characteristic energy to this and had um, you know, the help of thousands of employees and uh, all, all, all manner of uh, resources. In an attempt to control public discourse, Goebbels mandated that every artist or journalist who wanted to practice in Germany had to apply to the RKK. Goebbels was particularly aware of the power of mass media. He required all films produced in Germany to be reviewed and approved by the RKK. And he identified radio as the most modern and important instrument of mass influence that exists anywhere. Dang Starting ads. out with any new project management software usually feels something like this. Where do you even start? Well... By 1932, there was a radio in one out of every four German homes. Goebbels sought to improve on that figure. The Nazi regime introduced a new radio set called the Volksempfänger, the People's Receiver. And this was a very cheap radio set which practically anyone could afford. So what this meant was that when there were Nazi speeches or Hitler speaking or one of the other key leaders or different messages that they wanted to get across, they could use the radio. When Goebbels took control of the Reich Broadcasting Company, it gave the Nazi party unfettered access to the airwaves for blatant propaganda programming. Goebbels also targeted German publishing, taking control of the assets of rival political parties and Jewish companies. Those still allowed to practice chose self-censorship, following daily directives from the press chamber. Goebbels, though, was very careful not to drum propaganda you know, and ideology into people, he very quickly told the press that they shouldn't bore people. He very quickly realized so that it didn't appear like propaganda you know, and ideology into people, he very quickly told the press that they shouldn't bore people. He very quickly realized that uh, what people wanted drum propaganda you know, and ideology into people, he very quickly told the press that they shouldn't bore people. I was very careful not to drum propaganda you know, and ideology into people, he very quickly told the press that they shouldn't bore people. He very quickly realized that uh, what people wanted was uh, basically uh, what they had before, and with a sort of judicious doses of propaganda, but carefully calibrated so that it didn't appear like propaganda. If you disobeyed directives, at best you would be fired. At worst, sent to a concentration camp. In response to the Nazis' tightening grip, hundreds of scientists and artists fled Germany. 
figures who had greeted the rise of National Socialism with deep hostility and concern. Over the course of the 1930s, 300,000 Germans would leave their country. Among them was Albert Einstein. The RKK sought to define what works expressed the narrow Nazi view of German culture. In 1937, they used their control over museums and theater to run an anti-Semitic exhibition called The Eternal Jew in Munich, supported by a similarly themed play run by the Bavarian State Theater. They wanted a very wholesome German art that emphasized myths like blood and soil, people's connection to literally to the German earth and to their German heredity as well, and how that could be portrayed in art. Over 400,000 people attended the exhibition, but even more attended their exhibition of degenerate art that targeted anything abstract or interpretive, which was visited by two million people. Turnout that reinforced the reach that art could have. The other thing that's quite important is the way that Hitler was portrayed in art as well. The artistic portraits that were made of him were also quite evocative, whether as the military leader in his uniform or as, the, as a kind of Teutonic messianic leader that was going to lead the nation to greatness again. Hitler and his supporters used every aspect of their control over German culture to perpetuate his cult of personality. The way Hitler created and staged and managed his own image is remarkably instructive into how the Nazi party actually saw Hitler too. Hitler actually separated himself in some ways from the Nazi party itself. He was portrayed almost as a king-like figure beyond the minor concerns of party squabbles, unimpeachable, unapproachable, and yet also the embodiment of German strength. The pinnacle of Nazi propaganda depicting Hitler the messianic leader was the 1935 film Triumph des Willens, or Triumph of the Will. Filmed as a documentary of the 1934 Reich Party Congress at Nuremberg. So sei dein unser Erlebnis an diesem Abend in jeder Stunde, an jedem Tag nur zu denken an Deutschland, an Volk und an Reich, an unsere deutsche Nation und das deutsche Volk sieht ein! Sieht ein! Sieht ein! It really represents the kind of edited quintessence of the party, its image of itself, its projection to the world of what it was. It is truly disturbing because it's a kind of militarized ballet in which it elevates certain human virtues like discipline and others it entirely uh, not merely neglects but throws into the rubbish bag. Uh, you know, you have to have a pointy blonde Aryan face and be athletic and disciplined and obey. Disciplined forces stand to attention in rows, cheering masses with arms raised as they hail in unison, children with blonde curls greeted by their Führer. The film also showcases the neoclassical architecture of the rally grounds, designed in part by Albert Speer. The architecture that Speer built for it is in itself a kind of filmic architecture, so it's that kind of austere neoclassicism that we associate with Nazi and fascist official architecture today, but it's also something that's specifically designed to look good for a camera. It's almost like a kind of grand Hollywood stage set, enhanced at the time by special lighting shows. Triumph of the Will, like the Wagnerian operas Hitler was known to love, used staging, lighting and music to amplify the emotional power of the story. Seeking to create and perpetuate an enduring mythology of the Third Reich. The Nazis were always conscious of propaganda not just affecting people in the moment, but also about how it would affect the way future generations would remember and recall their achievements. 
because they're not just adopting a neoclassical style for all official buildings of state, but they're also anticipating what these buildings would look like in the future, including in the very distant future. So what are they going to look like in a thousand or two thousand years' time? Will these buildings still be awe-inspiring once they're in a ruined state as the Acropolis is today? The rally itself was an expression of Nazi symbols, power, unity, cohesion, an artifact of party propaganda. Titled Reich Party Rally of Unity and Strength, the 1934 rally was the first since Hitler had successfully combined the position of Chancellor and President, taking comprehensive control of Germany. And only months after the Night of the Long Knives had resulted in a bloody upheaval of SA leadership. The rally and the film were also a work of propaganda turned inwards, aimed at the party itself, calling on all to come together. Deutsche Volk is glücklich in dem Bewusstsein, dass die ewige Flucht der Erscheinungen nunmehr endgültig abgelöst wurde von einem ruhenden Volk, der sich als Träger seines besten Blutes fühlen und dieses Wissen it's the moment that Hitler becomes a god. He is now no longer an immortal, and this is what Triumph of the Will is really doing. It's about the supremacy, the superheroism of Hitler, but also his superhumanity. He's no longer human. Long after Hitler had gained power, he continued to hold these rallies, aimed at mobilizing the German people and generating a kind of self-actualized acclaim for the Nazi party, displaying their own power and the rapturous celebrations of rally participants. In 1935, the rally became the site for the passing of Hitler's Nuremberg laws. Laws that severely limited civil rights of anyone the Nazis deemed undesirable, particularly for Jews in Germany. The Nuremberg laws paved the way for all subsequent laws and regulation, and there were more than 1,000 anti-Jewish laws. They all went back to the Nuremberg laws, and these legal process more or less also paved the way for the final aim of the Nazis to exterminate the Jews. The Nuremberg Laws only heightened the importance of the rally in the Nazi state. They would be held each year at Nuremberg until the outbreak. Today I'm going to show you how uh, to make a superfood that'll last a lifetime without refrigeration. And it's so nutritious you'll never have to stockpile another food. The food of World War II. The Nuremberg Laws only heightened the importance of the rally in the Nazi state. They would be held each year at Nuremberg until the outbreak of World War II. Each rally promoted through posters filled with Nazi iconography. The Nuremberg rallies were only one of many methods the party had for generating symbols of Nazi power and German strength rebuilt. One of the Nazis' greatest propaganda successes was the 1936 Berlin Olympics. The 1936 Olympics is dripping with Nazi propaganda. This is, in some ways, the opportunity for Nazi Germany to show its public face to the world. There'll be cameras there, there'll be reporters there. For the first time since the uh, Nazis took over the government in 1933, there's large-scale foreign visit to Germany, and they want to portray Nazi Germany in the very best possible light. This was a chance to present a sanitized version of Nazi Germany to the international community. Well, it had been managed at every level. Uh, gypsies had been removed to concentration camps. Most of the signs saying Jews forbidden were removed. It was a fantasy of Germany to present to the world. Hitler funneled massive resources into realizing this potential spending more to host the games than any previous Olympia. 
This included a new stadium, designed by Albert Speer in the neoclassical style that Hitler favored for Nazi architecture, built to hold 250,000 spectators. The Berlin Games were also treated as an opportunity for the Nazis to showcase the strength and efficiency of this new Germany, rebuilt from the ruins of World War I and the Great Depression. He's not merely satisfied with portraying the image of Berlin as a fabulous, modern and vibrant city. He also wants to show that the German race is on a higher level than those of others who are visiting the place. And it's actually a very effective propaganda tool. A narrative that was disrupted by the success of African-American athletes like long jumper Jesse Owens, who beat German Lutz Long. Over 45 countries, including the US, Great Britain, and France, participated in the Games. A fact that acknowledged the legitimacy of Hitler's regime, both within Germany and overseas. Remember that this happens after the Nuremberg Laws, after the opening of the concentration camps. There's an awful lot leaking out to the international uh, community about how truly wicked Nazi Germany was. But Germany produced this brilliant PR campaign. It really was effectively bribing journalists with marvelous facilities. Nothing like it had ever been done before in all of history. The Olympics in Berlin became another opportunity to generate propaganda artifacts and harness new technologies. The Berlin Olympics were the first sporting event to ever be broadcast live on television. Another display of the technical proficiency and superiority of Nazi Germany. Nazi propaganda often reflected Hitler's focus on the idea of building a modern, innovative Germany. Soon after becoming Chancellor, Hitler took control of the fledgling Autobahn program, a plan to build a network of intercity freeways across Germany. Breaking ground on construction became another ritual. Columns of marching figures with shovels replacing flags or weapons. So there's the sort of physical side of the propaganda. So the Autobahn and the motorways talked about putting the people back to work and being very important in turning around the economy entirely. Hitler dedicated the new roads to the German people and specifically the German worker. Commencement of works of building a new Germany in the Nazi image became another facet of the propaganda machine. Two years later, Hitler was starting to open sections of the network to great adulation. So what these successes were doing was distracting from the apparatus of terror and use of force and intimidation. It wasn't completely out of view, but people weren't focusing on it in those first five or so years of the Third Reich. Once Hitler was in power, for a time it seemed as if he was a very effective leader. He, he brought back a lot of um, public works. German economy, at least for a time, looked like it was booming. But it was a paper tiger. It was an economy that was only going to operate if they could bring in enough raw materials for, from abroad. And they could only do that if they could get territorial conquests, either by negotiation or by war. Hitler converted this need to expand into neighboring territories into a new propaganda narrative. The urgent need for Lebensraum, or living space, for the German people. The idea of Lebensraum was, was very much the hidden agenda. Uh, mein Kampf has a lot to say about it, and it had always been uh, the big theme in Nazi policy was to create an empire to the east where you'd settle German NCOs as farmers, and you'd have a servile, semi-slave, serf population carved out of the Slavic peoples. 
The way to achieve it for Hitler was through military power and the rearmament of Germany as a priority. Rearmament was sold as a way to return Germany to its former glory. It was also a valuable propaganda tool, a new industrial program that would be a way to get Germans back to work. This growing military power was paraded at party rallies and in marches through the streets. Symbols of new German strength and unity. But Liebentram wouldn't be achieved through military strength alone. Each new territorial gain was lubricated by the Nazi propaganda machine. Their first test came in 1935, when the population of the Saarland in southwest Germany were given the chance to vote for their fate. Stay under League of Nations control, or become part of either France or Germany. The Nazi propaganda ministry ran an intensive campaign, handing out cheap radios to make sure their message was heard in as many homes as possible, using those radios to spread false claims about their opponents and calling for the Saar to return home to the Reich. Over 90% of the population voted to return to Germany to join the Third Reich. In March 1936, Hitler flaunted the Treaty of Versailles by moving 30,000 troops into the Rhineland. A move justified through a mass media campaign that suggested Germany was under threat from France and Russia. When his actions drew little reaction from the international community, Hitler would tell a crowd in Munich, I go with the certainty of a sleepwalker along the path laid out for me by Providence. Bolstered by these successes, Hitler continued his program of expansion. His first major target of 1938 was Austria. The incorporation, or Anschluss, of Austria into the Reich was an orchestrated affair. Hitler's chance to demonstrate the new military power of his regime and a prime propaganda opportunity. The Anschluss, the return of Austria to the great German fatherland, was a natural move for him because he was Austrian. And as he said after they'd taken over, after the Anschluss, um, your son has returned to his homeland. Hitler used Nazi symbols and military strength to reinforce the idea that Austria was returning to the fold. The swastika flag hung on the facade of Austrian buildings. Hitler surveyed German tanks as they rolled through the streets of Vienna. Cheering crowds lined streets there to welcome the Nazi takeover. Well, the Anschluss was another of those masterpieces of propaganda that the Austrian people were univocal in wanting Hitler. The regime was quick to spread Nazi-controlled information, approved German newspapers replacing Austrian publications on newsstands. Hitler would also personally brief 400 media representatives on how the Anschluss should be presented. Then, in October 1938, Hitler took another step towards expanding his new empire when he successfully negotiated to bring the Sudetenland region of Czechoslovakia into Greater Germany. I think where it changes is, is Czechoslovakia. Because this is something you can justify with a good narrative built around some facts and ideas. So yes, what do you have in Czechoslovakia? You have a new state that was carved at the end of the First World War, but you've got a little bit of a problem because you've got quite a sizable German minority uh, in that area called uh, Sudetenland. So of course that becomes part of an agenda of um, irredentism, of trying to redeem certain territories in Germany. At the time, almost one in four people living in Czechoslovakia were German, yet only 8% of Czech broadcasts were in German. So instead, they were tuning in to Nazi broadcasts, fed on a diet of Nazi propaganda. 
Hitler went beyond the standard issues associated with Versailles revisionism. Rhineland, Austria, Tsar, reparations, remilitarization and so on. Into, I would like to break up the boundaries of another state and annex bits of territory that had been awarded to another state against their will was a change of attack uh, completely. He was stepping up the gears quite substantially. Many would welcome their return to the German fold, not the Jewish population. If they had any doubt about the terrible threat they faced, the events over one night in November 1938 would cast those aside. In response to the murder of a German diplomat in Paris by a young Jew, Goebbels made an impassioned speech calling for retaliation. It was the embodiment of Nazi rhetoric that all Jews were responsible for the sin of one. On the night of the 8th of November, 7,500 Jewish businesses across Germany and Austria were damaged or destroyed. For Jews, it has a deep impact on their consciousness and their memory because most Jews realize experiencing the burning of their synagogues, of their prayer houses, the destruction of their homes, the arrest of uh, 30,000 males, the murder of Jews, and the terror in streets, it symbolized the end of a German-Jewish relationship. The whole event was framed and contextualized by Nazi propaganda, dictating how the press could cover what had happened. Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, named in reference to the broken shop windows, led to a spike not only in Jewish emigration, but also suicides. The world was shocked by this fresh brutality enacted against Jews by the Nazi regime. But you see, that was part of the plan to actually inject fear into the global community. And the brutality was also part of the propaganda because they wanted people to fear them. They wanted people to be terrified of them, which they were. Despite the horrors of events like Kristallnacht, the international community remained unwilling to stop Hitler. No one wanted another war. As the negotiations to hand over the Sudetenland had shown, the Allies were willing to put up with a lot to avoid one. And so, 1939 began with Time magazine, naming Hitler 1938's Man of the Year. His influence on world events considered more significant, more comprehensive than any other figure. German conquests of other nations had so far been relatively bloodless, and the general sentiment among the German people remained opposed to the idea of all-out war. Hitler was faced with a propaganda challenge. There's no question that Germans didn't want war. What they wanted was, so to speak, what Hitler gained. And I think they'd have been very happy if he'd stopped, you know, the Sudan and, and, and left it at that. Despite everything that had happened since he came to power, Hitler still needed to mobilize the nation, to make them feel like there was no choice but to fight. Hitler needed the propaganda ministry to introduce a new angle. Up until 38, he had spoken of peace a lot his, in his speeches. But after Munich, he called the various editors of newspapers in to a big meeting and said, right, from now on, we've been talking peace. Now we've got to prepare the German population for war. Within this narrative, Hitler was positioned as wanting nothing but peace, a notion he would play to repeatedly each time he made a show of sincere peace offerings. But on the 1st of September, 1939, Hitler would confirm once again that the very opposite was true marching Germany towards the goal he had set out to achieve when he came to power. The ultimate Nazi narrative device. Conquest through military supremacy.
very informative, right? to them for more. Are you what? Very, very informative, right? Now, now before we continue, now before we continue, we'll be right. Here's a word. Here's a word from our sponsor. We're back, folks. <laughs> Did you enjoy that commercial break? Anyway, anyway, the next video is by the next video is by the Infographic Show, explaining the difference. It's a political comparison video explaining the difference between fascism and democracy. So, without further ado, let's get let's get to it. Throughout history, the world has seen the rise and fall of numerous types of political ideologies. From feudalism to monarchy, communism to democracy, humanity has always chosen some form of government over anarchy. With politics seeming to show up in everyone's newsfeed now more than ever before, and with the word fascist being slung around more and more, we thought it would be interesting to take a closer look at the two forms of government currently pulling at the United States in this episode of the infographic show, Fascism vs. Democracy. Fascism is a political philosophy that exalts nation and often race over the individual. The term is derived from the Latin fasces, which is a bound bundle of wooden rods, often including an axe with its blade emerging, an obvious symbol of power. Fascism is usually coupled with a centralized autocratic government, headed by a dictatorial leader that typically imposes severe social and economic regimentation, along with the forceful suppression of any opposition. Similar to socialism, the economic regimentation of fascism is a big pillar of the ideology. However, the two differ in that socialism seeks direct totalitarian control of the economic process, while fascism seeks similar control, but more indirectly. Socialism would do things like nationalize property explicitly and abolish market relations outright, while fascism would require property to be used for the good of the nation, but still allow for it to be owned privately, leaving the appearance of market relations while manipulating the market behind the scenes. On the other hand, democracy, which literally means ruled by the people, is a political system in which all members have an equivalent access to power. Democracy is looked at as one of the oldest political systems on Earth. While modern day democracies are quite a bit more complex, scientists believe that simple forms of democracy known as tribalism or primitive democracy could have existed for thousands of years. The origins for a more complex form of democracy is often thought to have originated around the turn of the 5th century BC with the Greeks in ancient Athens. The term democracy actually derives from the Greek word demos, which means people. However, even ancient Athens was a far cry from the democracies of today since large portions of their society weren't allowed to participate, most notably slaves and women. True democracies do not disqualify any group of people from having a say in government. Perhaps surprisingly, Finland is the first government to herald a more fair democracy at the national level when in 1906 it was the first to abolish both race and gender requirements for voting and serving in government. Other modern forms of democracy are seen today in places like Canada, Australia, and many countries in Europe. Fascism has seen quite a collection of political leaders try to spread its ideologies as well, even though it is a relatively new concept compared to democracy. Benito Mussolini turned Italy into the first fascist country in 1922, and he is known as one of the most prominent architects of fascism. Many fascist parties, like China's Blue Shirt Society, popped up soon after, and even places like Canada had fascist fringe groups. Adolf Hitler is also seen as a fascist, though some are misled by the name of his political party and think he was a socialist. Hitler adapted Germany to fascism in 1933 with the Nazi or National Socialist German Workers' Party. 
According to the officials of the Nobel Prize, only four places in the world actually claim not to be democracies. Vatican City, Saudi Arabia, Burma, and Brunei. In reality, regardless of how they label themselves, over 100 other countries have either non-democratic governments or only partially democratic governments. In today's political climate, there have been growing comparisons between the current president of the United States, Donald Trump, and fascist leaders of the past. Many cite his growing list of policies and executive orders to be akin to fascism. His views on suppression of the media and anyone that differs from or criticizes him can also come across as similar to suppression by fascism. Also, his Muslim ban, his promise to build a wall on the Mexican border, his seemingly sexist views on women, and his choice of cabinet picks rife with conflicts of interest all lead many to believe that America just elected its first fascist. Comparisons of the Trump regime to fascism is upsetting to many people because they feel the democracy of the US is being threatened. However, while the United States of America is often thought of as simply a democracy, it is actually a little more complicated than that. The United States is considered a republic rather than a democracy, but the most accurate term for the United States is representative democracy. The citizens of the US rarely, if ever, have direct say in their government, but rather they elect officials to make political decisions on their behalf. While this is hardly as firm as the grip of fascism, it is a little different than a direct democracy. Differing forms of government have risen and fallen, and will probably continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Do you think fascism can ever rise again? And if so, could it be a suitable form of government in today's society? Let us know in the comments below. And if you would like a quick daily comparison in your feed, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Come on, you know you want to. Follow us now. Links can be found in the description of our video. As always, don't forget to give this video a like, and make sure to subscribe so you can keep up with our show. Thank you. What does an Artless subscription cover? Well, everything. Do you cover broadcast commercials? We cover everything. But now I have 50,000 yeah. subscribers. Awesome. Still covered. But what everything. If, wait, and if I'm filming a show? Everything. But my channel views? Everything. Wow. Cool. One price, one simple license. We've got you covered. He's a okay, now this next video. Okay, now this next video. Is from Vox, the obscure, the obscure research that predicted Donald Trump. To learn more, go to this site here, Vox, or and her analysis. Read more Amanda Amanda Taub, Taub's feature, or this here. After Trump, how authoritarian voted? Authoritarian in the political science that explains Trump. You know what I say to that. You know what I have to say to that. Okay, now let's play this video. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. The 2016 Republican presidential nominee disregards the norms of adult behavior. He disregards the norms of American democracy as we know it. It should be heartbreaking to every American that we have a front runner that suggests there will be a religious test for anybody who wishes to come to our shores. 
He's so unusual, his rhetoric at times so extreme, that political experts and commentators were blindsided by his rise. We better be ready for the fact that he might be leading the Republican ticket next. <laughs> I know you don't believe that, but I want to go on. <laughs> How did Donald Trump attract such broad support within the Republican Party? And what does it mean for the U.S. beyond this election? And it turns out that this is a question that can be answered to a really surprising extent via this niche field of political science. It developed a theory about what's called authoritarianism. We're not talking about dictatorships. Authoritarianism is a term political scientists use for a worldview that values order and authority and distrusts outsiders and social change. And when authoritarians feel threatened, they look for strongman leaders. Leaders who are punitive, who target out groups, and who have a simple, forceful leadership style that makes them feel strong. And if you were going to grow that candidate in a lab, I'm going to bomb the shit out of him. He would look a lot like Donald Trump. When you get these terrorists, you have to take out their families. They, they care about their lives. Don't kid yourself. Mr. But they Trump. say they don't care about their lives. You have to take out their families. Authoritarianism is not, in and of itself, necessarily a partisan issue. For most of this country's history, authoritarians were likely divided between the two parties. But now, only one of the parties really appeals to them. What happened was the Republican Party started to embrace what it referred to as traditional values. Um, and it stood against a series of major social changes in this country. After initially supporting civil rights, Republicans began courting Southern white voters who opposed racial integration. They turned against the Equal Rights Amendment, denounced abortion, and later fought against same-sex marriage. Our nation must enact a constitutional amendment to protect marriage in America. More recently, foreign threats like terrorism have become major political issues, with Republicans taking positions that align with authoritarian fears and preferences. So Mark Hetherington and Jonathan Weiler, two political scientists, they tracked data over several decades and they found that authoritarian voters were shifting into the Republican Party. So that means that when authoritarians become scared, when they become activated by a particular social change or issue, the Republican Party can't ignore them. And they are a ready-made constituency for a candidate like Donald Trump. Are you going to have a massive deportation force? You're going to have a deportation force. I would bring back waterboarding, and I'd bring back a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding. Yeah. Testing people for authoritarianism is a bit tricky. You can't necessarily just ask people, you know, are you really freaked out by social change? Do racial differences unsettle you? Do you support strongman leaders? Because those are very sensitive questions and people won't necessarily answer them honestly. So instead, political scientists ask people about something more neutral, their parenting preferences. Please tell me which one you think is more important for a child to have, independence or respect for elders, obedience or self-reliance. These questions seem like they're about raising children, but really what they're asking people is how much they value order and authority. So when political scientists tested these four parenting questions against the behaviors that they knew authoritarians exhibited, they found out that the correlation was very close. It was very predictive, at least for white voters. Using this four-question test, Vox worked with Morning Consult in February 2016 to pull a large sample of likely voters. Our results yielded a few really interesting things. The first one was that, yes, scoring high on the authoritarianism questions was very predictive of support for Trump. A political science PhD student named Matthew McWilliams has found similar results. He has done two polls, both of which have found that authoritarianism is not only strongly predictive of Trump's support, but that it seems to do a better job of predicting it than virtually any other factor. We also looked at what authoritarian voters are afraid of. On things like car accidents, or the risk of gun violence, or prescription drugs, there wasn't a huge difference between authoritarians and non-authoritarians. But when it came to threats associated with people, and particularly foreign people, authoritarians were much more afraid. And we identified policies that authoritarians were more likely to support. 
So authoritarians were much more likely to say, for instance, that the United States should use force rather than diplomacy when dealing with countries that threaten our interests overseas. And they were much more likely to want to sacrifice civil liberties in exchange for safety. I want surveillance of certain mosques, okay? If that's okay. I want surveillance. It's a set of priorities that doesn't always align with the Republican establishment. They don't seem to have that much interest in small government, and they definitely don't seem particularly interested in shrinking entitlements like Social Security or Medicaid. This theory doesn't fully explain the Trump phenomenon. Researchers will probably study this election for decades. But what it tells us is that he's benefited from a larger shift in this country, one that goes beyond any one candidate. Trump isn't just a fluke. He's not somebody who's just doing well because he had name recognition or was a famous TV star. This is a large group of people. They want these things. And they're going to be looking for politicians who can give it to them. And that means that Donald Trump could be just the first of many Trumps in American politics. I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. Ugh. That's true. Well, now that we know all this, that needs to change. Now that we know that, now that we know about this, that needs to change. Because we can't have any more Trumps in power. Ever. We've seen what one Trump can do. We can't risk any more. Authoritarian or not. Diplomacy. Heck. Diplomacy over four. Heck. Heck, there needs to be a fine balance. You can't. You can't resolve. That's why. Me. If I was president. I use diplomacy. Diplomacy first. Um. Hold on. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can. Okay. Take this, take this stack of cards, for instance. Now let's, now, now, the first card, the first card, the card at the top of the deck would be diplomacy. And that, and for me, the la, the very bottom of the card, the very last card in the deck would be all out war. Would be war. That's how I, that's how I would do it. If I, if I would, if I ever become president of the United States, and that's a promise, and if and if I forget that promise, all I just have to do is just look at this video, look at this video. <laughs> not this, not this video. I'm watching, watching right now, but just the one I created, this the video I'm creating right now. So, without further ado, let's get, let's get down. Hey, it's Brian Rose from London Real. I just finished recording a special video that's not going to be available. And speaking of, and the card trick, that's how it should always work. After all, we don't want to hear, we don't want to trigger, with nuclear weapons still out there, and with nuclear weapons still, still a threat, we can... Still a dangerous threat that can end end civil end all life on our planet. That's still that's something that's why you should choose diploma that's why diplomacy over war over war should be a a thing. And I'll explain that in a future video. But not this one. Anyway, next up on next by Vox is is the decline of American democracy in one graph in one graph. This is one terrifying graph should be should make Americans question whether whether they really live in a democracy after all. So so like me, you you should be paying attention to this video.
There's this graph that I saw recently. It's the most unsettling graph I've seen in American politics in a very, very, very long time. And yet it's really boring to look at. It's just a nearly straight horizontal line. The line doesn't do anything interesting at all. But what the graph shows is something somewhat terrifying. That line is showing the relationship between what the average voter wants and what they actually get. In a huge study looking at over 2,000 surveys of people's policy opinions, whether people were on the left side of the line, which meant they opposed something happening, or on the right side, which means they all wanted it to happen, it didn't matter. Once you controlled for the opinions of affluent Americans and interest groups and other lobbying organizations, average people, their voice was not heard at all, or at the very least, their voice didn't appear to matter at all. Average folks only get what they want if economic elites or interest groups also want it. And all this data comes from a time when these groups were arguably less powerful in American politics. America never sold itself as a democracy. It sold itself as a representative democracy. Um, there's accountability from voters onto politicians, but politicians, they get time in office. Step away from the passions of the electorate for at least a little while and do things that are right for the country, and then voters will judge them on whether or not they did a good job. So maybe it's the case that affluent Americans and interest groups and politicians just, they're always right. And average voters, you can just safely ignore them. But it doesn't look like America's been run so well. We had a massive financial crisis that threw tens of millions of people out of work because we didn't do enough to regulate Wall Street. We got into a disastrous war in Iraq. We have median wages that haven't substantially grown in many, many years. It doesn't seem that we are so incredibly good at running this country. Maybe we need a little bit more democracy in our representation. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you for that. It gets worse in the next video, however. Maxine Waters is scared of losing her congressional seat for the first time in 29 years, and it's because of our campaign. My name is Joe Collins. I'm a Republican Navy veteran running for Congress against Maxine Waters. The problem with calling the problem with calling Trump a threat to democracy is that we have a really narrow idea of what it looks like when democracies fail. We imagine democratic failure as being some spectacular event, a military coup or an illegal power grab or the declaration of martial law. To protect the Republic of the Philippines and our democracy. We don't really imagine it looking like this. You see, child's desk, but that's okay. That's the smallest desk I've ever seen. <laughs> but political scientists do. Because in a country like the US, the death of democracy is going to start off looking kind of normal. So normal, you might not even notice it's happening until it's too late. Well, I respect the move, but the entire thing has been a witch hunt, and uh, there is no collusion between Trump's firing of former FBI director James Comey has gotten a lot of media attention, in part because it's really easy to explain why it matters. If Trump fired Comey over the Russia investigation, that would be obstruction of justice, which is a crime. But a lot of what worries political scientists about Trump is tougher to explain in a soundbite like that. Because for the most part, it's stuff that's totally legal. It turns out that government officials can exploit weaknesses in the law in ways that are destructive to the rule of law as a whole. This bear of bad news is Aziz Huck. He's a law professor at the University of Chicago, and he's written a lot about a concept called democratic backsliding, which kind of sounds like something Hillary Clinton does at a wedding. Backsliding is what happens when a democratically elected government starts attacking the institutions that make democracy work. I know, the dance thing was cooler. And Huck argues that what makes backsliding so dangerous is that it's really hard to know when it starts. In many other countries, the way that we see democratic backsliding happening is through a series of discrete legal changes, each of which is on their own completely lawful. A great example of what backsliding looks like is Venezuela's former president, Hugo Chavez. Ah, the 90s. Chavez was elected as a democratic populist but over time, he changed. And while remaining popular, Chavez has been anything but democratic. He got frustrated with opposition from courts and the media, so he started doing things like firing judges, 
using anti-defamation laws to silence journalists, and even describing unfriendly news organizations as, quote, enemies of the homeland. Los dueños de medios dicen mentiras, elaboran mentiras. Los medios de comunicación no siempre están al servicio de la verdad. What's scary about Chavez's story is that he didn't need a military coup to screw up Venezuela's democracy. The man who came to office by democracy is doing everything he can to snuff it out. He did it legally by slowly turning his supporters and political allies against the country's democratic institutions. Yo les recomiendo que se tomen un calmante, que cojan mínimo, porque si no, yo les voy a aplicar el mínimo. Yo mismo les voy a aplicar el mínimo. Autocrats in other parts of the world have gone after those institutions very early on in the process of backsliding. And that's what worries political scientists about Trump. Trump shows a deep distrust of America's democratic institutions. He lashes out at judges, calls journalists the enemy of the people, accuses watchdog agencies of conspiring against him, he questions the legitimacy of an election that he won. His White House stonewalls reporters to avoid answering questions. Off. Camera, off. No, we what would you like to do with this? Off, it's off. He is suspicious of the mechanisms that limit his authority. This is an unprecedented judicial overreach. And he encourages his supporters to be too. That is a catastrophic thing to be happening in a democracy. It's how democratic backsliding starts. But the thing is, none of this is illegal. As long as Republicans in Congress go along with it, there's nothing to stop Trump from publicly criticizing basic democratic institutions. Our constitution just doesn't do a very good job of protecting us against certain kinds of democratic failure. Whether we're in a moment of democratic backsliding really depends upon the character of our political leaders. Which brings us back to Comey and why it's so hard to talk about democratic backsliding without sounding paranoid. We live in a media environment that is really bad at putting things in context, that is designed to bombard us with breaking news and discrete pieces of information. And that makes it hard to identify democratic backsliding when it starts. Because unless it clearly breaks the law, it's really tough to explain why any one Trump tweet or scandal poses a threat to democracy. So when Trump calls a federal judge a so-called judge, it's just a one-off comment. Does anyone honestly believe President Trump is going to ignore this judge's order because he's a quote so-called judge? When Trump calls the press the enemy of the American people, it's all talk. Uh, he sounds like a broken record. It's just kind of like, what else you got, Donald Trump? I don't think that new media are well designed to tell this kind of story because those those media are designed to convey information in very small chunks. The real story is not the discrete action at a particular moment in time, but some bigger picture. Democratic backsliding is one of those things that you can't really see from up close. It is only when you when you look at changes in the aggregate that one sees the effect upon democracy as a, a set of institutions and practices. That doesn't mean the Comey stuff isn't important. Obstruction of justice is obviously a big deal. But some of the biggest threats to democracy are way less dramatic, way more normal looking. And if you're waiting for the CNN Chiron announcing that it's time to panic, you're going to be waiting for a long time. Well, I know I'm going to fix that when, you know, if I ever get in office. The, my idea, and I have an idea for that. May How, however, it's, it's very strictly classified. I can't explain it to any, anyone, except though, except to those who I can completely trust, and they won't, and they won't spill the beans. So, now with that out of the way, next one. Next one is a video by Bernie Sanders. Managing your projects should feel more like this. That's why you need ClickUp. With ClickUp, when you want to assign a task, you task it. If you have to adjust your timeline, you change it. From Vox. Explaining why Bernie, Bernie Sanders worries America is becoming an oligarchy. Citizen Candidates China. are increasingly dependent on the very, very wealthy. And I'm proud, by the way, that the vast majority of our money comes from working people. But if I'm a normal politician who needs to raise 20, 50 million dollars, where am I gonna go? I'm gonna sit down with the wealthy. I'm gonna go to the country club. I'm gonna do my fundraisers at fancy resorts. And I get to know those people. But that's the whole point of this corrupt campaign finance system. 
If you're going to contribute a million dollars to my super PAC, well, maybe that you're a hell of a nice guy and you like to participate, or maybe you want something. I think you want something. And you and a guy are going to become really good buddies so I can do your bidding. In other words, the millionaire class and the billionaire class increasingly own the political process and they own the politicians who go to them for money. And I worry very much, I, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, that we are moving very, very quickly from a democratic society, one person, one vote, to an oligarchic form of society where billionaires will be determining who the elected officials of this country are. I'm gonna do everything I can to stop that. When you say you wanna see elections be publicly funded, do you want to cut the ability to privately fund them? The first thing that I wanna do is overturn the Citizens United the Supreme Court decision, which is a total disaster. Uh, free speech does not equal the ability of people to buy elections. And what I have said is, if elected president of the United States, any Supreme Court nominee I make uh, will make it very clear that he or she is going to vote to overturn Citizens United. Second of all, I think what you want to do is at least make sure that candidates who are running will have as much money as um, their opponents who may have unlimited sums of money. Uh, thirdly, I think there are various ways that you can approach the issue. One way, which I find intriguing, is that you either give a tax credit or basically provide a hundred dollars for every citizen in the United States of America. And you say to that person, here's your hundred bucks. You can make a contribution. You're going to get a hundred dollar tax credit if you spend that hundred dollars on any candidate you want. I think that would democratize very significantly the political process in America and take us a long way away from these super PACs controlled by billionaires who are now buying elections. Thank you, Bernie Sanders. And I still wish you were the nominee. <clears throat> I hope one day in the fut future I can, inter I can have a personal one-on-one -on -one interview with him. That's where I'm talking to you, Bernie Sanders, if you're watching this. Anyway, for some, for some, for some of you out there watching this, some of you might be just saying, "What's an oligarchy?" Well, the next video is going to explain that fully by Robert Reich. So take it away, Robert Reich. Oligarchy means government of and by a few at the top who exercise power for their own benefit. It comes from the Greek word oligarchus, meaning few to rule or command. Even a system that calls itself a democracy can become an oligarchy if power becomes concentrated in the hands of a very few wealthy people and a corporate and financial elite. Their power and wealth increase over time as they make laws that favor themselves. They manipulate financial markets to their advantage and create or exploit economic monopolies that put even more wealth into their pockets. Modern-day Russia is an oligarchy, where a handful of billionaires who control most major industries dominate politics and the economy. But what about the United States? According to a study published in 2014 by Princeton professor Martin Gillens and Northwestern professor Benjamin Page, although Americans enjoy many features of democratic governance, such as regular elections and freedom of speech and association, American policymaking has become dominated by powerful business organizations and a small number of affluent Americans. The typical American has no influence at all. This is largely due to the increasing concentration of wealth. In a 2019 research paper, UC Berkeley economics professor Gabriel Zuckman determined that the richest 1% of Americans now own 40% of the nation's wealth. That's up from 25 to 30% of the nation's wealth in the 1980s. The only country Zuckman found with similarly high levels of wealth concentration is Russia. America has had an oligarchy before, in the first Gilded Age, which ran from the 1880s until the early 20th century. Teddy Roosevelt called that oligarchy the malefactors of great wealth, and fought them by breaking up large concentrations of economic power, the trusts, and instituting a progressive federal income tax. His fifth cousin, Franklin D. Roosevelt, further reduced their power by strictly regulating Wall Street and encouraging the growth of labor unions. The oligarchy fought back, but Roosevelt wouldn't yield. 
Government by organized money is just as dangerous as government by organized mob, he thundered in 1936. Never before in all our history have these forces been so united against one candidate as they stand today. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. But the American oligarchy has returned. We're now in a second Gilded Age. As the great jurist Louis Brandeis once said, we can have democracy in this country or we can have concentrated wealth in the hands of a few, but we cannot have both. We must once again make the correct choice and reduce the economic and political power of the American oligarchy. What do you think? Is America an oligarchy? Let us know in the comments. If you found this video informative, also watch our video on 10 Steps to Save American Democracy. And as always, be sure to subscribe to this channel for more videos like this one. Thank you, Robert Reich. So far, so, so far, how much, uh, how much has this, vi how much of watching it by what of this video that you're watching has inspired you to take up, to be involved in the, in the political system. And not only that, run for, or even, or even run for office yourself, run for a political position yourself. Let me know, let me know in the comments or even the live chat area. All right, so here, so now here's the most important idea of the 2020 election. Still wish Bernie was a, we have to move on. Anyway, any, anyway. Anyway. Anyway, let's continue. All right, let's start. By Robert Reich. Wait. Let me yeah. begin with three facts. Yeah. Fact number one. America is the richest country in the history of the world. But we can't afford to do many of the things we need to do, from repairing our roads, to providing universal health care, and giving every American child a world-class education. Fact two. For the last 40 years, the super-rich, now I'm talking about the richest one-tenth of one percent of Americans, or about 175,000 households, have accumulated a large share of the nation's economic gains. Take a look at this graph. In 1980, the richest one-tenth of one percent owned less than 10 percent of the nation's total wealth. Today, they own 20 percent. The share owned by the richest 400 has grown even faster, jumping from less than one percent to three and a half percent. And as of 2018, they now pay a lower overall tax rate than any other income group in the country, in part due to Donald Trump's massive tax cuts for billionaires and corporations. Not incidentally, Donald Trump is number 275 on this list. The three richest Americans have more wealth than the bottom half of Americans put together. Jeff Bezos alone has $110 billion. A billion is $1,000 million. 110 billion is 110,000 million dollars. It's hard to even wrap your head around a number that big. Fact number three, the accumulation of wealth at the top is gathering speed and momentum because great wealth compounds as it generates more income and wealth. Since this video started, Jeff Bezos has made $298,000 from doing nothing but watching his wealth grow. Look, while the wealth of the top 1% nearly tripled over the last 20 years, it barely budged for the middle class, and it went negative for the bottom 10%. As you see here, the racial wealth gap has also widened, with a median white family owning 10 times more wealth than the median black family. So what about a tax on the super wealthy? as Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders have proposed. Wealth taxes are not new. Local governments already tax wealth through the property tax, and Washington taxes wealth through the estate tax. But the property tax hits mainly the middle and working class, and Republicans have pretty much done away with the estate tax. Warren's plan would charge two cents 
on every dollar of wealth in excess of $50 million paid annually, and three cents on every dollar of wealth over $1 billion. Now, this may not sound like much, but given how much wealth is now concentrated at the top, the tax would generate an estimated $2.75 trillion over 10 years. Without money, we could pay for universal childcare and free public college and cancel student debt for 75% of those who have it. Sanders' plan would start at a lower threshold, charging one cent on every dollar of wealth between 32 million and 50 million, increasing to two cents on the dollar above 50 million, and then on up, reaching eight cents on the dollar on wealth in excess of $10 billion. In 15 years, his plan would cut in half the typical billionaire's wealth. This would pay for Sanders' housing and childcare plans and part of his Medicare for All plan. Neither of these plans would cause America's super rich a great deal of pain. They'd still be doing quite well, thank you. And they'd still have every incentive to work hard and innovate. If the Warren tax had been in effect since 1982, Jeff Bezos would today be worth $86.8 billion rather than $160 billion, his pre-divorce valuation. Bill Gates would be worth $36.4 billion rather than $97 billion. And Warren Buffett would be worth $29.6 billion rather than $88.3 billion. If the Sanders tax had been in effect since 1982, these super billionaires would be worth somewhat less, but still in the thousands of millions of dollars. Now, to be sure, the super rich have ways to avoid paying that kind of money in taxes, such as putting their wealth into foreign tax havens. But in recent years, Congress has given the IRS more tools to track down offshore assets including the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, which requires wealthy taxpayers living in the United States to file information about offshore assets. This act needs to be enforced. But what about rich Americans who want to renounce their citizenship? Both Warren's and Sanders' plans impose a 40% exit tax on Americans worth more than $50 million who renounce their citizenship. Sanders' exit tax would rise to 60% on wealth exceeding $1 billion. A tax on the super wealthy would not only give us the means to do what America needs to do, but it would also help reduce the scandalous level of inequality in America. It's an idea whose time has come. By the end of this video, Jeff Bezos will have made nearly a million dollars. So what do you think? Is it time for America to implement a robust wealth tax? Yep. Let us know in the comments. If you found this video informative, please also watch our video, Why We Need a Wealth Tax. As always, thank you for watching, and please subscribe to this channel for more videos like this one. Thank you, Robert Reich. And move on. and inequality media, civic action. Now, if, I just hope to, I just hope people like Joe Biden was watching that. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were watching that that video because that could be your ticket ticket to getting getting into the White House if you impose that, if you promise that. But but you break that you break that promise and our and our wealth gets worse. And the wealth for the middle class and the and the low and the lower class get worse. You could be look both both of you could be looking at probably a one a one term or less less in in the office of president of the United States, and that's not and that's not a threat. That's a warning, a predi and may, and perhaps a prediction. I hope. So now, so now let's get on. So now let's get on with this next video by Bernie San, by Bernie Sanders, the, to, as he talks about the saving, saving the democracy amendment. He proposed. 
He proposed on Thursday a constitutional amendment to overturn a, a Supreme Court ruling that allowed unrestricted unrestricted and secret campaign spending by corporations on U U.S. elections. The first constitutional amendment ever proposed by Sanders during his two decades in Congress would reverse the narrow 5-4 to four ruling in Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. Okay, that's fine. Madam President, I am offering today a resolution to amend the United States Constitution. I do not do this lightly, nor have I ever done something like this before. The U.S. Constitution is an extraordinary document which has served our country well for over 200 years, and in my view, it should not be amended often. But in light of the disastrous Supreme Court's 5-4 to four decision in the Citizens United case, I see no alternative but a constitutional amendment. I should add that a similar resolution has been offered in the House by Congressman Ted Deutsch of Florida. This constitutional amendment is supported by such grassroots organizations as Public Citizens, People for the American Way, and the Center for Media and Democracy. Madam President, let me go on record as strongly as I can, and as clearly as I can, in stating that I strongly disagree with the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision. In my view, a corporation is not a person. In my view, a corporation does not have First Amendment rights to spend as much money as it wants without disclosure on a political campaign. In my view, corporations should not be able to go into their treasuries, spend millions and millions of dollars on a campaign in order to buy elections. I do not believe that is what American democracy is supposed to be about. I do not believe that that is what the bravest of the brave from our country fighting for democracy fought and died to preserve. Madam President, almost two years ago, <clears throat> in its now infamous Citizens United decision, the United States Supreme Court upended over a century of precedent, taking a somewhat narrow legal question and using it as an opportunity to radically change our political landscape, unleashing a tsunami of corporate spending on campaign ads that has just begun. Make no mistake, the Citizens United ruling has radically changed the nature of our democracy, further tilting the balance of the power toward the rich and the powerful at a time when already the wealthiest people in this country have never had it so good. In my view, history will record that the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision is one of the worst decisions ever made by a Supreme Court in the history of our country. While there is no way of knowing for sure, since there are no disclosure requirements in place to track what was spent. It is no secret that already in the 2010 midterm elections, corporations and some very, very wealthy individuals spent a huge and unprecedented amount of money to further their political goals. And there is no question that this is just the beginning of their efforts. At a time when corporations have over $2 trillion in cash in their bank accounts and are making record-breaking profits, the American people should be concerned when the Supreme Court says that these corporations have a constitutionally protected right to spend, spend, spend shareholders' money to dominate an election as if they were real, live persons.
there will be no end to the impact that corporate interests can have on our campaigns and our democracy if we do not end the Citizens United decision and its impact on our nation. All of us in the Senate share one common characteristic. We all run for elections. We all live in the real political world. And let me just speak for a moment what I think many of my colleagues in their heart of hearts know to be true. And that is that while the campaign finance system we had before Citizens United was, in my view, a disaster, there is no question that a disastrous situation where candidates, members of the Senate, spend huge amounts of time having to raise money, and I know that is distasteful not just for Democrats, it is distasteful for Republicans, it is distasteful for an independent. That's what we do. And now, as a result of Citizens United, that bad situation has become much worse because infinitely more money is going to come into the political process through non-disclosed donations suddenly appearing on TV screens in our states. According to an October 10, 2011 article in Politico, quote, the billionaire industrialist brothers David and Charles Koch plan to steer more than 200 million, potentially much more, to conservative groups ahead of election day 2012. What do we think? Do we think that American democracy is about a couple of wealthy billionaires putting hundreds of millions of dollars into campaigns without disclosure? Is that really the democracy that Americans fought and died for in war after war? I think not. And it clearly is not just Republican operatives. There will be Democrats doing the same. So more and more money comes into the system. We don't know where it comes from. And in order to defend ourselves, candidates are going to have to raise more and more money, become more and more dependent on big money interest. Does anybody really believe that that is what American democracy is supposed to be about? And let's talk about the practical impacts. What happens here on the floor of the Senate? Madam President, the six largest banks on Wall Street have assets equal to over 65% of our GDP, over $9 trillion, six banks. Now, when an issue comes up that impacts Wall Street. Some of us, for example, think it might be a good idea to break up these huge banks. And members walk up to the desk up there and they have to decide, am I going to vote for this, am I going to vote against it? With full knowledge that if they vote against the interest of Wall Street, that two weeks later there may be ads coming down into their state attacking them. Every member of the Senate, every member of the House, in their back of their minds will be thinking, gee, if I cast a vote this way, if I take on some big money interest, am I going to be punished for that? Will a huge amount of money be unleashed in my state? Everybody here understands that that's true. It's not just taking on Wall Street. Maybe it's taking on the drug companies. Maybe it's taking on the private insurance companies. Maybe it's taking on the military industrial complex. But whatever powerful and wealthy special interest you are prepared to take on on behalf of the interests of the middle class and working families of this country. When you walk up to that desk and you cast that vote, you know in the back of your mind that you may be unleashing a tsunami of money coming into your state. And you're going to think twice about how you cast that vote. Madam President, I am a proud sponsor of a number of bills that would respond to Citizens United and begin to get a handle on the problem. And I'd like to acknowledge them very briefly. One is the Disclose Act, sponsored by Senator Schumer, which would force corporations spending money on campaign ads to disclose their identity, just as candidates have to do. That is a good thing I support it. 
Another is the Fair Elections Now Act, sponsored by Senator Durbin, which would move us finally to publicly financed elections. I think that is a very good idea. I support that. Third piece of legislation is a recent resolution for a campaign finance constitutional amendment introduced by Senator Tom Udall of New Mexico that would make it clear that Congress and the states have the authority to write laws to regulate campaign spending across the country and make sure our state and federal elections are about what's right for our democracy. And I support Senator Udall's resolution. But even these excellent pieces of legislation are not enough. Madam President, the Constitution of this country has served us well for more than 200 years. But when the Supreme Court says that for purposes of the First Amendment, corporations are people, that writing checks from the company's bank account is constitutionally protected speech, and that even attempts by the federal government and states to impose reasonable restrictions on campaign ads are unconstitutional, when that occurs, our democracy is in grave danger. Something more needs to be done, something more fundamental and indisputable, something that cannot be turned on its head by a 5-4 Supreme Court decision. We have got to send a constitutional amendment to the states that says, simply and straightforwardly, what everyone except five members of the United States Supreme Court seem to understand, and that is corporations are not people. Bank of America is not a person. ExxonMobil is not a person. Madam President, the resolution I am offering today calls for an amendment to be sent to the states that would do just that. It would make perfectly clear, one, corporations are not persons with equal constitutional rights as real life, flesh and blood human beings. Two, corporations are subject to regulation by the people. Three, corporations may not make campaign contributions, which has been the law of the land for the last century. And four, Congress and states have the power to regulate campaign finance, as Senator Udall's amendment would also say. Madam President, this amendment is co-sponsored by Senator Begich of Alaska, and I would urge all of my colleagues to co-sponsor this amendment, which in fact does what its title suggests, saves American democracy. Thank you very much, Madam President. I support that amendment. Okay, just gotta check something real quick. Okay. Now, before we go to commercial break, we're gonna gonna show you gonna show you a tra trailer of the video trailer of the video we're gonna see next. Enjoy. I think that mail-in voting is a terrible thing. If you ever agreed to it, you'd never have a Republican elected in this country again. Something wrong with? We are witnessing a tidal wave of voter suppression around the country. If you look California. at Alabama, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Georgia, which is becoming ground zero. Georgia's tight race for governor is getting national attention. Brian Kemp is not only the Republican gubernatorial nominee, he's Georgia's Secretary of State. Stacey Abrams looking to make history by becoming the nation's first female African-American governor. The Democrats are working hard, registering all these minority voters. Civil rights leaders say Kemp is illegally removing people from Georgia's voters' list. The purges, they've been going on for over a century in this state. My girl well, wanted to vote, and they were trying yeah. to keep her from voting. The lines was crazy everywhere. I tried contacting the Georgia Elections Board. My vote will not be counted. I'm 65, and for the first time, I did not get a chance to vote. 
We are not going to let them take from us what our grandparents and parents fought to give us in the first place. The coronavirus pandemic is creating concerns ahead of the 2020 election. We are here to resist an ID law that is undemocratic. On my mother's dying bed at 92 years old, former sharecropper. Her last words were, do not let them take our votes away from us. Suppress 2020, the, for, the right to vote. That's the video we'll be watching next. But before we do, but before we do, we're going to. We're going in, we're going to commercial commercial break. So please stand. So please stand by. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to double check thing, double check things on the OBS here. Anyway, we're heading. Now we're heading. Now that that's set out of the way, we are now officially heading the commercial break. So see you after the break. Welcome back, everybody. Did you enjoy the commercial break? Well, anyway, the t the moment has come. It's time. It's time to f to watch suppress 2020 to fight to vote. Voter purges, poll closures, and voter ID laws. Now, now, up now up there, up there. I'm gonna also I'm gonna also add a a card, a card of with extra with extra videos. As, um, you know, from this, from this video. So, without further ado, let's get started. This is Robert Greenwald. I'm the president of Brave New Films, the nonprofit has produced the film and that is making it available for free all across the country. Thank all of you for joining this Zoom premiere. At a time when the racist driven attacks on the right to vote are escalating, when the COVID crisis is being used by some to stop others from voting, and when the census itself is being manipulated, the importance of the fight to vote against voter suppression has never been greater. We are very pleased today to be streaming the film here and with Indivisible and Stand Up America Move On, Democracy for America, Brady, Black Voters Matter, Greenpeace, and now this. So people will be seeing this film and the discussion today in many ways all over the country because it truly does take a village. And now here is the trailer for the film. ...down a key part of the Voting Rights Act. It let the dogs out. It led racially discriminatory voting laws to just run wild. We are witnessing a tidal wave of voter suppression around the country. Alabama, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Georgia, which is becoming ground zero. Georgia's tight race for governor is getting national attention. Brian Kemp is not only the Republican gubernatorial nominee, he's Georgia's Secretary of State. Stacey Abrams looking to make history by becoming the nation's first female African-American governor. The Democrats are working hard, registering all these minority voters. Civil rights leaders say Kemp is illegally removing people from Georgia's voters' list. The purges, they've been going on for over a century in the state. My girl wanted to vote. 
and they were trying to yeah. keep her from voting. The lines was crazy everywhere. I tried contacting the Georgia Elections Board. My vote would not be counted. I'm 65, and for the first time, I did not get a chance to vote. We are not going to let them take from us what our grandparents and parents fought to give us in the first place. The coronavirus pandemic is creating concerns ahead of the 2020 election. I think that mail-in voting is a terrible thing. We are here to resist an ID law that is undemocratic, unconstitutional, and immoral. On my mother's dying bed at 92 years old, former sharecropper, her last words were, do not let them take our vote away from us. For us, 2020, the right to vote, the fight to vote. Against suppression, it's taking place in many ways, by many people, by many groups, by many of you on this premiere today. And I'm particularly pleased today to have with us some of the elected champions who are fighting hard and long to protect our right to vote in the battle to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Amendment Act, a critical piece of legislation. Thank all of you. And we will start with Representative Sewell. I can't hear her. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Terry Sewell of Alabama's 7th Congressional District. And today it is my pleasure to join with other colleagues of mine uh, to introduce the Suppress the 2020, The Fight to Vote, a powerful documentary examining our country's shameful practice of voter suppression. As evidence in the Georgia election of 2018 midterms, as a proud daughter of Selma, Alabama, and the representative of Alabama's Civil Rights District, the legacy of voting rights runs deep in my blood. I believe that there is no truer cause more important to our democracy than the access to the ballot box by all Americans. Sadly, this nation mourns the passing of our colleague, my hero, Congressman John Robert Lewis, a hero in the civil rights and voting rights movement and a staunch longtime advocate for voting rights. As a little girl growing up in Selma, the stories of John Lewis's bravery was as much a, a part of my upbringing as any Bible verse or family lore. As an adult, I know that my very existence as Alabama's first black Congresswoman was only made possible because of the sacrifice of John Lewis and those foot soldiers. As John would say, he shed a little blood on that bridge in my hometown for the right of every American to vote. John's courage and mentorship gave me and so many of us the right to walk the halls of Congress and of state houses across this country. I think it's after that HR 4, the Voting Rights Advancement Act was renamed the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Act of 1965. And it's been my honor to be the lead house sponsor since the 20, 2013 Shelby versus Holder decision, which gutted the Voting Rights Act. I am honored every day to carry that piece of legislation. And because you went to the polls in 2018 and ushered in a Democratic House majority, we finally passed HR 4 out of the House. And it sits on the desk of Mitch McConnell languishing on the Senate. And I know that you will hear from my Senate advocates who have proudly supported H.R. 4 and its passage. We know that we have a tremendous loss with John Lewis, but we also know that there are actors afoot trying to make sure that voter suppression is the rule of the day and not that we have access to the ballot box. I think that this film highlights that in glaring detail. You know, as I feel sad about the loss of John Lewis, I know that he sowed many seeds in so many people the seeds of hope and inspiration. We can hear his voice, never give up, never give in. The vote is the most important nonviolent tool in our democracy. Let's make sure we preserve it. I'm doing that every day on the Hill and I am honored to be doing that with Senator Leahy, 
Senator Leahy of Vermont is a lead sponsor of HR4 on the Senate side, has been an advocate supporter of voting rights his whole career. And I now introduce Senator Patrick Leahy. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. And I was so appreciated the times we could be together and talking about this. And both you and I will remember standing there with our dear friend John Lewis saying we want this. So the, the timing of this documentary could not be better. Actually, it couldn't be more urgent. Our dear friend and hero, think of what John said. He called the right to vote, and I quote, the most powerful nonviolent tool we have to create a more perfect union. Just think of that. We're looking at our watch. Americans' fundamental right to vote faces unprecedented threats. Voters are Pression schemes are colliding with the COVID-19 pandemic, and that could potentially disenfranchise countless Americans ahead of the November election. John Lewis's thundering words just months ago echo even more loudly today. He said, when you see something that's not right, you have a moral obligation to do something. Our children and their children will ask us, what did you do? Well, I hope this film serves as a call to action for all of us, every single one of us, have to stand up in defense of our precious right to vote. John fearlessly did that all his life and almost gave his life on the bridge doing that. So last month here in the Senate, I introduced the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. I very rarely get emotional on the third floor, but I got choked up talking about our friend John as I did that. And I'm thankful that 48 Senate co-sponsors are on there. They would restore the landmark Voting Rights Act whose 55th anniversary is tomorrow and help stop the scourge of voter suppression. The House passed their legislation as the Congresswoman knows is a leader in that in December. Now the Senate must do its part, and Mitch McConnell's Republican leader has got to stop stalling. Bring it up. Have the courage. Vote for it or vote against it. Don't just hide it and pretend you're thinking of it, of being afraid to vote. I'm not afraid to vote. I know how I'll vote. But Americans also have to demand more. The COVID-19 pandemic threatens our ability to safely cast our ballots. And despite the president embracing bogus conspiracy theories and fact-free Twitter, Twitter rants in the middle of the night, a number of states have successfully and securely used mail-in ballots for years. My state of Vermont has. But we need urgently federal help to expand mail-in voting operations. Time of COVID, that's gonna be critical for American safety, but also for their vote so that every single vote can count. Now, the House has passed significant funds to help states prepare for November. Senate Republicans, you know how much money they had in their package for state election assistance? Not one cent. That's appalling. It's unacceptable. Americans have to urge Congress to assist our states so we're not forced to risk our health simply to exercise a right that all Americans have. So I think the film plays an important role. It's going to educate Americans about what we have here, what's at stake. Suppress 2020 will inspire Americans to keep fighting for a change. I hope everybody looks at it. I want everybody, Republicans and Democrats, to look at it because this is not a Republican or Democratic issue. This is an American issue. Never heard that before. It's an American birthright. Indeed, the right to vote is what gives democracy its name. I was proud when John Lewis called me his brother. When I think of him, when I think of how we have to protect this right, right vigilantly. John did this every, every single day with all, every fiber of his body. He's passed the baton to us. Now it's our turn to keep on marching 
And I'm so happy to see my friend, Senator Cory Booker. He's a strong and respected voice. He's one of the very few people in all my years here. When he stands up to speak in our caucus, people shut up and actually listen to him because it's worthwhile. So Corey, my dear friend, it's all yours. Thank you very much. It's so good to be here. I, I, I have to say that Senator Leahy is not only one of the more esteemed and respected senators uh, uh, right now in the Senate, but if you look at his career, he will undoubtedly go down as one of the great, uh, uh, most accomplished senators uh, in the Senate history. And it's great to be on with him right now. And Terry Sewell, uh, who is my friend, partner, sister on the other side of the Capitol, it's great to have you here as well. And I just want to start by saying, Thank you to the makers of this film. Uh, I love documentary film, and whether it's from uh, uh, issues of our environment all the way to uh, understandings how plastics are, are destroying our oceans, documentary film is one of the incredible ignition points right now for so much activism. And this film, to me, is at the crux, at the center of so many other issues going on in our democracy. Because whatever issue is important to you, the roots will always be in us being a representative democracy where everyone has a voice and your vote is your voice. We have come this far, whether it's the 15th Amendment, whether it's the 19th Amendment, uh, uh, by activism and struggle. We know from the 1870, 15th Amendment, we know from the suffrage movement uh, and the 18. Uh, uh, the, uh, the 1920 Amendment, that these came about because of the activism of others. As Frederick Douglass, that abolitionist himself said, if there's no struggle, there is no progress. And we stand on the shoulders of activists who, who secured for us rights that we cannot take for granted. We are here because of that Voting Rights Act that was struggled for, uh, fought for, that people died. Remember, Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner died in Mississippi, registering people to vote. And that fateful legacy of Bloody Sunday, where incredible marchers, including John Lewis, were beaten savagely. All of that effort helped to get us a voting rights law. But I fear for my generation and all of us now in this current moment in history, because we've seen through the Shelby decision, the gutting of the Voting Rights Act. We've seen states from Texas to North Carolina move quickly before the ink was even dry on that decision to pass restrictive laws undermining people's ability to get to the polls. In fact, a judge in North Carolina, a federal judge, said that the North Carolina legislature wrote that bill that restricted the vote with surgical-like precision to undermine the ability for African Americans to vote. And so you're going to see through this film that we are in a distraught present. And it's not getting better in many ways, it's getting worse. We see as we are sitting here in the recent days, uh, our president really attacking uh, uh, vote by mail and trying to delegitimize it and literally taking states like, like Nevada uh, to court, trying to stop them from making it easier for people to vote safely from home during a pandemic. He is preemptively trying to question the legitimacy of a November outcome. He is taking on the Postal Service and doing things to try to uh, uh, slow their functioning of the Postal Service, which is vital to conducting vote by mail. And we see this uh, over and over again as we face challenges. And so we have action to do now to not lose ground that was gained by sweat and struggle and blood and even death. History will judge our generation by what we do in the face of not just trying to hold the ground on the rights that our parents and grandparents' generation gained for us, but what we do to advance that ground, what we do to make voting more robust, to do things that are common sense, like what about voting being a national holiday? What about automatic voter registration and more they can make voting in this country vibrant and, 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 and dynamic. And that's not a partisan issue. That's a patriotic issue. 
Every generation, as I've said, from the amendments to our Constitution to the activism of my parents' generation, has worked to expand the franchise in this country and secure it. And we cannot stop now. And so I leave you with this. I'm here because of voting rights activists. I love that obviously you have two senators and an amazing congresswoman, but change does not come from Washington, it comes to Washington by people standing up and accepting the responsibility that this is my country. I will not surrender to cynicism. I will not just say the system is rigged and sit back and do nothing. Then you are complicit in the problems. This documentary is powerful, but its true test will be whether it helps to ignite you to do more than you're doing now. Because if you do the same thing you've been doing now, well, we've been losing ground. You can't expect different results. This is one of those moral moments in history. If you truly, truly honor those who struggled for the rights you take for granted, well, every generation has to prove worthy of the rights they inherited by advancing them. I want to thank the filmmakers one more time. I want to thank my colleagues for being on this. But I want to thank you, the viewer of this film, because truly you have the destiny of our country in your hands. As the great James Baldwin said at the end of the fire next time, everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. Thank you very much. I appreciate you, honor you all. Let's continue the work. Let's continue the struggle. Let's make our ancestors in heaven looking down upon us, uh, including John Lewis, uh, proud that we have done that good work, caused that good trouble, got in the way, made the sacrifice to ensure that generations yet to come uh, benefit in the bounty and blessings of this democracy. Thank you. How will I be able to vote without putting my life in danger? The Black Lives Matter actions make voting more important than ever. Will this health crisis become a constitutional crisis? Am I going to be able to vote in November? Suppress 2020, the fight to vote. We have a historic decision today striking down a key part of the Voting Rights Act, a civil rights law passed back in 1965. The Supreme Court essentially said racism is over and these communities don't need to pre-clear these changes anymore. This decision leaves virtually unprotected minority voters in communities all over this country. It let the dogs out. It let these racially discriminatory voting laws to just run wild. Within hours of the Voting Rights Act being gutted, Texas had a new strict photo ID law. And within days, Alabama announced its own repressive voter ID law. Texas we are witnessing a tidal wave of voter suppression around the country. Carolina. 200,000 more people would have voted in Wisconsin if not for their strict voter ID law. Voter purges have become rampant. Since the 2016 election, states have removed almost 17 million voters nationwide. You describe Georgia as the epicenter of the current voter suppression battle. What has earned Georgia that distinction? Georgia's tight race for governor is getting national attention. Brian Kemp is not only the Republican gubernatorial nominee, he's Georgia's Secretary of State. Stacey Abrams looking to make history by becoming the nation's first female African-American governor. Volunteers are picking up phones and knocking on doors across the state. Come in and register to vote. We are very excited to register as many people as we possibly can. What do we want? Register to vote! When do we want it? Today! I come as one but I stand as 10,000. Pull back that veneer. And you see something really rotten happening. It's almost like termites coming in. They're in the wood. They're eating the wood away and you don't even realize your house is getting ready to collapse until it's almost too late. We've got to understand, this isn't a clan cross burning. 
This stuff is very bureaucratic, it's very mundane, it's very routine, but it is lethal. Polling places. My name is Bobby Jenkins. I live in Cuthbert, Georgia. Uh, the county is Randolph County. Uh, I spent about 30, what, almost 35 years in education. My superintendent of schools. My name is Loretta Brown. I live in Morgan, Georgia. And I grew up in Randolph County. I am the state advisor for the Georgia NAACP Youth and College Division. My name is Lewis Brooks. I live in Thomason, Georgia, of some county. And I've been living here my whole 89 years, except the two years I spent in service in Korea. In 19, I believe it was 55 or 56, that's when they started to let black people vote in Upson County. When I went to raise the vote, it was tough. They asked me all kind of questions to try to keep me from registering. I passed the test. Once I got my voter right, I decided I wasn't going to let anything stop me from voting. Because I used to walk. We go up the street here, across the next street over there. I walk over there and walk back and vote. And I didn't miss the voting, except when they closed the poll. I'm, I'm a citizen. It's my right to vote and speak my opinion. Lincoln Park polling place shut down in 2016. 95% of Lincoln Park is African American. I saw this ad saying that there was a proposal to close seven of the nine precincts in Randolph County. I said, what? And then they put it in the papers that they were closing, both costing them too much money. First of all, Randolph is a poor county. Just to give you an example of what it would mean, there's a community of benevolence a little north of town. Uh, had that precinct been closed, some of those individuals would have to go 30 miles round trip in order to vote. It would have been a terrible hardship on our poor, on our elderly, and on those who are least able to afford uh, transportation. You know, I got disabled and I couldn't do no driving. I know I couldn't afford to go that far to vote. This was on a black neighborhood. It made me feel like they were closing down to keep the black people from voting, because most black people vote Democrat. They on the close one white voting place. Everybody from out here in the black had to go clean over there to the white section to vote. We're human, and we have our rights to vote just like anybody else. Voters in Randolph County, Georgia are outraged. Randolph County residents expressed their concerns with the Board of Elections. Our citizens turned out in full force. Big problem now. With the they were behind us 100% trying to keep those polling places open. Convenience of the voter. You all are not considering that at all. There's no disenfranchisement for the African Americans. I went to the meeting find out that they were trying to close seven of the precincts. You've got to stand up. You cannot allow this to continue. They gave a couple of reasons, saying it would save money. Average cost of one county's polling location, $4,000. Average cost of one county's Christmas decorations, $18,000. The other one was that uh, several of the polling places ADA were not ADA compliant. The, the thing that was so ironic is we voted that way in May you know, they weren't any worse in November than they were in May. It will be impossible for rural voters without vehicles to vote on election day. It will be impossible for them. They will have to walk three and a half hours just to get from one of these polling places to Cuthbert and Shellman. We did petition to keep it open. Pressure from the residents, civil rights organization, speaking up, speaking out. call the meeting to order, and uh, they only had one motion. They voted to keep them open. 
the news, the, what was happening here in Randolph County went worldwide. The incident that we experienced threw the spotlight on everything else that had been going on. You know, we find out that in the state of Georgia, there were two over 200 other polling places had been closed. Close. If you move Close. a poll four miles, Close. it is the equivalent Close. of Close. a 20% drop in black voter turnout. That's what shutting down these polls mean. Since 2012, Georgia has closed 214 polling places affecting 1 million 294,032 voters. 75% were in majority African American voters. With two months to go, the race is heating up in Georgia. Stacey Abrams' campaign feel they have the momentum behind them, and many of the posts we've seen so far support that. You know, the Democrats are working hard, registering all these minority voters. If they can do that, they can win these elections in November. There's no law in Georgia that requires the Secretary of State to process voter registration forms on a particular timeline. Kemp withheld putting the names of thousands on the voter registration list until after the election. 80% were African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans. This is Fulton County. Linda Marshall is my name. Most of my professional career has been in public service of one kind or another as a teacher, as a government worker. I moved here in August of this year, but because of my emphasis on always being registered <laughs> and always having the ability to vote, I did that almost immediately when I got here. Of course, I also knew the importance of the upcoming election, and I wanted to be a part of that history. It got closer and closer and closer to the election, and I was getting a little bit concerned, so I called the Secretary of State's office. My name is not on the roll. They can't tell me where it is. So all of that paperwork that I sent in, I don't know where it is. I'm 65, and for the first time, I did not get a chance to vote in a very close election of historic importance and proportion. Welcome to Georgia. Kemp put 53,260 registrations on hold. 80% were people of color. The election was decided by five. 54,723 votes. Like I said in a previous video, I think Kemp, Kemp committed crimes against democracy. And for, and for the record, international law, I'm going to submit this idea to the UN, you break international law, even, even a pre presidential pardon can't, won't save you. You have, in or, the only, the only pardon that can affect an international the only pardon person that could pardon you for breaking international law is the Secretary General of the UN. Tell me what you think of that idea in the comments section or the live chat area. Well, no. The midterm election in Georgia is only 29 days away. Purge. Civil rights leaders say Kemp is illegally removing people from Georgia's voters list. Republican Brian Kemp has already gotten the backing of our current president. Thousands have purged from Georgia's voting rolls. Purged from Georgia's voting rolls. 890,000 have no idea they couldn't vote. Since 2013, Brian Kemp has purged over 89, over 8, 8, uh, 890, 90,000 eligible voters.
give me just a second. Who's been removed from voting? There has been instance after instance That's 40 of, of Georgia's electoral voter rate. purging. States are removing voters, uh, many of whom have actually been found to have been eligible but were unlawfully removed from the rolls. Unlawfully, that means illegally, right? I received the purge notice. So I open it up and I read the first sentence. I, along with 380,000 Georgians, received the same notice. That's an especially pernicious way to prevent people from voting. Because once you register to vote, you would think that you should be able to remain on the rolls. And once you're removed from the rolls, you cannot vote. Personally, personally, if I if I had a per if I had the only people I want to Personally, between you and me, the only people I would want to purge, purge from the are those are those who are mem who are actual legit members of hate groups. Now, now you could get your voter. Now, for me, I wouldn't make that permanent, but you can get your voter registration back, back, back if you leave and denounce them. Leave and fully commit and denounce denounce the hate group you joined. And it doesn't matter what kind of hate group you, you join. Join if your hate group is a hate group. I went out and got the mail and there were two letters in there. They looked official. You're hereby notified that the city of Thunderbolt has challenged your right to vote. The city of Thunderbolt states that you no longer reside within the municipality. My license is valid. My address is valid. I own this home. Why are you questioning my right to vote? 60% of voters in Ch Chatham County consistently vote Democratic. Democratic counties are purged at a rate of almost four, four times that of Republican counties. You know, the purges, they've been going on for decades, maybe over a century in this state. If you haven't voted in the last few elections, they'll purge you as if you must not be in the state anymore. If you move within the same county, They'll purge you, assuming you're not living in Georgia anymore. If you don't return a postcard from the Secretary of State, they'll purge you, because to them it means you're not a resident at this address. All of these tactics, specifically and disproportionately, target people of color, poor people, the elderly, all of whom tend to vote for Democrats. Brian Kemp is notorious for erasing the polls and purging people right before the election deadline. Brian Kemp. You have a candidate at the top of the ticket who is responsible for maintaining the integrity of the election. He needed to have his hands on the levers. You have a, an umpire who is also playing in the game. In a, sing in a single night in July 2017, Kemp purged over half a million people, 8% of Georgia's registered voters. Now, now just take now just take it a second here. I just I'm gonna um, I'm gonna make something here. So, BRB. Sorry for the de the delay, people. I just thought I'd take the time again. I take the time time to create this. What do you think? You think you should? You think you tell me? Tell me two things. Tell me two things. A A. What do you think of the po? What do you think? And B. Should he do? 
Should he go to jail? Do you think he should go to jail? Jail for committing crimes against democracy during the tw during the 2018 George Georgia election, Governor Georgia election. I still don't know how to pronounce it. Anyway, let's get back. Let's get back to what we are doing. Let's get back to the vi video, shall we? So tell me what you think in the com. Tell me, tell, give me your answer in either the comments or the or the live chat area. Or the live chat area. And now, back to the video. Less than 20 days away from the midterms now. The race for Georgia's governorship is a toss-up. Literally is a dead heat. This governor's race is already won for the history books, but it's also seeing record numbers of requests for absentee ballots, especially from African-American voters. At a time where we're seeing roughly almost half of the people who've turned in an absentee ballot are people of color, that's a really, really good sign for Stacey Abrams. 97% of new absentee ballots in 2018 were from Democratic counties. We caught them off guard by running such a large scale program and mailed 1.6 million African Americans an absentee ballot and application. In this midterm election, the absentee ballot requests are even outperforming presidential years. So that is, that is startling and eye-popping and something that we need to dig in on to see what's going on there. My name is Norman Broderick. And I'm in Potter Springs, Georgia, Cobb County. I've did 24 years in the military. Deployed to Iraq twice, Bosnia, Saudi Arabia. I voted absentee before when I was deployed. When I was in Iraq the first time, I voted absentee. And when I was in Iraq the second time, I voted absentee. The absentee ballot is a very important tool that exists to allow people, not only just the military, but anybody who happens to be away from their voting station, to be able to cast their vote. My name is Peggy Hsu. Uh, I'm from Johns Creek, Georgia. I left Georgia for DC in the beginning of October, and before I left, I mailed out my absentee ballot application so that our registrar would send an absentee ballot to my new DC address. I work at a US Army Central, which is located at Shaw Air Force Base in Sumter, South Carolina. I'm away from home during the week. I knew I wasn't gonna be able to get back to Georgia to vote. I could only do this absentee. I filled out everything I was supposed to fill out. I sent their documents in. I got confirmation that it was received. And to my surprise, I did not receive my absentee ballot. I checked my mailbox every day. It was like nearing the end of the month. Um, and so I started calling the voter protection hotline. I called my registrar. I sent emails. And it was really, really getting close to the election date. And I just, I never received my ballot the election day came and went, and I wasn't able to vote in the end. When I contacted my wife and asked her about it, um, I think it was a couple of days before the election, it came here. And I tried contacting the Georgia Elections Board. I was told they did receive my absentee ballot request. Everything was filled out correctly but that they mailed it to the wrong address. And she admitted that yes, they did mess up, it was their fault. But there was nothing I could do about it. It's too late, it's over with, and my vote will not be counted during this election. It was probably one of the most frustrating things I've ever experienced. After having spent you know, my entire college career very invested in the political process, it was, I don't know, like a punch to the gut. It still pisses me off to this day. Being in Baghdad, voting, absentee, was easier than being four hours away trying to vote absentee in South Carolina. I took to Facebook and like the millennial activist that I am, I recounted my experience in a Facebook post. I wrote, this is what happened. I wasn't able to vote and if you had a similar experience, let me know. And my friend from high school, she reached out to me and she said, I also had struggles trying to get my ballot in voting absentee. So I submitted an absentee ballot it came two days right before election day. Over the course of 48 hours, we had 40 people 
so many people in our immediate Facebook circle knew somebody who had a similar experience to us. People have requested it like far in advance. Some people just didn't get their vote in. So that was when we really realized that this was not an isolated incident. It was a much bigger issue and a much more deeper rooted sort of phenomenon that was going on statewide. I did speak with the Board of Elections and he just dismissed it as like a hiccup and he's like, oh, like, no, you don't really know what you're talking about. 40 case is not really a hiccup, it's more of like a wake up call. Today we've worked to get answers about the claim that thousands of voters never got the absentee ballots they requested. Two hundred. 281,490 Georgians requested absentee ballots. Tens of thousands did not receive them in time to vote. The race between Abrams and Kemp is literally Election neck day. and neck. Their fate is now in the hands of voters. The day is finally upon us. The midterm elections are happening. Voters head to the polls in one of the most intensely fought midterm elections. The race for Georgia's governorship is a toss up. I live in the South. I'm always worried about election day. Have a great morning and go vote. Oh, yeah. Gotta go vote today. Windy Voting Hill started Greece. here in okay. Georgia this morning. And if you think hitting the polls early will keep you from getting stuck on long lines, think again. Voter Protection Hotline, how can I help you? Voter Protection Hotline, how can I help you? I've never seen one. The line hasn't moved in over an hour. The line is running out. I really thought I was going to be able to run in and run out like I usually do. The first thing I saw was just people everywhere. So we stood there for a while without moving. And then we would inch up. And then we wouldn't move. We had a lot of people with children there, pregnant mothers, elderly people. Some people have medical issues. I took my son to school that morning, and then I went to vote at Ferguson Elementary, where I vote every election. The line just keeps getting long. The line was so long through the school and wrapped around the building. The lines was crazy everywhere, all over the county. It was real long. I was in line for two hours. And I got to the door. That's when they was checking your ID before you go in. And she couldn't find my name. She directed me to go downtown Gwinnett. And I was like, I'm not going to vote. And it was this older lady. She came over and she like held my hand and was like, please go do it. We need this. And I looked in her eyes and said, I will. About eight or nine, we started getting the calls about the long lines. Mm -hmm. Long lines at the polling stations lead to low voter turnout. The research is just crystal clear on that. Everyone in the world knew we were going to vote today. And in my neighborhood, there are no power cords. All these dedicated people waiting to vote. This is what we call voter suppression. People are like upset and angry. I started calling the Secretary of State's office. I was either hung up on, placed on hold. They want people to go home and not vote. I ain't going nowhere. I'm gonna be right here. The reason they sent me from Ferguson to the downtown Gwinnett was for the provisional vote. So I drove 25 minutes and then when I got there, it was crowded in there. I waited 45 minutes to find out that's not where I needed to be. She told me that this was the wrong place and that I can go back to Ferguson. I had to call back and redo my schedule. So now the voting not only cut on my time, cut on my money. When we went in, filled out all the paperwork, had the ID, took it up to the lady. I had mine in my hand. One hand had hers in the other because mm -hmm. she's legally blind. So we go give it to the lady, and she goes to scan Barbara's ID. Wow. So she looked up at Barbara. She said, well, Miss Barbara, when was the last time you voted? <laughs> My sister got strong. I've been voting really. since I was 18 years old, <laughs> and I'm 82. Yeah, I was disappointed. She was a little upset. Um, My girl wanted well, to vote, and they were trying to keep her from voting. 
since I became a citizen, I have not missed an election. I showed up and a very nice lady, she looked at my ID and said, no, you're not registered. And I said, no, no, wait a second. Here's my registration card and showed them that I was registered. And they said, yeah, but your name is Del Rio with a space, but your voter ID says Del Rio one word and therefore it doesn't match. In the voter registration, my name shows as Del Rio with a space. My ID is Del Rio no space. That was a non-match. I said, this is not legal and I need to be allowed to vote. After much discussion, they said to me, this time we'll allow you to vote, but it's a little bit like they're doing me a favor. The right to vote should be something that we should make easier rather than more difficult. Latinos and Asian Americans are six times more likely than white Georgians to be cut from the voter rolls because of exact match. And black Americans are eight times more likely to be cut because of exact match. I have voted in every election, and all of a sudden I'm not there. Controversy surrounds the state's exact match law that put the registrations of 53,000 voters, most of them African Americans, on hold because of discrepancies in the way their names are spelled in state databases. People of color have names that are a little bit less uh, typical, and that's where the errors are at their highest. Brian Kemp knows this. A group of students will not have their voices heard at the polls, at least not in Georgia. They're turning a bunch of students away over here. We're showing up here and at the Booker T. Washington location, um, and their names were not on the actual roll. Student voter registration was up, in, up 10% in 2018. 60% of students ages 18 to 25 vote Democrats. Students Democratic. being turned away. I talked to over 50 students that morning. First, they told me I was at the wrong polling station. They said, You're, uh, you didn't get registered. I was like, what do you mean? And there was only about like, what, four voting ballot booths? They didn't process my registration. My registration didn't go through. I walked back to my door and said, you know, I guess I just won't vote. Just before I went to vote, I had been in an African-American history class where we were actually talking about voter suppression, you know, about what was it like for people that were going to vote. I filled out a little slip of paper, gave it to the poll workers. They looked up at me and they said, it's coming up in our system as though you're not a citizen of the United States. I just sort of looked at them like they had two heads. Like, I'm sorry, I was born in New York, what? When I got to the front of the line, they informed me that I was registered to vote, but not in Doherty County. They were telling me that I was registered back home in Winter Robins, where I was from, and I've never voted there. I've never even been registered there. The thing was that I had brought proof that I was a U.S. citizen. I had with me my driver's license, my passport card, and my Emory student ID, but they would not look at the passport card whatsoever to prove that I was a citizen. I walked out crying. What I learned in history class just hours before, this happened to me in 2018. I had been through and it participated in voter registration drive on campus within a community. It was just like, wow, after all of this, I'm not going to be able to vote myself. Like when I was growing up, voting was a thing. It was an event. It's a little me is trailing behind my parents watching them vote. My parents would take me to the voting polls every time when I was little. I would go in and I would help them fill out the bubbles. I get a chance to vote and then you get there and the experience is just terrible and you have to call your mom and be like, why is this so hard? You never told me it would be this hard. This was huge for us because Stacey Abrams was actually a Spelman alum. History would have been made and it would have been made by my Spelman sister. If there is no one who gets to 50% tonight, Robin, there will be a runoff in December. We'll find out as the day and the evening goes on. Voter Protection Hotline, how can I help you? Are they letting you know this house? Are you really kidding me? Old people who can't vote, there's young people who can't vote, there's people in every county who can't vote. It just created this intense fog of confusion across the state. Been here for three hours, four or five hour wait. Five hours. But this is way, way too long for us to stay uh, and vote. How long have you waited in line here? About three and a half hours. And have you decided you can't stand it? You can't take it anymore? Are you going to go home? I'm, I'm hurting. I, I'll be back. i got to go take some medicine. It was really good. Uh, the lines weren't too long and everyone was super helpful. We don't hardly ever have to wait here. It's always a pleasant experience up here. If you have a fixed resource, an easy way to suppress the vote is to just make that resource unavailable to the people who you don't want to vote. And that's exactly what happened 
in the 2018 election here in the, in the state of Georgia. In places like North Fulton County, which are wealthy, there were more machines than anyone could ever use. In black neighborhoods, there were a quarter of the number of machines that were needed to service the population. Lots of people left without voting. It was people just dropping off when it became two hours, three hours, fourth hour. It was very heartbreaking. All it takes is a little walking away at 159 counties to influence an election. A little here, a little there, and then in a race like this, which was so close, there you go. All night on Twitter, a trending topic, hashtag stay in line. I had to go and pick my son up. He had to be picked up before six. I picked my son up and he went with me and sat in the car. And then I went back to Ferguson Elementary. And by this time, the evening crowd is there and the line has tripled. And I was like, oh, there is no way. Just for my one vote, it took me like six hours. And I wanted to give up because I promised that elderly lady outside that I would do it. Five hours, so about five hours, took me to vote. It sucks the life out of you. I'd been in people's homes, I'd been in their neighborhoods, I'd held their hands. And so to get to election night and to start hearing more and more stories of voter suppression, to hear more and more from people who were told that they couldn't vote or who were turned away or had to give up because of four hour lines. That broke my heart. Wish I could meet, wish I could meet her. Complaints to the voter protection hotline. Eight, eight, uh, 84,000 lawsuits filed. Lawsuits filed. Georgia Coalition for the People's Amanda versus Kemp. ALC for Georgia Muslim Voters Project versus Kemp. Martin versus Kemp. Common Cause Georgia versus Kemp. Brian Kemp. Firefighter Action in the Care and Action versus Brian A. Curtain, Secretary of State and State Election Board of Members. The Democratic Party of Georgia, Inc. and AFG Group, Inc. V. Robin, uh, Robin A. Curtain. Pretend as Secretary of State and State Election Officials of DeGalbi Deca and, and Gwinnett Counties. ALC for Georgia Shift be for Gwinnett County. Dang, I lost I lost count. <laughs> Hold on. Just had, just had to get some, just had to get my, just had to get, get some provisional Republican ballots. Brian Kemp holds a narrow lead over Democrat Stacey Abrams. The tens of thousands of ballots left to be counted in this election. They were counting provisional ballots for hours. Provisional ballots are basically placebos. They're being given to voters to kind of um, shut them up, make them go away. The next day, I was so excited because they were saying that it was a close race. I was like, oh, let me make sure that my vote count. So I called there the number that was on the paper that I got from the voting poll. And she go, oh no, they counting every vote. You don't need to call. I called my mom to double check. My mom worked for the poll for 20 some years. And she said, no, that's not true. You call back to make sure the vote count. And someone else said to the phone, and I got the same thing. No, you don't need to call back. We counting all the votes. We just started discovering so many people voting provisionally. We realized, oh, you voted provisionally, so you might have to come back here the next day and show your ID. Is that something you know? And they're like, no, no, I already voted. Like, I'm, I'm good. But you have to come back within three days with the documentation to prove you are who you say you are. When you have a large working class population that has to punch a clock, that's really tough. You've lost pay from work trying to vote. That's a poll tax. Yeah, poll tax. <clears throat> Hi, this is Christine from Gwinnett County Elections. I wanted to confirm if my vote was counted or not. 
sorry, what is your last name? Kimball. Let's see, there was no participation. Um, so does so that... You weren't given credit for voting. My vote was not counted. It looks like it on the election night, yes ma'am. Uh, yes. No, I thank you. Uh, Goodbye. Who else? Raise your hand. Two, 21,190 provisional ballots were cast. 83% were from people of color. Only only 11,872 11, were counted. Okay, raise your hand if you hate Brian Kemp. He's the last person I'd vote for. Last night, my opponent ended her campaign. The election is over, and I'm honored to be Georgia's governor-elect. I Here. acknowledge that former Secretary of State Brian Kemp will be certified as the victor in the 2018 gubernatorial election. But to watch an elected official baldly pin his hopes for election on the suppression of the people's democratic right to vote has been appalling. This is not a speech of concession. Because concession means to acknowledge an action is right, true, or proper. As a woman of conscience and faith, I cannot concede that. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. Georgia 2018 was a case study of voter suppression. And as we approach the 2020 elections, we're seeing a coordinated effort to suppress from lawyers, millions of dollars, and potentially the biggest tool of all, the coronavirus. The coronavirus pandemic is creating concerns ahead of the 2020 election with no official end in sight to the crisis. There are questions about whether voters will be able to head to the polls to cast their ballot in November. Out of a large city of Milwaukee, we almost got 600,000 people in the city limits. They only have five polling sites open during a pandemic. In Wisconsin today, thousands waiting for hours, forced to choose between protecting their own health and exercising their right to vote. This is so wrong. This is just so wrong. Stop playing politics with our lives. Kentucky slash polling sites from 3,700 to 200. Jesus Christ, I hate Mitch McConnell. The 2020 primary in Georgia was like the 2018 election all over again. This is primary day in Georgia. Lines in Atlanta stretching for blocks. There were people and seniors who had been sitting out waiting to vote for more than five hours. This is wrong. This is America. I think that mail-in voting is a terrible thing. Yeah. You ever agreed to it, you'd never have a Republican elected in this country again. Yep, he's a he's a dictator. We are not going to let them take from us what our grandparents and parents fought and suffered and died to give us in the first place. We are here to resist an ID law that is undemocratic, unconstitutional, and immoral. People are demanding democracy. New Mexico now has same-day voter registration. Iowa. Colorado, Nevada, Florida, and Arizona all passed laws restoring voting rights to those formerly incarcerated. Maine has enacted automatic voter registration. Delaware and Virginia enacted early in-person voting. And in response to the coronavirus pandemic, Michigan, Illinois, New Hampshire, and California have all committed to expanding mail-in and absentee voting in the 2020 election. We belong together. We are all part of the fabric of this country, and we understand what's at stake. Any voter suppression law is not just about black people. It is about America itself. On my mother's dying bed at 92 years old, former sharecropper, her last words were, do not let them take our votes away from us. No one should have to risk their life to vote. And for the politicians that put you in front of a coronavirus firing squad, vote them out. Yeah. Make America vote again.
take action at www.fighttovote.org. Grand produced by Robert Gre Greenwald. In memory of U.S. Representative, in memory of U.S. Representative Elijah Cummings, 1951 to 2019, and U.S. Representative John Lewis, 1940 to 2020. everyone who's interviewing Shannon. Thank you all for watching the film and most importantly taking action. Whether you're seeing this through Indivisible, Move On, Stand Up America, Brady, Black Voters Matter, Greenpeace, or now this, we hope that each and every one of the thousands of you and thousands who are watching this will do, as Senator Booker said, be ignited to take action. The film is free, so there's no way that people will be punished if they're not able to afford it. And most importantly, we count on each and every one of you. One of the things we do at Brave New Films we put a face on policy. And with that, I would like to introduce one of the people you've seen in the film, Kiara Jackson, who is going to talk about her experience with voter suppression. Thank you, Kiara. Muted. Oh, I apologize. Thank you, Greenfall, for having me and allowing me to be a part of this film that is definitely uh, touching thousands across the nation. Um, I'm also honored to be a part of this panel with you know, such a prestigious um, group of legislators. So once again, thank you for extending this op opportunity to me. Um, that day, uh, what I basically want to uh, get across is that it was very disheartening knowing that I'm a part of an organization that prioritizes making sure our youth are civically engaged and um, to give a bit of an introduction, I'm sorry. My name is Kira Jackson. I currently serve as the Albany branch president of the NAACP, formerly the Albany State University chapter president, which is where I was doing a lot of my civic engagement in reaching our student population, making sure we were getting out to the, the vote on campus. So when election day rolled around and you know I'm, I'm pumping everybody up with my student body, making sure that everybody's aware of their polling locations, they know what the ballots are going to look like. They know how to vote, of course, in their own perspective interests. And that, you know, they're just ready to just, you know, complete their civic duty and go on about their days. To arrive at that day and be faced with so many um, difficulties and problems that we, we couldn't have predicted was just disheartening. One of the ones that I touched on briefly in the documentary was the fact that um, I was registered in Albany Doherty County, uh, the previous election, 20, 2016 presidential election. And so Albany, Doherty County had been the only place that I'd been registered to vote. So come election day, to my surprise, when I was turned away and told that I was not able to vote because I was registered in my hometown an hour and a half away, an overwhelming wave of just confusion just rose over me because I was also being told that a lot of my student body being told the same things. They had been registered, and so these were things that we made sure to cover while we were registering our student body to vote. Because oftentimes people don't realize that in order to vote on campus, they have to be registered at their school address, since that will be the address that they will be at um, come election time. So knowing that, you know, in our efforts to help register people to vote and get them prepared for this day, that the very thing that we made sure to be uh, corrected on their registrations 
was the main thing that people were being turned around for, turned around for, and it was just confusing. So luckily for me, I am a part of an organization that does have resources and informs its members of the resources that they have when we are faced with issues like this. So I was able to call somebody from the voter protection hotline and get more information about how I could actually cast my vote. Because at this point, I, I'm determined. I'm not taking no for an answer and I'm trying to get my student body involved and let them know that even though they might have been turned around and even though they believe or have been told that their vote may not count or they won't be able to cast their vote, that there's always a way to double check and make sure that you have access to the ballot that you have the right to cast. So after being told that my mission was to make sure that I could cast mine and get my student body in touch with the resources so that they can also cast their vote. So from then on, my mission was making sure that my registration was up to date in the system because I know that it had been and I had registered under my school address. So making sure I had crossed all of my T's, dotted my I's, and then making sure that our voter protection hotline uh, was able to get in contact with our elections office and confirm this information so that I could, uh, once again, uh, cast my vote. So once that information was discovered and I was uh, directed to um, a new polling location, it seemed as if I just was not going to be able to vote. I was getting told the same thing that I was registered back in my hometown and that I had to drive an hour and a half away on a day that I had to be at work within the next 30 minutes to go and cast my vote. So once again, just being determined and persistent with the issue, knowing that I had been registered in Doherty County because once again, it's the only place that I had been registered I just continue to press the issue and ask questions and demand information so that, you know, if I walked away that day not being able to cast my vote, I knew that I would have done everything that I had, I had done to be able to, to cast my vote. And honestly, that is what my mission is now as an activist within the NAACP to continue to give um, my constituents the tools that they need to be civically engaged and just um, keep everybody aware that Voter suppression is very much still around. Tactics are only getting worse. But if we continue to work together collectively as a community, as community leaders, then this is something that we hope will dissipate and also be corrected legislat legislatively in the future. Thank you very much, Kiara. And I'm so pleased that you refused to take no for an answer. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about patriotism this these days, but I must say what you and many of the folks in the film and many of the thousands of people watching the film today and taking action really are a definition of patriotism in the best sense. And with that, we have a couple of short videos from just a few of our many, many group partners. Those of you who are part of a group and are not participating yet, please sign up and someone from Brave New Films will be in touch with you. In the meantime, Renato, could you show the two videos, please? Hi, I'm Sean Eldridge. I'm the founder and president of Stand Up America. We are a progressive advocacy community of more than 2 million Americans across the country working to strengthen our democracy in this critical moment. Um, first of all, I want to thank Brave New Films for putting together this powerful documentary uh, in a moment where we need it most. And my role today is to provide you with two meaningful actions you can take right now if you're fired up and want to fight back against voter suppression. The first thing we need you to do is to make a phone call. For over 80 days, Senate Republicans have been blocking critical funding that states need right now to expand vote by mail, early voting, and online registration so that every voter can safely participate. We need them to pass that legislation right now before it's too late. So please take one minute to make a call. You can text the word MAIL to 21333. The word MAIL to 21333. We'll provide you with talking points and we'll patch you right through to your senator. The second thing you can do is join us in reaching out to our fellow Americans to educate them on how to vote safely this year. We're going to be reaching out to millions of Americans, sending texts, making phone calls to ensure that folks vote absentee where they can, um, vote early in their community if they choose to, uh, and to get registered if they're not registered already. And we need your help to do that. So you can sign up to become a volunteer or learn more by texting the word FIGHT to 21333. That's FIGHT to 21333. Thanks for being informed. Thanks for taking action. 
Hey everybody, I'm Megan Hatcher Mays. I'm the Director of Democracy Policy at Indivisible, and I'm sure you are as excited as I am for the premiere of Suppressed 2020, The Fight to Vote. Voter suppression is not a new thing, but we've seen in 2020 alone, even more desperate, terrible attacks on people's right to vote in this country. Donald Trump is sending tweets about how you can't trust vote by mail, et cetera, et cetera. This documentary is an incredible resource that really dives deep into the details of this problem and how we can go about fixing those issues. That's why at Indivisible, we love this film. We are working so hard to make sure that people have access to their ballots, access to polling locations in 2020, which is right around the corner. So that's why we are urging our members to call their senators and tell them to pass the HEROES Act, not the Mitch McConnell version, but the version that passed the House, the HEROES Act, because that bill includes election funding, funding for the Postal Service, ways for people to actually vote, unlike the Senate proposal introduced by Mitch McConnell, which does none of those things. And that's why documentaries like this, films like this, Suppressed 2020, are so critical in this fight for a free and fair election this November. I'm super excited for this premiere, and I hope you enjoy. And as every one of our panelists has said, and as the film says, now is the time for action. And we have a variety of ways you can be involved. You can go to the website. You've heard from some of the organizations. So it's time to either mask up or mail in. And I look forward to seeing all of you taking some action as we move forward. Thank you very much. Welcome. Join the fight to vote. Host your own free virtual screening at fighttovote.org. Ooh, that's interesting. So what did you think? Did it, fi did it fire you up? <laughs> we were... Tell me if it did in the com. Tell me if that video. Tell me if it did in the comments section below. But in the meantime, but in the meantime, we're gonna take a short. We're gonna take a short recess. So. Br so brb. Welcome back, everybody. Enjoy the commercial. So, now let's. Now let's get down to the now let's get down to the next video. video the system skip navigation one Former Secretary of Labor Robert Trike presents the Reader's Digest of his latest book, The System, Who Rigged It, How We Fix It. He explores the system of power in America that bails out corporations instead of people, even in times of crisis, and breaks down how we have socialism for corporations and the rich, and harsh capitalism for everybody else. As power has concentrated in the hands of corporations and the wealthy few, those few have grabbed nearly all the economic gains and political power, for themselves. Meanwhile, workers have been shafted. This isn't a democracy, where all power is shared. It's an oligarchy, where those at the top have the power to grab everything for themselves. But history shows that oligarchies cannot hold onto power forever. They are inherently unstable. When a vast majority of people come to view an oligarchy as illegitimate and an obstacle to their well-being, which is happening before our very eyes as this crisis exacerbates, oligarchies become vulnerable. Order Reich's new book today. https colon slash slash bit.ly slash these stem rb Reich. Show less. Sort by. Cloud. Okay, now let's see that. Let's, let's hear him talk about that book. Talk about it now. Take it away, Robert Reich.
The concentration of wealth in America has created an education system in which the super rich can buy admission to college for their children, a political system in which they can buy Congress and the presidency, a healthcare system in which they can buy care that others cannot, and a justice system in which they can buy their way out of jail. Almost everybody else has been hurled into a dystopia of bureaucratic arbitrariness, corporate indifference, and the legal and financial sinkholes that have become hallmarks of modern American life. The system is rigged, but we can fix it. This is who rigged it and how we fix it. Today, the great divide in American politics isn't between right and left. The underlying contest is between a small minority who have gained power over the system and the vast majority who have little or none. Forget politics as you've come to see it as a contest between Democrats and Republicans. The real divide is between democracy and oligarchy. The super wealthy have reorganized the market to make themselves even wealthier. Since 1980, the percentage of the nation's wealth owned by the richest 400 Americans has quadrupled from less than 1% to 3.5%, while the share owned by the entire bottom half of America has dropped to 1.3%. The three wealthiest Americans own as much as the entire bottom half of the population. Big corporations, CEOs, and a handful of extremely rich people have vastly more influence on public policy than the average American. Wealth and power have become one and the same. As the oligarchs tighten their hold over our system, they've lambasted efforts to rein in their greed as socialism, which to them means getting something for doing nothing. But getting something for doing nothing seems to better describe the handouts being given to large corporations and their CEOs. General Motors, for example, has received $600 million in federal contracts and $500 million in tax breaks since Donald Trump took office. Much of this corporate welfare has gone to executives, including CEO Mary Barra, who raked in almost $22 million in compensation in 2018 alone. GM employees, on the other hand, have faced over 14,000 layoffs and the closing of three assembly plants and two component factories. Our system, it turns out, does practice one form of socialism, socialism for the rich. Everyone else is subject to harsh capitalism. Socialism for the rich means people at the top are not held accountable. Harsh capitalism for the many means most Americans are at risk for events over which they have no control and have no safety nets to catch them if they fall. Among those who are particularly complicit in rigging the system are the CEOs of America's corporate behemoths. Uh, take Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, whose net worth is $1.4 billion. He comes as close as anyone to embodying the American system as it functions today. Dimon describes himself as a patriot before I'm the CEO of J.P. Morgan. He brags about the corporate philanthropy of his bank but it's a drop in the bucket compared to his company's net income, which in 2018 was $30.7 billion, roughly 100 times the size of his company's investment in programs for America's poor cities. Much of J.P. Morgan's income gain in 2018 came from savings from the giant Republican tax cut enacted at the end of 2017, a tax cut that Diamond intensively lobbied Congress for. Diamond doesn't acknowledge the inconsistencies between his self-image as Patriot First and his role as CEO of America's largest bank. He doesn't understand how he has hijacked the system. Perhaps he should read my new book. To understand how the system has been hijacked, we must understand how it went from being accountable to all stakeholders, not just stockholders, but also workers, consumers, and citizens in the communities where companies are headquartered and do business, to intensely shareholder-focused capitalism. In the post-World War II era, it was assumed that large corporations had responsibilities to all their stakeholders. CEOs of that era saw themselves as corporate statesmen responsible for the common good. But by the 1980s, shareholder capitalism, which focuses on maximizing profits, replaced stakeholder capitalism. 
that was largely due to the corporate raiders, ultra-rich investors who hollowed out once thriving companies and left workers to fend for themselves. Billionaire investor Carl Icahn, for example, targeted major companies like Texaco and Nabisco by acquiring enough shares of their stock to force major changes that increased their stock value such as suppressing wages, fighting unions, laying off workers, abandoning communities for cheaper labor elsewhere, and taking on debt, and then selling his shares for a fat profit. In 1985, after winning control of Transworld Airlines, he loaded the airline with more than $500 million in debt, stripped it of its assets, and then pocketed nearly $500 million in profits. As a result of the hostile takeovers mounted by ICON and other raiders, a wholly different understanding about the purpose of the corporation emerged. Even the threat of hostile takeovers forced CEOs to fall in line by maximizing shareholder profits over all else. The corporate statesmen of previous decades became the corporate butchers of the 1980s and 1990s, whose nearly exclusive focus was to cut out the fat and make their companies lean and mean. As power increased for the wealthy and large corporations at the top, it shifted in exactly the opposite direction for workers. In the mid-1950s, 35% of all private sector workers in the United States were unionized. Today, 6.4% of them are. The wave of hostile takeovers pushed employers to raise profits and share prices by cutting payroll costs and crushing unions, which led to a redistribution of income and wealth from workers to the richest 1%. Corporations have fired workers who try to organize and have mounted campaigns against union votes. All the while, corporations have been relocating to states with fewer labor protections and so-called right-to-work laws that weaken workers' ability to join unions. Power is a zero-sum game. People gain it only when others lose it. The connection between the economy and power is critical. As power has concentrated in the hands of a few, those few have grabbed nearly all the economic gains for themselves. The oligarchy has triumphed because no one has paid attention to the system as a whole, to the shifts from stakeholder to shareholder capitalism, from strong unions to giant corporations with few labor protections, and from regulated to unchecked finance. As power has shifted to large corporations, workers have been left to fend for themselves. Most Americans developed three key coping mechanisms to keep afloat. The first mechanism was women entering the paid workforce. Starting in the late 1970s, women went into paid work in record numbers, in large part to prop up family incomes as the wages of male workers stagnated or declined. And then by the late 1990s, even two incomes wasn't enough to keep many families above water, causing them to turn to the next coping mechanism, working longer hours. By the mid-2000s, a growing number of people took on two or three jobs, often demanding 50 hours or more per week. Once the second coping mechanism was exhausted, workers turned to their last option, drawing down savings and borrowing to the hilt. The only way Americans could keep consuming was to go deeper and deeper into debt. By 2007, household debt had exploded, with the typical American household owing 138% of its after-tax income. Home mortgage debt soared as housing values continued to rise. Consumers refinanced their homes with even larger mortgages and used their homes as collateral for additional loans. This last coping mechanism came to an abrupt end in 2008 when the debt bubbles burst, causing the financial crisis. Only then did Americans begin to realize what had happened to them and to the system as a whole. That's when our politics began to turn ugly. So what do we do about it? The answer is found in politics and it's rooted in power. The way to overcome oligarchy is for the rest of us to join together and form a multiracial, multi-ethnic coalition of working class, poor, and middle class Americans fighting for democracy. This agenda is neither right nor left. It's the bedrock for everything America must do. 
The oligarchy understands that a divide and conquer strategy gives them more room to get what they want without opposition. Lucky for them, Trump is a pro at pitting native-born Americans against immigrants, the working class against the poor, white people against people of color. His goal is cynicism, disruption, and division. Trump and the oligarchy behind him have been able to rig the system and then whip around to complain loudly that the system is rigged. But history shows that oligarchies cannot hold on to power forever. They are inherently unstable. When a vast majority of people come to view an oligarchy as illegitimate and an obstacle to their well-being, oligarchies become vulnerable. As bad as it looks right now, the great strength of this country is our resilience. We bounce back. We have before. We will again. In order for real change to occur, in order to reverse the vicious cycle in which we now find ourselves, the locus of power in the system will have to change. The challenge we face is large and complex, but we're well suited for the fight ahead. Together, we will dismantle the oligarchy. Together, we will fix the system. So, Katie, do you think we can fix the system? Is your generation ready to take up the mantle? Absolutely. My generation and all the other generations are ready to fix this. I mean, so much is at stake that we really have no other choice than to keep fighting. Oh, that's true. Uh, even the geriatrics like me are fired up. If you found this video informative, please also watch our video, Everything You Need to Know About the New Economy. As always, thank you for watching, and please subscribe to our channel for more videos like this one. Okay, now here's a now here's one good example of someone someone who wants to keep that all oligarchy in check, and we get our democracy turn our in order in other words turn our democracy into an oligarchy. The Koch brothers. Personally, I'm glad that one of the one of them is dead. I don't wish death upon people, but I'm just glad that one's gone, and rotted in hell. Sheesh. Sometimes I wonder if they actually got. Got inspiration for the Nazi Party. Anyway, let's continue. Let's let's play the first one. First of two, the Coke Brothers. First is Coke Machine by Robert Reich. A number of billionaires are flooding our democracy with their money, drowning out the voices of the rest of us. But Charles and David Coke are in a class by themselves. They're using their fortune, they're the fifth and sixth richest people in the world, to create their own political machine designed to protect and advance their financial interests. The Coke machine includes, number one, political front groups pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into elections at every level of our democracy, while disguising the sources of the money. Number two, giant advertising campaigns to convince Americans climate change is a myth, the Affordable Care Act will harm them. Unions are bad, and wealthy people deserve tax cuts. Number three, a network of think tanks designed to come up with findings the Kochs want. For example, millions of dollars for studies arguing we should abolish the minimum wage or keep it where it is forever. Four, a campaign to suppress the votes of minorities. In the last presidential election, funding white poll watchers where minorities vote, leading to complaints of voter intimidation and peddling a voter ID bill to state legislators across the country designed to make it harder for many to vote. Number five, a nationwide effort to bust unions, funding anti-union campaigns in states like Wisconsin, and pushing an anti-union law that's been used in dozens of states to undermine workers' collective bargaining rights. And six, a long-term strategy to unravel America's campaign finance laws, even organizing secret meetings with sympathetic Supreme Court justices. The Koch political machine would be troubling in any circumstance, but it's especially dangerous in present-day America, where wealth is more concentrated than it's been in over a century, and the Supreme Court has opened the floodgates to big money. The problem is not that the Kochs are so rich or that their political views are so regressive. The problem is they're using their exorbitant wealth to impose those views on the rest of us, undermining our democracy. 
More than 200,000 of you have already signed my move on petition denouncing the Koch brothers for undermining our democracy. The Kochs won't care what we say, but when half a million of us stand up to them, politicians will have to think twice before taking their money. When a million of us stand up to them, their money will be a political liability. Standing up to bullies is the hallmark of a civilized society. Please join our petition and stand up for our democracy. Our democracy is not for sale. He should probably run for president one day. <laughs> Maybe. I hope. Okay, now here's another. But this one's by Brave New Films, actually. Protecting the integrity of each and every vote cast in the state. Let me restart that. Coke, Coke and Boating. Now let's go further depth into vote in a Coke and Boating. This one by Brave New Films. There are currently 7,000. 7,383 state legislators, 1,594 1, are members of ALEC. Protecting the integrity of each and every vote cast in the state. This voter ID bill, including voter ID. Voter ID. Common sense voter ID law. Get those IDs in people's hands. Photo ID requirement for every voter. These kinds of efforts are reminiscent of a much darker period in American history, when there were efforts to prohibit people from voting particularly in the segregated South. This is the resurrection of those voter suppression efforts, and there certainly hasn't been this kind of money or this kind of organization behind them in a very long time. First at Kennedy, that's when I started voting. And then from then on, I've always voted. I'm gonna miss this one though, because I don't have nothing to, no, I don't have any ID. I, somebody stole my pocketbook. Her purse was stolen eight years ago, along with her birth certificate, and she says she can't get an ID. It's just such a kick in the teeth to old people, particularly, who have been voting as long as, or darn near as long as I have. There is a glitch on my birth certificate. And I did register almost immediately upon my 21st birthday. That was 59 years ago. I have voted in every single election since then. I would have considerable difficulty getting a state-issued ID, and I would like to continue voting. I think it's my right. They told me at the uh, voter registration office I had to bring in proof of my disability check, proof of my social security check, and proof of my uh, handicap ID card. Why do I have to bring this? I never needed it before. The notion that we need this to prevent voter fraud isn't a good faith mistake, it's a lie. It is a way of disenfranchisement of certain segments of our society. This is a poll tax. This is requiring people to pay money to cast a ballot. And I don't think we want that in this country. Born at home in the segregated South, she's never had a birth certificate. My grandmother, she insists never, never miss a voting day. I won't have no rights if I can't vote. 93-year-old Viviette Applewhite is the lead plaintiff in the ACLU's case over the voter ID law. I think it's a terrible law to make people not be able to vote because they don't have a piece of paper say ID on it. January 2014. A judge ruled that the Pennsylvania voter ID law is unconstitutional, which means that Viviette Applewhite is eligible to vote. Be able to vote. This is all I want to do is be able to vote. The brothers and their allies are going to spend millions of dollars in these efforts. Citizens who believe in voting and democracy must fight back in all possible ways. Viviette Applewhite was able to hold on to her long-held right to vote because she fought back against the Koch brothers' suppression laws. Joy Lieberman in Missouri also took the issue to court and won. Alberta Curry preserved her record of voting rights of over 50 years because she refused to let her rights be stolen by the bogus voter ID laws backed by the Koch brothers. The reason that you target somebody's voting rights is it makes it easier to take away the rest of their rights. You come for that first and the whole house of cards starts to fall. Why is voting important to me? Because it gives you equal right to do things. That's why it's important. Sign up to host a screening of the conference.
there's the film right there, Koch Brothers Exposed. So take a look at it. Take a look at it here when, if you ever get the chance. There's a story. Now here's a video that I think you might need to see. Donald Trump's success reveals a frightening weakness in American democracy. There's a story from the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Wait, hold on. I want to check something. Make sure it's off. Yeah, it's off. Okay. There's a story from the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Uh, when it ended, Ben Franklin walked out of Philadelphia's Independence Hall to find this anxious crowd. And there was a woman from Philadelphia who was the first to speak to him. And she, she asked, well, doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? And, and Franklin's reply is really famous. A republic, he said, if you can keep it. If we can keep it. We have lost something Franklin had, which is a sense that this experiment, America, can fail. Things can truly go wrong. And, and one lesson of Trump is that we need to rediscover that catastrophic imagination because there is a big flaw at the center of American democracy, a weakness, a bug in the software. And Trump found it and he used it. And other people are going to find it and use it too. This election is close. It is close enough that something small could completely have thrown it. If, if Trump were just a bit more self-disciplined, if he hadn't bragged about sexual assault while wearing a microphone, if Clinton's pneumonia had lingered a little bit longer, America would be ruled by a cruel narcissist with authoritarian ambitions. And, and when I say authoritarian ambitions, I mean it. One of the truly important things we learned about Trump is that he admires dictators for being dictators. He, he was asked about Vladimir Putin and said, He's running his country, and at least he's a leader, you know, unlike what we have in this country. No, but again, he kills journalists that don't agree with him. About North Korea's Kim Jong-un, he said, He goes in, he takes over, and he's the boss. It's incredible. And, and here Trump was on Saddam Hussein. He killed terrorists. He did that so good, they didn't read him the rights. The thing to note there is it's not just that Trump admires authoritarians. What he admires about them is that they are authoritarians. He likes that they dispense with niceties like a free press and due process and political opposition. Trump has promised to bring this perspective to America. He says he'll jail Hillary Clinton if he's elected. He, he wanted to strengthen libel laws to make it easier to cow the press. During rallies, he pushed his followers to assault protesters and promised he would pay their legal fees if they got arrested. Imagine someone like that with the power to pardon. So even if we dodge the bullet, we still need to understand how it is that we as a country came to be standing in front of a gun. It would have been no surprise to the Founding Fathers that Americans have proven susceptible to the charms of a demagogue. In Federalist 10, James Madison wrote that men of factious tempers, of local prejudices, or of sinister designs may by intrigue, by corruption, or by other means first obtain the suffrages and then betray the interests of the people. That is Founding Father speak for, yeah, demagogues are appealing. They can win elections and then they can betray the very people who elected them. And it's why we have a representative government, not a democracy. It is part of why the founders made the American presidency so weak. They always saw the popular will as a, as a potential point of failure, a point of weakness. And it is credit to the long success of the political institutions they created that we think dangerous men can only win elections in far off lands. But what's happening here, what's happening now, is that our institutions are weakening. And that's where we have to turn to understand Trump, to our institutions. Donald Trump did two things to get this close to the presidency. The first was he won the Republican primaries. The second is that after winning the primaries, he united the Republican Party behind him. These are not the same thing, even though they're often conflated. Trump also the Republican Party behind him. These are not the same after winning the primaries, he united the Republican Party behind him. These are not the same thing, even though they're often conflated. Trump only had 13.8 million votes when he won the Republican primaries. The distance between those 13.8 million votes and the more than 60 million votes he's expected to get in the election is vast. In 1972, George McGovern won the Democratic primary even though much of the Democratic Party hated him. Major Democratic interest groups like the AFL-CIO, they refused to endorse him in the general election. Dang ads. Starting out with any new project management software usually feels something like this. 
top Democrats, including former governors of Florida and Texas and Virginia, organized Democrats for Nixon groups. McGovern went on to lose with less than 40% of the vote, a huge defeat driven by Democrats who abandoned a nominee they considered unacceptable. Uh, a similar path was possible for Trump. Uh, top Republicans viewed him with horror. This man is a pathological liar, a narcissist at a level I don't think this country's ever seen. Donald Trump's candidacy is a cancer on conservatism, and it must be clearly diagnosed, excised, and discarded. Donald Trump is a delusional narcissist and an orange-faced windbag. A speck of dirt is way more qualified to be president. And then every single one of those Republicans endorsed Donald Trump. So did Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell. It is not surprising with this kind of elite support that Trump managed to get Republican-leaning voters behind him. You know what I call those Republicans? Hypocrites. The final NBC Wall Street Journal poll of the election found that 82% of likely Republican voters were supporting Trump, a precise match for the 82% of likely Democratic voters supporting Clinton. There are two things to say about this. The first is moral. There are many Republicans who honestly believe Trump would make a good or at least adequate president. Their, their endorsement of his candidacy is perfectly honorable, even if I think it is wrongheaded. But many of the Republicans mentioned here believe Trump is a threat to world peace and to fundamental norms, values, and institutions of American democracy. Their endorsements of his candidacy will stain their careers. And if he is elected, and if the worst comes to pass, they will be remembered by history for their abandonment of country. But the second thing that needs to be said here is structural. And believe it or not, that's where it actually gets scary. Here is the single most important sentence for understanding both Trump's rise and this dangerous era in American politics. The defining characteristic of our moment is that parties are weak while partisanship is strong. That sentence comes from political scientist Julia Azari, and her point is this. Parties, particularly the Republican Party, can no longer control whom they nominate. But once they nominate someone, once they nominate anyone, even Donald Trump, that person is guaranteed the support of the party's elites and of its voters. Let's look at that in two pieces. First, how did parties lose control of their primaries? Primaries used to not matter that much. Party officials made the decisions that counted at the conventions where they had almost total control. But we've moved in recent decades towards primaries. They're more democratic. They give voters more of a voice. That's made parties and party officials less important. But one way parties kept influence in primaries was through money. Party organizations, they, they signaled the donors which candidates to back, who to take seriously. But money's turned out to be a whole lot less important in winning primaries than anyone thought. Just ask Jeb Bush, who spent $130 million only to be humiliated, even as Trump spent almost nothing to win. Similarly, parties used to drive media attention by signaling to reporters which candidates to take seriously. But that process is also democratized. Just look at Trump's Twitter feed and how it can drive news coverage on its own. But the most important thing parties have is the trust of their own voters. It's why endorsements matter. The most important thing parties have is a trust of their own voters. It's why endorsements matter. They, they represent party officials using the credibility they've built with their supporters to tell them who to vote for. Trump didn't have any Republican endorsements of note until he had already won a bunch of primaries. And that arguably helped him. It, it was proof that he really was untouched and untainted by the unpopular Republican establishment. The Republican elites have so totally lost the faith of their base that their efforts to persuade Republican voters who are ignored at best and counterproductive at worst is a tremendous failure of the Republican Party. So that, that's how the party loses control of its primaries. But, but then there's a puzzle. If, if partisans have so little faith in their party, why are they so much likely to back whomever their party nominates? The, the answer, in short, is fear and loathing of the other party. In 1964, 31% of Republicans had cold, negative feelings towards the Democratic Party. And 32% of Democrats had cold, negative feelings towards the Republican Party. By 2012, that had risen to 77% of Republicans and 78% of Democrats. That is a lot more anger and fear towards the other party. Today, fully 45% of Republicans and 41% of Democrats believe the other party's policies threaten the nation's very well-being. 
This fear, it, it is strongest among the most politically involved, which makes sense. You're more likely to take an active interest in American politics if you think the stakes are really high. But it also means that the people driving American politics, and particularly the people driving low turnout party primaries, have the most apocalyptic view of the other side. The angrier and more fearful partisans are, the more of a market there is for media that convinces them to be even angrier and even more afraid. It is no accident that the CEO of Breitbart News, a hyper-ideological conservative media outlet that specializes in scaring the hell out of its audience, is leading Trump's campaign. And one reason Trump has been able to unite Republicans is that Republican-leaning media has convinced itself and its base that the alternative to Trump is a literal criminal who belongs in jail. This offers a rationale for voting Republican even if you don't particularly like your candidate. A majority of Trump voters say they're voting against Clinton rather than for Trump which helps explain the unified party support for Trump. Republican office holders are terrified that if they don't support him or are seen in any way as contributing to Clinton's election, they'll face the wrath of their conservative base. So here then is a key failure point in modern American politics, and observing it in action requires looking no further than the Republican Party. Voters' dislike of their own party has broken the primary process, but fear of the opposition has guaranteed unified party support to the nominee. That means whoever manages to win a flawed competition dominated by the angriest, most terrified partisans ends within spitting distance of the precedents. Ah. Let's see. Elites are often ends within spitting distance of the presidency. Elites are often blamed for Trump's rise. He's said to be a backlash to their failures, their corruption, their obliviousness, their self-dealing, their condescension, and all that may be true. But past moments in American politics have also featured angry voters and out-of-touch elites and social problems. Those moments, however, featured political and media gatekeepers with more power. And so Trump-like candidates were destroyed in primaries or at party conventions or by a press that paid them little mind. Now, however, traditional gatekeepers have neither the power nor the cultural capital to stop Trump-like candidates. And in the Republican Party, where the collapse of institutional authority is most severe and most dangerous, the aftermath of a Trump loss will further weaken the party center. Trump supporters are going to turn on the Republican Party officials whose tepid backing they feel doomed their candidate. Sean Hannity has already begun calling Paul Ryan a saboteur. The country is on a fast path to becoming majority minority, and many white male voters will continue to perceive this change as a loss in both status and political power, which in some ways it is. Now, it's not to say Republicans will always or even routinely nominate candidates as dangerous as Trump. Much had to go wrong for him to be nominated. The lesson of this unnerving year is that less can be taken for granted than we thought. The American people are not immune to demagogues. The American political system is too weakened to reliably stop them. America, like all the world's other countries, is vulnerable to catastrophic political failure. It can happen here. Trump is a crude and undisciplined demagogue. But we need to remember, the world also produces clever, disciplined demagogues. And they are the ones who truly threaten republics. Thank you, Box. Managing your projects should feel more like this. That's why you need ClickUp. With ClickUp, when you want to assign a task, you task it. If you have to adjust your timeline, now here's a video. Here's a video explaining why every every election gets its own crisis. Take a look. October 2014. Like, yeah, I love Megan Trainer. That music will never get old. Man, I can't wait to vote in the upcoming election. Let's see what's happening in the news. Washington now ground zero for the Ebola fear. The Ebola crisis is becoming a major election issue. Candidates are scrambling to stake out positions. But will the fallout tip the battle for congressional control? Someone could get off a flight and seek treatment from a witch doctor. What the fuck? October 26, emails. I love Fight Song. That'll never get old. Man, I can't wait for the upcoming election. Let's see what's happening in the news. 
New developments on a bombshell that could reshape the 2016 race. New emails related to the Clinton email investigation. Bombshell announcement has rocked the presidential campaign. Could not only make a difference in this presidential race, but also the control of the Senate. What the fuck? October 2018 caravan. Time for pop music. The Republic's on fire, Brenda. Man, I can't wait to vote in the upcoming election. Let's see what's in the... The migrant caravan has captured the world's attention. The president has put the caravan on center stage. Be a big part of the midterm election. It's going to be an election of the caravan. What the fuck? Wait a minute. Aren't they like a thousand miles away? Why are we freaking out about this now? Why does it always feel like some big sensational news story breaks right before it's time to vote? Oh my God, I get it now. Yes, we are barely two weeks away from the midterms, and Republicans are hitting hard against the growing migrant caravan. Now the question becomes, will this sway voters in the midterms? There's this concept in American politics called the October Surprise. And no, it is not what drag queens do on Halloween. October Surprise refers to a big, unexpected event that gets tons of media coverage and sways people's votes right before an election. In 2004, it was Osama bin Laden releasing a scary video threatening the US. It was inevitable that just before the election, there would be some kind of a message from Osama bin Laden. The video focused the media's attention on on terrorism, which ended up benefiting Bush during the election. In 2012, it was Hurricane Sandy, which gave Obama a chance to look like a leader and problem solver right before his election against Mitt Romney. We've got our October surprise now, Josh. Looks like it's Hurricane so. Sandy. Typically, October surprise describes something unexpected, but it can also be something more calculated. When political operatives intentionally exploit a news story to distract voters and do maximum damage to their opponents. During the 2014 midterm election, it was Ebola. We begin with the breaking news, the deadly Ebola outbreak in Africa, and tonight the first confirmed case here in America. The story quickly became a Republican rallying cry. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got an Ebola outbreak. We need to seal the border and secure it. We have Ebola. We have to secure the border. And news outlets followed their lead, running weeks of sensational wall-to-wall -wall Ebola coverage. Are there concerns of an outbreak in the U.S.? Should they be concerned? Is the threat only going to grow? The ISIS of biological Agent. Are we going overboard here? This chart shows how much airtime cable news networks devoted to Ebola. Look at the spike right in the middle of October. It's emerged already as the most watched news event since the entire Obama presidency began. That coverage created a vicious cycle. The more news networks talked about Ebola, the more politicians had to talk about it to seem relevant. As one Republican strategist told NPR, it's almost impossible for candidates to break into this news cycle unless they're talking about ISIS or Ebola. It's a terrible thing to say, but fear is a heck of a motivator for voters. Research conducted after the midterms found that in the 34 states with Senate elections, higher internet search volume for Ebola was associated with greater intentions to vote for Republican candidates. In 2016, the October surprise was Hillary Clinton's email. Take a shot. Weeks before the election, FBI Director James Comey sent a letter to Congress saying the FBI had found new emails. God damn it. I realized that the words you hear shape you, but the most important pertinent to the investigation into Clinton's private server. Trump is relishing Clinton's October surprise. This is bigger than Watergate. The party welcoming this new line of attack as Republican candidates make their closing arguments to voters. And once again, every news network took the bait. An October surprise unlike anything we have ever seen. Trump has been lagging behind. Could this change anything? The story dominated the New York Times' front page for days. The October surprise no one saw coming. This chart shows how much Clinton coverage was scandal related in the weeks leading up to the election. There's a huge spike right after Comey's letter is released. We will find out soon whether any of those new emails contain classified information. A few days later, Comey announced it had all been a big nothing burger. The director clearing Hillary Clinton on those new emails. But it was too late. Look at Hillary's approval ratings in the weeks after that story broke. Now, it's the migrant caravan. After Trump began tweeting about a group of migrants traveling to the U.S. in hopes of seeking asylum, Republicans turned the story into their closing campaign message. The caravan is coming. Marching on our border. Some say criminals among them. You already know what happens next. Immigration is taking center stage ahead of the midterm elections. Trump's using the caravan as a critical midterm closing argument. Front page after front page in the New York Times, wall-to-wall -wall coverage on every network. Let's talk about the caravan. Let's talk about the caravan. Let's talk about this caravan. Look at how many hours have been dedicated to the 
the story on cable news in the past few weeks alone. Is this going to be a winning issue for your party? I do think it's a winning issue, and I think the president's handling it perfectly. As one Trump official told The Daily Beast, it doesn't matter if it's 100% accurate. This is the play. It seems to me that it's playing out remarkably well for the Republicans. You didn't say email. This one's for me. These October surprises all follow the same formula. One, something big, scary, and vague is coming. The Ebola crisis. The email server issue. The caravan. And two, it all rests on the election. That is a sexy ass formula. It's drama, it's narrative tension, it's CNN's wet dream. It's also complete bullshit. These stories seem really important when they're happening, but they're almost always PR stunts. Look again at the coverage of Ebola in 2014. Look at the drop off once the election's over. It's not like the problem suddenly got fixed after the election. The number of Ebola cases in Liberia actually increased after November, but nobody cared anymore. The story had served its purpose. The same is true for the Clinton Bree mail story. Close enough. Months after Trump won the White House, it's reported that he repeatedly uses an unsecured phone line for personal communication. Intelligence experts say he's definitely being listened to by Russia and China. But the story barely makes a blip on the radar because it was never about national security. It was about winning an election. And the same thing will happen with this migrant caravan story. We know that because we've already been through this before. Earlier this year, Trump fear-mongered about another migrant caravan traveling to the U.S. The group was largely ignored until President Trump used them to highlight the immigration debate. The story sparked a major media firestorm for a few days. Are you watching that mess with the caravan? But then it faded from public debate. Eventually, the migrants arrived and quietly began going through the normal process to apply for asylum. All 228 people are being processed. The legal process could take months, even years. You didn't hear about it because it wasn't election season yet. This is a caravan that has been organized for years. They've been doing this for more than five years. And the evil genius of the October surprise is that it works even if journalists realize it's a gimmick. A lot of news networks have correctly noted that the migrant caravan story is bullshit. President has called it an assault on the U.S. border. It is absolutely not. It's nowhere near the U.S. border. But because Republicans can't stop talking about it, neither can they. This has become a key Republican rallying cry. There are, quote, criminals and unknown Middle Easterners. Criminals and unknown Middle Easterners. Criminals and unknown Middle Easterners. Criminals and, and unknown, unknown Middle, Middle Easterners. Easterners. Mixed in with this caravan. Strategy seems designed to scare voters by constantly repeating a false threat. Yeah, well, it appears to be working, Brenda. The point of the October surprise isn't to warn voters about a real threat. It's to distract them for long enough to get them to vote against their own interests. One Trump official told CNN that the immigration push is clearly working because we're talking about it and not healthcare. Days before the caravan story blew up, Mitch McConnell pledged that Republicans would try to repeal Obamacare again if they survived the midterms. Another report revealed that the Republican tax cuts have exploded the deficit, which is now the worst it's been in six years. And Republicans plan to deal with that deficit by, you guessed it, cutting social programs. There's been a bipartisan reluctance to tackle entitlement changes, Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. Hopefully, we'll get serious about this. Those stories aren't sexy. They don't have the drama of an October surprise. But they are stories that affect millions of people's ability to survive in this country. Stories about policy differences that actually matter on Election Day. Trump is talking about this because he wants to distract from the fact that they want to cut Medicare. But this caravan is coming up. What's the Democratic Party's message about the caravan? The truth is, there's no great defense against the October surprise strategy. Our breaking news culture is super vulnerable to last minute bad faith publicity stunts. But what you can do is ask who benefits if I freak out about this and what are they Starting out with any new project management software usually feels something like this. Where do you trying to hide? But what you can do is super vulnerable the truth is, there's no great defense against the October surprise strategy. Our breaking news culture is super vulnerable to last minute bad faith publicity stunts. But what you can do is ask who benefits if I freak out about this? And what are they trying to hide? So you better take that message with a grain of salt. In other words, take it seriously what he just said. Because we don't know what... This might... We don't know what 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 will happen during this... Uh, because if that's right, then we won't. We don't know what's going to happen this October surprise. So Joe Biden, if you're listening, so Joe Biden, Howie Hawkins, all, if you're listening, you better be prepared for prepared for anything this October. Because they'll be probably they're going to do another October surprise. Be surprised if they don't. Probably this, but best best guess, probably this one would be about the. Um,
coronavirus. Unless there's something worse. Alright. Nah. So let's just admit it. Republicans have broken politics, and here's the proof. And here's the proof. This might be the most important chart for understanding American politics. It shows the ideology of both parties in Congress over the past few decades. Researchers looked at every politician's voting record and then gave them a score based on how extreme or moderate they were. And if you look at the past 40 years, something dramatic has happened. Both parties have moved away from the center, but Republicans in Congress have moved much further than Democrats have. That difference is even more jarring if you look at the past few presidents. Republican presidents have become more and more conservative over the past few decades, while Democrats have stayed fairly consistent. Political scientists have a name for this. They call it asymmetrical polarization. It's one of the most important trends in recent American politics, but it's also one of the hardest to talk about. And that's posing a big challenge for journalists who want to stay neutral while covering a party that's increasingly going off the rails. This is not the Republican Party that any of us recognize. This is not the Republican Party I joined 40 years ago. What happened to the Republican Party? Oh, I've been asking myself that question. It's soul crushing for me. Let's just address the soy boy in the room. I am not a great person to be making this argument. I'm a queer, tree-hugging atheist with immigrant parents. Me criticizing Republicans is about as shocking as Vox having marimbas in the background of a video. So, I brought some backup. I'm Norm Ornstein. I'm a political scientist. I've been think tanking it for longer than most of the people watching this have been alive. Norm Ornstein is kind of a legend. He spent the past four decades writing about Congress and American politics. He's been named one of the top 100 global thinkers. I used to win debate competitions in high school using articles that Ornstein wrote. A fun fact that he did not find to be that fun. Most of Ornstein's work has focused on how to make sure that Congress stays functional. I work very closely with a lot of Democrats and with a lot of Republicans. In all the years that I wrote about Congress, I was very, very careful to be not a partisan. But if you look at the titles of Ornstein's books, you can see a quiet transformation happening. It starts off normal enough. Congress and Change, Evolution and Reform. Campaign Finance, An Illustrated Guide. Then it gets a little darker. The Permanent Campaign and Its Future. The Broken Branch, How Congress is Failing America. And then, in 2012, Ornstein and his writing partner Thomas Mann write this book. It's even worse than it looks how the American constitutional system collided with the new politics of extremism. In it, they write, the Republican Party is an insurgent outlier. It has become ideologically extreme, scornful of compromise, and dismissive of the legitimacy of its political opposition. The Democratic Party, while no paragon of civic virtue, is more open to incremental changes, fashioned through bargaining with the Republicans. This asymmetry constitutes a huge obstacle to effective governance. Holy sh**. Uh, man and I came to the conclusion that we couldn't sugarcoat this anymore. The fact is that Congress changed. Ornstein's critique of the modern GOP falls into two major categories, their goals and their methods. There's no question that the Republican Party's goals have become more extreme over the past few years. In 2006, George Bush was talking about immigration like this. There is a rational middle ground between granting an automatic path to citizenship and a program of mass deportation. Compare that to Donald Trump. Force? You're going to have a deportation. Force. In 1970, a Republican president created the Environmental Protection Agency to regulate pollution. These problems will not stand still for politics or for partisanship. Now, Republicans campaign on abolishing that same agency. We are going to end the EPA intrusion into your lives. Even the Republican obsession with tax cuts is a relatively new phenomenon. Reagan is worshipped as a tax hawk now, but he actually raised taxes 11 times during his presidency. Do you think the millionaire ought to pay more in taxes than the bus driver, or less? <laughs> Ronald Reagan, welcome to the resistance. On its own, that ideological shift isn't a huge problem, as long as the two parties still work together. Our political parties are supposed to view the other side as adversaries who may view the world differently, but we can work with them. And that's where Ornstein's second critique comes in, about Republicans' methods, the way they pursue their policy goals. Over the past few decades, Republicans have gotten less and less willing to work with Democrats on anything. This chart shows how often the filibuster was used to block a vote in the Senate. When Republicans aren't in power, they're more willing to stop Democrats from getting anything done. And you can really see it escalate after Obama wins the presidency in 08. That year, Democrats won both houses of Congress. And in a normal world, Republicans would have taken the L, reworked their campaign strategy, and focused on the next election. Instead, 
Mitch McConnell came out and said this. Our top political priority over the next two years should be to deny President Obama a second term. Cool beans. And it wasn't just McConnell. In a private meeting before Obama's inauguration, leading Republicans reportedly agreed, if you act like you're the minority, you're gonna stay in the minority. We've gotta challenge them on every single bill and challenge them on every single campaign. And they did. In 2011, Republicans held the debt ceiling hostage, threatening to let the country default if the Democratic majority didn't agree to major cuts in Medicare and Social Security. As long as this president is in the Oval Office, a real solution is probably unattainable. In 2013, they actually shut the government down, trying to force Obama to defund Obamacare. That was a remarkable victory to see the House engage in a profile in courage. And a lot of this obstruction wasn't even ideological. Some of it was no for the sake of no. In 2016, Republicans were rejected Obama's budget before they even saw what was in it. And then, of course, there's Merrick Garland. Republicans flat out refused to meet with Obama's Supreme Court nominee for months. Not because he was too liberal, Garland was objectively a centrist, but because they wanted a Republican to fill the seat. We don't intend to take up a nominee. You ever watch someone's soul wither away mid-sentence? The thing is, if Hillary had won the election, many Republicans said they would have kept the seat open permanently, preferring to have an incomplete Supreme Court than let a Democrat appoint a justice. That is not normal behavior by party leaders, and it is a reflection of a strategy that designed to divide Americans and use your leverage to hold power even if you are not a majority in the country. Regardless of how you feel about tax cuts or Obamacare, this my way or the highway approach is bad for democracy. And Ornstein's book was his attempt to get neutral observers, including journalists, to admit that. And it really is a party that I would say has gone rogue. And I don't say that as a partisan. It is a fact of life, an unfortunate one for the country. The problem is admitting that fact makes you sound like a liberal hack. And if you look at the comments on this video, you know exactly what I mean. Talking about asymmetric polarization, by definition, means you treat the two parties differently. And that means being accused of liberal bias. This is tough for media to do. Tough because you get caught in the crosshairs. It's tough because you can lose viewers or listeners. So instead, many networks have framed political fights as just bitter disputes between two parties that can't get along. A stalemate now exists as both sides dig in their heels. Both sides blaming one another for this impasse. Both sides playing politics. You saw it during the 2013 government shutdown. Republicans literally held the government hostage to undermine Obamacare. But instead of pointing that out, a lot of coverage blamed both sides for not compromising. With both sides digging in, we are now in uncharted territory. Both sides refuse to budge. Washington is a dysfunctional town, and there's plenty of blame to go around on both sides. Obama went out of his way to avoid that framing. I want every American to understand why it did happen. They demanded ransom just for doing their job. But the media's affinity for that both sides frame meant that even those comments got criticized. President Obama playing the blame game. Playing the blame game. The blame game continues. This kind of knee-jerk neutrality makes it really hard to understand who's responsible for breaking our politics. If you are monomaniacal in pursuit of both sides, you ignore a reality where there may be one side. And the scary thing about asymmetrical polarization is that it forces the other party to play hardball too. When Republicans refused to vote on a huge number of Obama's judicial appointees, Democrats changed the rules. Democrats voted to lower the threshold to break a filibuster from 60 votes to 51 votes. It's time to change the Senate before this institution becomes obsolete. It was a bad, but necessary response to an unusual situation, one created by Republicans. But that decision to change the rules has haunted Democrats for years. As tensions flared over Brett Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court, MSNBC's Casey Hunt blamed Democrats for starting the problem. You know, there's a lot of people you can blame for that. Started with the Democrats and Harry Reid when he took away the filibuster for those circuit court judges and it got lower when Mitch McConnell did it for the Supreme Court. Ornstein actually got into a Twitter fight with Hunt over that comment, writing, I know the desire to show you are balanced but the truth is not always balanced. And equating Reid, who was no angel, with McConnell, who blew up more norms and practices in the Senate than all other leaders before him combined, is just wrong. Damn, norms. This problem is likely to get worse as time goes on. The more Republicans move to the extreme, the more Democrats are gonna seem obstructionist in response. Look at this filibuster graph again. Every time Republicans raise the stakes, Democrats react by matching them. That's gonna make it really tempting to say both sides are equally bad. Guess what the Democrats are doing? Punching back, tit for tat. Neither side here has clean hands. There seem to be no grown-ups in charge. But what that does is it means that people who behave badly get off the hook. Nobody blames them for it. And it's easy for them to say, hey, the other side is worse. The only way to discourage this kind of norm-breaking behavior is to be really clear about 
who's causing it. And that's going to require journalists to be brutally honest about what's happening to the Republican Party. It doesn't mean that you all become tribal advocates. It means that you call out people who are violating norms or who are behaving in a corrupt fashion. But if you don't do that, then you're not doing what you're supposed to do as a vital part of a free society. Some of the worst things that have been said about me over the years have been said by Norm Ornstein. <laughs> One thing we agree on, some of the worst things that have been said about me have been said by you. So No, no. Thank you. Now, here's a video by Bernie Sanders of, the Democrat, of a Democratic, press con Democratic Party reform press conference on Washington, D.C., June 14, 2016. I think he was still in the race then. How do we revitalize the Democratic Party? How do we make it easy for people to participate politically rather than have one of the lowest voter turnouts of any major country on earth? Number one, I do believe that we have to replace the current the Democratic National Committee leadership. Uh, we need a person at the leadership of the DNC who is vigorously supporting and outworking to bring people into the political process. Yeah, I know political parties need money, but it is more important that we have energy, that we have young people, that we have working class people who are going to participate in the political process and fight for their kids and for their parents. We need at the Democratic National Convention to approve a progressive platform, the most progressive platform ever passed by the Democratic Party, a platform which makes it crystal clear that the Democratic Party is in fact on the side of working people, is on the side of low income people, is on the side of people who have no health insurance, and is prepared to stand up to the powerful corporate interest whose greed is doing so much harm to this country. We need real electoral reform within the Democratic Party. And that means, among many, many other things, open primaries, the idea that in the state of New York, the great state of New York, three million people could not participate in helping to select who the Democratic or Republican candidate for president would be because they had not registered, because they had registered as an independent, not as a Democrat or Republican, is incomprehensible. We need open, we need same day registration. And that means that anybody in this country can walk in and get registered to vote on the day of a primary or a caucus. We need adequate staffing and training to run elections in a way that is appropriate for our democracy. We now take it for granted, but we should not. In this process, we have gone through a situation in Arizona where people waited online five hours in order to cast their votes. How many tens of thousands of people simply gave up, gave up the right to vote and walked away? Uh, we need to make sure that we have uh, in uh, California, among other states, that the votes get counted. We are taking for granted that in California it will take weeks for votes to actually uh, be uh, counted, and I'm not sure that the votes have yet been counted in Puerto Rico. So we need major, major changes in the Democratic Party in converting it to a party of the people, welcoming working people, welcoming young people, and we need an electoral process which is worthy of the Democrats. We also need, obviously, to get rid of super delegates. The idea that we had, in this case, 400 super delegates pledged to a candidate some eight months or more before the first ballot was cast is, to my mind, absurd. And we need to also make sure that superdelegates do not live in a world of their own, but reflect, reflect the views of the people in their own state. So those are just a few of the changes that I think that has got to take place uh, and that we will be fighting for 
in the weeks uh, and months uh, to come. Thank you, Bernie Sanders. Okay, now, okay, we're halfway done. Okay, we're halfway done. So, so we'll be back. All right, All right now, it's time. It's time for a commercial break. It's time for a commercial break. So, we'll be right. We'll return to you. But for, we'll return to you in a minute. But first, a word from our sponsor. I forgot I forgot my hat. Forgot my hat. <laughs> Sorry, fo folks, that that commercial break took so long. I don't want to talk about the reasons why, but... Anyway, anyway, let's continue. Let's continue on with the next with this next video. As Robert Reich explains the biggest threat to our democracy that you haven't even heard of. So, let's begin. Let's begin. Biggest threat to our democracy you haven't heard of. The biggest threat to our democracy that nobody's talking about is the real possibility of a rogue constitutional convention, empowering extremists to radically reshape the Constitution, our laws, and our country. If just a few more states sign on to what's called an Article 5 convention for a balanced budget amendment, there's no limit to the damage they might do. Now, let me explain. There are two ways to amend the United States Constitution. One way, the way we've passed every amendment since the Bill of Rights, is for two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate to vote for a proposed amendment and then have it ratified by at least three-quarters of the states, now 38 in number. But there's a second way to amend the Constitution. Two-thirds of the states may demand Congress form a constitutional convention to propose amendments. Once a constitutional convention is convened, there are no rules to limit or constrain what comes next. Amendments proposed by an Article 5 convention are supposed to be ratified by 38 states, but convention delegates could hijack the process and change the ratification process itself, tossing out the 38 state requirement. A balanced budget amendment would be crazy enough, but nothing would be safe. A woman's right to choose, marriage equality, First Amendment protections for free speech and free press, equal protection of the laws, checks and balances. The worst case scenario is an Article 5 convention would allow delegates to write their agenda into our Constitution. This would be chaos. Already 28 states have called for a constitutional convention. They only need six more to succeed. Unlimited money in politics and partisan gerrymandering have already given Republicans control of a majority of state legislatures. Big money interests like the Koch brothers and ALEC are investing heavily in the push for a constitutional convention, which means that they'd be calling the shots if one takes place. Now, I understand you're probably already overwhelmed with political actions you need to take, but believe me, this is important. With just a few states to go, your voice is needed. These are the states that could vote for a constitutional convention. If you're in one of them, please tell your state lawmakers to reject calls for an Article 5 convention. Reject an Article 5 convention. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to see more of our videos, please follow this page. Will do. Already done. America You tell Tell me, do you think an You think an Article 5 convention should be considered a crime against democracy because I know cuz I know cuz I know stuff like Alec the Koch brothers Koch brothers are doing is is considered a crime. What they're doing doing should be is considered a crime against democracy. You know what I mean? Bribing politicians, corruption, corruption, that all should be corrupt. In fact, corruption should be a federal crime. And I'll make that. Any kind of corruption, business, political, you, you know. No. 
you know, tell me what you think in the comments below, down below. Low about that. And gerrymandering, too. gerrymandering is also, should also, is also considered a crime against democracy. But we'll talk about that later. Anyway, now, now the next video is the roof. Okay, minor. Okay, this video is going to be talking about the roots of, of America's democracy. Minority rule is a majority problem. Political systems depend on legitimacy. In America, that legitimacy is failing. In an earlier version of this video, we incorrectly reported the population of New York. The state's population in 2017 was 19.85 million people. Read more about how a compromise to unify our states is splitting our parties. HTTPS colon slash slash www.vox.com slash policy hyphen and hyphen politi. Let's take a better look at that. I don't know if you can see it, but maybe I could find a better way to do it for you to read it. Okay. HTTPS colon slash slash www.vox.com slash policy hyphen and hyphen politics slash 2018 slash 10 slash 16 slash 1795159 slash Kavanaugh hyphen Trump hyphen Senate hyphen impeachment hyphen of TTI hyphen Democrats hyphen 2020 hyphen Supreme hyphen court. Did you get it? That was a mouthful. Did you get all that was a mouthful. Did you get all that? Well, if you didn't. Well, if you didn't, you can replay the video. You can rewind the video and then uh, play it back slowly. The video YouTube has that option. See, playback speed. Okay, now, now for the video. Now for the video. America has a democracy problem. America has a democracy problem. Take a look at this chart. Over there on the left, that's how many people each member of the U.S. House represented in 1790. There's now one representative for every 747,000 Americans. That makes the U.S. a crazy undemocratic outlier internationally. But it also makes us different than what we were supposed to be. The Founding Fathers, they wanted that number to stay small. James Madison wanted to make sure that it would never be more than one House member for 50,000 people. I bring this up because it's one of a lot of ways in which our system has become different than what the founders intended, which maybe is okay, I think it's okay, but it's also different than what we may have intended or what we may want. Box. People ask me sometimes what I actually worry about in American politics, what makes me afraid, and it's this. A political system needs to be legitimate to be stable. People need to feel that it's fair. But is that true right now? Two out of the past three presidents have lost the popular vote for the first term in office. Two out of three. House elections are utterly warped by gerrymandering and geography. The Senate gives 623,000 people in Vermont as much power as the more than 19 million people in New York. And meanwhile, five dudes in robes who are politically appointed by parties looking for ideologues, they made it legal for billionaires to spend as much money buying elections as they want. And here's where undemocratic becomes actually dangerous. The American political system was built around the fear of disunity. The fear was that the states would pull apart. We weren't supposed to have political parties. The Founding Fathers thought they were bad, or at least they did before they started some. But now we do have political parties. And the competition, the core competition, the disunity in this country is between them. We don't worry about the political divisions between big states and small states. We worry about the ones between red states and blue states. And the particular ways in which America is undemocratic is making that core competition less fair, is making that political disunity more serious. 
The reason for that is not one anybody saw coming. Democrats cluster in big cities. Republicans are more concentrated in rural areas. The average state is six points more Republican than the country as a whole, which gives that party a huge advantage in the Senate. And in the House, well, Democrats are feeling pretty good about the House right now. But to win the House, they couldn't win by one or two or three percent. They'd win a landslide, six or seven or eight percent, or else they'd still be in the minority because of gerrymandering and geography. And Republicans, they're using that advantage in elections to write the rules to give themselves more advantages in elections. They're using it to win the Supreme Court for a generation, and that Supreme Court, in turn, is giving them rulings on gerrymandering, on money in politics, on unions, on voter rights that are helping them win more power. As the left realizes it's playing a rigged game, they're already becoming determined to rewrite the rules. If you want to see where this is going, look at this book by David Ferris called It's Time for Democrats to Fight Dirty. It's a playbook the left can use to get more power without having to change the Constitution. And they can do a lot. He recommends statehood for D.C. and Puerto Rico. He recommends breaking up California into seven states in order to add at least a dozen new Democratic senators. He tells Democrats to pack the Supreme Court by increasing the number of justices in order to crack the conservative majority. He wants winner-take-all elections to be replaced with ranked choice voting in the House and to increase the number of representatives to 870. And look, some of these ideas, they're actually just good ideas. They would make politics more representative. I mean, D.C. and Puerto Rico should clearly be and they can do a lot. He recommends statehood for DC and already becoming determined to rewrite the rules. If you want to see where this is going, look at this book by David Ferris called It's Time for Democrats to Fight Dirty. It's a playbook the left can use to get more power without having to change the Constitution. And they can do a lot. He recommends statehood for D.C. and Puerto Rico. He recommends breaking up California into seven states in order to add at least a dozen new Democratic senators. He tells Democrats to pack the Supreme Court by increasing the number of justices in order to crack the conservative majority. He wants winner-take-all elections to be replaced with ranked choice voting in the House and to increase the number of representatives to 870. And look, some of these ideas, they're actually just good ideas. They would make politics more representative. I mean, D.C. and Puerto Rico should clearly be states. That's just fair. And then some, like the California thing, they're just power grabs. But that's the thing. As Democrats feel the right has been engaged in one long power grab, they're starting to feel like suckers for not grabbing more power themselves. And it's why you see the rise of street fighter, do-anything Democrats like lawyer Michael Avenatti. When they go low, I say, we hit harder. Even Eric Holder, President Obama's former attorney general, has taken up the battle cry. When they go low, we kick them. That's what, that's what this new Democratic Party is about. But imagine, just imagine Democrats take power and run some version of the Ferris playbook in 2020 or 2024. There will be an equal and opposite reaction among Republicans. Now the system will feel unfair to them. And you could just see a cycle of escalation here that destroys the basic legitimacy on which American politics rests. We need something better than that. We need more than power grabs on both sides. We need actual principles we can use to build a political system that works better. We treat our political system as if it were like etched on stone tablets and carried by George Washington down from Mount Sinai. But it wasn't. We've changed it a lot. But we haven't changed it recently. It's weird. The further we get from the founding, the more afraid we are to touch the system. There were 27 amendments to the Constitution before 92. There have been zero since then, and there's not like there's one on the horizon. That's not how we do things anywhere else. States routinely amend and even rewrite their constitutions. On average, each state has had three constitutions, and Louisiana, they've had 11. It's only at the national level that we've come to believe our political system should be frozen in amber, that however we're doing things is how we should keep doing them. And puzzlingly, we've decided that not when we think our political system is great, but at the exact time that Americans are losing faith in our political institutions. I suspect our true belief is not that our system of government is performing so well that it should be immune to change, but that we, that we are performing so poorly that we don't trust ourselves to change it. Which is sad, but this is our political system. We can't run away in self-loathing. It needs to work for the country we actually have. We can't have an old compromise between states leading to a civil war between parties. But to change it, we need a theory of what makes a political system legitimate in the first place. And that means we need some criteria by which to judge it. Robert Dahl, one of the most respected political scientists of the 20th century, he believed the ideal US Constitution would, one, maintain democracy, 
Two, protect fundamental rights. Three, ensure fairness among citizens. Four, encourage forming consensus. And five, provide a government that is effective in solving problems. I like that as criteria. I think that would make sense. If you don't like it, that's fine. What you need then is to come up with something better. The one thing we can't do is just stay still. America's in an unstable equilibrium. Its current political system is producing outcomes that feel illegitimate to the left. Any effort to reform that system feels like it would produce outcomes that feel illegitimate to the right. We need something deeper than that. We need something that would feel legitimate to both sides and would actually work. We can't stay right where we are. So that Agreed. means the answer is simple. We must move. Yeah. Thank you. Amy? Well, here I I wonder what Ber I wonder what Bernie would think of that book. Now before first off, but he does but that but he does have a point. We gotta do something otherwise otherwise we're we're done we're done for. Otherwise our country's done for. We have to our country's democracy mainly. But he is right. But the political parties is right about one thing. Just look how it. Just look how it. Now it's about parties, not just p. It's. It should. It's basically now party over people. Before we go, before we go on, I, I wanted to sh show you an or organization. Um. Uh, to... A grassroots move movement. If I could find it. Okay, this might take long. Oh. My bad. Oh well, this might take a little while. While so, please stand. Please stand by for a second. Found it. It's called No Labels. Okay, here's their mission statement. No Labels is a groundbreaking movement led by Americans who embrace the new politics of problem solving and are collaborating to find common sense, nonpartisan solutions to our toughest challenges. And here's their, if you want to contact them, here's how to do it. They have a, oh, they have a social, social media, YouTube, Link it, link it in. That's how you pronounce it. Linked in, in. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Here's how to con. Here's how to contact them. Two zero two five eight eight one nine nine zero eleven thirty Connecticut Avenue, N.W. That's that was their phone number right there. One. Now here's their address. Eleven thirty Connecticut Avenue, N.W. Suite 325, Washington, D.C. 20036. Privacy. Okay, that was their address. That's fine. Okay, this is why they matter. I would play the video, but I'm, but no, but nothing. But that's for you. But that's for you to do. Why we matter? 
Like never before, American politics is consumed by partisanship. The far left and far right see one another not as opponents to be debated, but as enemies to be destroyed, and they are crowding out mainstream voices in both parties. No labels represents you, the vast... We are not a third party. No labels represents you. No labels represents you, the vast majority of Americans, tens of millions of citizens, who are fed up with the dysfunction in our politics and will no longer tolerate a government that can't or won't work together to address the challenges facing America. We are not a third party, but rather a third bloc. No labels brings leaders to the middle where problems get solved, work gets done for you, solutions are turned on. We are not a third party, but rather a third bloc, a coalition of real people from every neighborhood in America determined to forge solutions on the issues we are facing, from the economy to healthcare, jobs to climate change, gun safety to immigration, infrastructure, the national debt, and beyond. We are not beholden to either party or any special interests. We are beholden to you, alone, and to ensuring practical solutions that have a lasting impact. We don't care where the policy ideas come from, so long as they are good ones that make America stronger, more prosperous, and more united. Our mantra. Stop fighting, start, fix, start fixing. No labels declarations. Previous. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If no labels provides the voice and support to protect, protect and elect problem solvers, together we can empower leaders to solve America's toughest challenges. No institutional ca caucuses, caucus has existed to counter the extremes of either party. It does now. It's called the Problem Solvers Caucus, and no labels inspired it. Congressional party leaders depend on these groups to stay in power and or are aligned with their agenda. Organized extreme groups in Congress drive the agenda, shift the debate to the far right and left, and kill bipartisan cooperation. The U.S. Congress is the epicenter of dysfun dysfunction in our politics. Its inability to solve problems is forcing too many decisions into the White House and the courts, which makes polar polarization across the country even worse. Now let's take a look at their genesis. It was a... Never mind. You know what, I think I'll let you do this yourself. So, if you want to learn more about No Labels and if you want to join them, go to www.nolabels.org. All right? And now let's continue on with the next video. Worried about our democracy? We can fix it. The people, the people versus the politicians. Well, here I am on July forth like you thinking about our country our beloved country thinking about family because sometimes it seems as though our democracy is coming apart well here i am okay let's first so it start off with this description before we get before we get started Does it feel to you as if our democracy is coming apart at the seams? 
Gridlock, hate speech, dark money, negative ads, political parties at each other's throats instead of working together for our common good? It's almost enough to cause people give up on American democracy. But don't go there, please. Hang in. Because we can fix our broken democracy. I know that because good people from Florida and the Carolinas to the Dakotas and Washington state have shown me how they're winning reforms to make our elections fairer and to restore the power of we the people. In fact, 2018 was the best year for political reforms in half a century. That's an amazing story. I call it the democracy rebellion, I've filmed grassroots reformers in several states, and now I want to share their videos with you. That's the whole point of this YouTube channel to showcase and share the incredible and inspiring stories of ordinary Americans like you and me fixing our broken democracy. Two of my favorites are the badass grandmas of North Dakota that's what they call themselves two women in their 70s, one a Democrat, the other, a Republican, who organized a citizen's campaign against lobbyists, special interests, and out-of-state money corrupting their elections. And they won. Other citizens reformers have been rebelling against politicians rigging elections, rising up against billionaire and corporate money, fighting for voters' rights and working for fair, clean elections. Their courage and commitment are infectious. You'll love them. My hunch is the tie you. LL catch the bug equals that after you see these videos, you'll take heart and decide to take action, to come off the sidelines and join the fight in your own hometown and your home state to clean up our corrupt politics and help restore the power of we the people. Wow. Wonderful shoes. Wonder if I should have a copy of that. Kind of have a copy of that for my description. Well, anyway, let's let's continue. Let's start the video. Well, here I am on July Fourth, like you, thinking about our country, our beloved country, thinking about family and friends and neighbors, my good wife, my four wonderful children, eight wonderful grandchildren, and their future and our country's future. And to be perfectly honest with you, I'm worried, I'm concerned, because sometimes it seems as though our democracy is coming apart at the seams, that it's broken. I'm talking about things like gridlock and hate speech and negative ads and the war words in Washington, political parties at each other's throats instead of working together to fix our nation's problems. It's almost enough to make some people give up on American democracy, but please don't go there, hang in, because I know American democracy can be fixed. People have shown me how they're fixing our broken democracy. I've been covering American politics for a long time, since the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And I can tell you that today, the best story, the most amazing story, the most encouraging story that I've seen is the story of what I call the democracy rebellion. People, power, and action. Ordinary people like you and me coming off the sidelines, rolling up their sleeves, to fix America's broken democracy. I'm gonna share their stories with you. In fact, that's the whole point of this YouTube channel, is to share the stories of the democracy rebellion with other people. And when you see what these people are doing, you're gonna be amazed, you'll be impressed, you'll like them. You're gonna see people who are rebelling against politicians, rigging elections to keep themselves in power. You're gonna see them fighting against corporate and billionaire money dominating their elections. You're gonna see them working for better access to the ballot, for voters' rights, to make our elections fairer, cleaner, more open, and more inclusive. And I guarantee you, when you see it, you're gonna take heart because they're winning many, many of these battles. Not everyone, but many of these battles. My hope is that when you see these stories, you're gonna come off the sidelines and wanna get involved yourself and work in your home state and your hometown to put American democracy back on the right track to help fix our broken democracy. One more thing before we part. Please be sure to vote this year. Vote by mail, vote in person, vote however you can. Vote as if your life depended on it, because it may. This could be the most important vote of your lifetime. We can do this thing if we work at it together. First step, please click on that little button down there and subscribe to our channel so you can see more of these encouraging videos. And then click on that little button down there and watch one of them right now. You won't believe your eyes. When you see what these people are doing, you'll be impressed. It'll make your day. In fact, it'll help restore your faith in American democracy. And that's great. I hope it does. And thanks. You're welcome.
but right now there's a pro there's a problem as as brave new films is going to explain there's an apb poll workers wanted we are short about 500 poll workers facing a shortage of poll workers we naturally lose poll workers as we approach election day they cannot staff even one polling place in 111 jurisdictions they're really trying to find some poll workers and finding places with younger people who maybe could step up the next generation of poll workers with protecting the democracy. pandemic that's going on it, the populations that generally serve as poll workers don't want to put themselves in harm's way, and so they're not signing up to be poll workers again. A major poll worker shortage all across the state, nearly 60% of Wisconsin municipalities. The shortage of experienced poll workers due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Every time someone would come in, they would talk about their experience from the last election, and it was never good. We're not trying to suppress you at all. We're really trying to help you get your vote out. We're saying, hey, we as a community are taking elections seriously and we're taking them seriously enough to say we're going to work on election day to count your ballot. Democracy only functions when everyone participates and I want to make sure that everyone has the ability and access to be able to participate. All of us have a role and I, I try to remind my peers our impacts our legacy. Poll workers provide an essential service and can be the difference between a chaotic experience and an organized experience. September 1st is National Poll Worker. It takes a few hours. Um, they get you set up and then they assign you to a poll location. The trainings usually take four hours. If you get your experience, you'll be more trained than most people in the country. I'm in charge of the processing. I'm handling the voters and I'm making sure that they have a really good experience and I'm getting paid. The process couldn't be easier. You can head to powerthepolls.com um, and input your information and for how to become a poll worker in every county in the country that needs poll workers. And make a little extra money on the side. Sign up on September 1st to work for the polls. The outlook on our public health changes from day to day. So you could have enough poll workers one day and a lot of them quit because there's a COVID outbreak. That's why we're just focusing on getting as many of our people hired and working as possible. When you know my friends and my peers walked through that door and saw my face and saw younger faces, they felt more welcome and felt like they were represented in the people who were the kind of gatekeepers to them voting. Because we've had enough. We've been forgotten about in so many different spaces. If you want for things to change for, the, for how it affects you, sometimes you have to put yourself in that position. We just don't need people working the polls. We need young people from 16 to 25 working the polls as much as possible. Ultimately, the poll workers are the person on election day that's standing between you and voting. Our generation, I think we're at the unique point where we can move past just preserving democracy, but expanding what democracy is in the United States. Help your community to power the polls. Sign up at powerthepolls.org. Bravenewfilms.org. So now you know we need we need poll workers in order to get the pay. Hi, I'm Jess. In order to fix this. And this is Flo. And we are Real Time History. Over the past six years, we have been covering the First World War and its aftermath in over 700 episodes over on our YouTube channel, The Great War. A project that would have never been possible on traditional. Okay, the daily con con conversation. Wait a minute. This co This is this thing is just like the his, his description. All right. Well, let's take a look at this video anyway. This is how to save American democracy. By the Daily Con Conversation. Is that how you pronounce it? Let's see. 
The Daily Conversation. Yep, I pronounced it right. Okay. All right, let's get started. TDCvideo.com. Senator Bernie Sanders, the great senator from Vermont, the independent senator from Vermont, may be the best American congressperson in Congress right now. In early December, he stood in front of the Senate and gave a brilliant speech about an amendment to the Constitution that he's proposing uh, that would overturn the Citizen United decision by the Supreme Court. In its now infamous Citizens United decision, the United States Supreme Court upended over a century of precedent taking a somewhat narrow legal question just... and using it as an opportunity to radically change our political landscape, unleashing a tsunami of corporate spending on campaign ads that has just begun. Make no mistake, the Citizens United ruling has radically changed the nature of our democracy, further tilting the balance of the power toward the rich and the powerful at a time when already the wealthiest people in this country have never had it so good. While there is no way of knowing for sure, since there are no disclosure requirements in place to track what was spent, it is no secret that already in the 2010 midterm elections, corporations and some very, very wealthy individuals spent a huge and unprecedented amount of money to further their political goals. And there is no question that this is just the beginning of their efforts. At a time when corporations have over $2 trillion in cash in their bank accounts and are making record-breaking profits, the American people should be concerned when the Supreme Court says that these corporations have a constitutionally protected right to spend, spend, spend shareholders' money to dominate an election as if they were real, live persons. There will be no end to the impact that corporate interests can have on our campaigns and our democracy if we do not end the Citizens United decision and its impact on our nation. That was a brilliant speech, a stirring speech. Sanders certainly knows how to deliver his message on point. Uh, you can watch the full speech on our website linked below, and you can sign the petition linked below on Senator Sanders' webpage to lend your support to overturning the Citizens United case that is one of the most atrocious Supreme Court decisions in our nation's history. Join the conversation. Comment below and help share their message. This message. Yeah, we did see that video. Hello, I'm Dr. Rev, and I'm here today to tell you that terrible automatic captions, we in the fake medical community call craptions, can do serious harm to your videos. That's because 85% of viewers watch videos with the sound off, and without good captions, they don't know what's going on. They might read the captions below. Okay, next is jo Josh, Sil Josh Silver, who's going to explain on TED. It's going to explain on TEDx Amherst. TEDx Amherst. TEDx Amherst on how we fix American democracy. Again, again with this. <laughs> again with this. Mad. Man, I would, where does it where does this originate from? <laughs> Jeez. Like that settles it. I guess I'm gonna. Two organizations represent us and um, represent us and um, no labels. I hope I could fit him in. Speaking of which, 
Give me a, give me just, give me a, just one second here. Okay, I fin Okay, I, did, I got it. I did what I did. So now here's here's what we know about Josh Silver. Josh Silver, founder and director of non-profit organization Represent Us, walks through the lines that show what's wrong with legal corruption in our government, how we fix it, and what you can do about it. Josh Silver is the founder and director of Represent Us, a post-partisan, non-profit organization that is advancing campaign finance and election reforms across the nation. Josh is co-founder and former CEO of Free Press, an advocacy group that promotes critical journalism and internet openness. He served as campaign manager of the successful 1998 clean elections ballot measure in Arizona. Josh publishes widely on democracy, media, election, campaign finance, and a range of other public policy issues. Okay, now we got that now that we got that out of the way, let's start. Let's Let's start the video. Good morning. If we were in the South, you would all say good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Josh Silver, and I'm going to start by telling you a story. And it begins here, in the Marañón River in Peru, the northeastern corner of Peru. I was 26 years old. It was 1995, and I was on an epic adventure. I had built a 15 foot by 15 foot raft, put about a month's worth of food on it, and set out to head towards the city of Iquitos, which was really pretty outrageous. I was with this guy, Patchen Miller from New Hampshire, and uh, four days into the trip, we were ambushed. Uh, Patchen was shot and killed, I was shot and left for dead, and it started in odyssey that took me seven days to get to the capital of Lima where when the doctor was taking these seven pieces of birdshot out of my leg he kept shaking his head I was on a local anesthetic he kept shaking his head saying mucho suerte the bullets had missed my artery by a centimeter it was just a centimeter between life and death I came back from the experience feeling lost uh, I felt a, a sort of this acute sense that life is short and tenuous, thoughts that you'd usually have later in life that I was having then, and it's a very deep and abiding feeling like I wanted to make the world a better place with these remaining years I had uh, for, for everybody. And for me, that meant focusing on the things that mattered most. And as a 26-year-old, that was hard because you look at the refugee camps and poverty and gun safety and climate, and there's so much. And what I want you to do for a moment is I want everybody here to take a few seconds and I want you to think about your issue. What are, what are your issue or issues that you care really deeply about? Education and climate change. Chances are, whatever those issues are, they are either stuck or not being addressed properly because we are experiencing political system failure in the United States. We have a, a country which is no longer considered a full democracy, according to The Economist magazine, that inventories the world's democracies every year, and for the first time ever, beginning in 2017, we dropped from a full to a partial democracy. Only 19 full democracies remain. Why? There's many factors. 4% of Americans have a great deal of confidence in Congress. The last presidential race, 
had the two least popular candidates since record keeping began for president. A Princeton study a few years ago looked at 20 years of what Congress did or didn't do and at the same time public polling on issues related to what they did or didn't do and found that the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule near zero statistically non-significant impact on public policy. That's for the 50th percentile economically, not the 10th percentile. Really think about what I just said. Now, what's going on here? Well, consider that the two most expensive Senate races for the US Senate in 2016, you would have had to raise over $40,000 a day, every day, 365 days a year for six years to have enough money to win that Senate seat. Politicians have become dependent on this 0.05% of Americans who write checks for $10,000 or more to politics. Lobbyists write our laws. Meanwhile, we have a two-party duopoly that excludes competition structurally from independent or third-party candidates, despite the fact that the latest numbers see us at 42% of American voters registered independents. 30% are Democrats, 27 or six are percent are Republican. The numbers vary a little bit, but independents are increasingly near 50% of the public, but they have no home. Gerrymandering has rendered 86% of general elections uncompetitive. Only 14% of races for the U.S. House are competitive. The, the districts are, are carved up like this. And you might think that these things like the duopoly and gerrymandering, well, that's about competition, and boy, I wish there were more competition but it's deeper than that. Because for example, if most races for the US House, there's no competition in the general election, the only place there is competition is in the primary election. And in primary elections, only 15 to 25% of voters turn out, and those voters are reliably more extreme than the general populace. You wonder why there's no basic background checks for guns? The voters who the politicians rely on to reelect them in the primaries don't allow it, so the politicians don't. And, and then on top of that, you've got the lack of integrity because politicians are routinely being bought. So you've got a system that structurally prevents competition, integrity, and it fosters extremism. We have a corrupt system where we the people are crying out for help. And we have a statistically near zero impact upon public policy. Now, the result of this tirade of bad facts results in something even worse. A country where child poverty is among the worst in the developed world. A country where almost half, 43% of US families today, this is from last year, can't afford basics like rent and food. A country where the US healthcare is ranked the worst in the developed world, where we see massive fraud and waste because of the broken system and a waste of taxpayers' money. We see a prison population with a higher, higher per capita incarceration rate than Russia and China. And climate change, which appears to be at the point of no return, while our government does virtually nothing. And today, doing working backwards on the issue. So how do we fix this? I did not come here just to depress you. <laughs> How do we get the leverage to actually unrig this system? We started that question by talking to about three dozen of the best strategists, constitutional scholars, political operatives, and we said, could you craft laws that would fix this mess that I've just described? And the universal answer was yes, yours is a political problem. It is not a legal problem. That is a crucial fact. For example, you could fix our broken elections. You could stop political bribery. You could end gerrymandering with independent redistricting commissions, which we have seen five states through ballot initiatives pass in just the last six months. Before that, there were only two ever. There are now seven. We'll talk about more good news in a bit. Ranked choice voting, which is a innovative system used in eight countries around the world, 12 cities in the United States, where you can rank your choices. You no longer have to say, well, I'm gonna pick the less of two evils because if your winner doesn't win, your vote gets reapplied to the remaining candidates. It's a ballot that looks sort of like this. It works and it passed in the state of Maine and was used in federal elections for the first time last year. And you could do automatic voter registration, which makes it so that everybody is just opt in, they're opt out 
voter registered. That means everyone's just automatically registered, and if you move, it's updated because you're being updated through interactions you already have with the government, like getting a driver's license or food stamps or registering your car, vote from home. It's now the law in four states, four states that have passed it in the past few years, which makes it so you have your ballot at home for two and a half weeks. I mean, you know that every time you vote, you get down ballot and you're like, I don't know who these people are. Vote at home makes it so that you can actually look it up. Automatic voter reg registration has passed in 14 states in the last six years. It's something that most people don't know about. You could fix the Electoral College. So get this, whoever gets the most votes actually wins the White House, which I know is a novel concept, but... <laughs> the, there is an interstate compact that is being worked on. There are now, I believe, 14 states that have joined it, and there's real promise that that's gonna happen. You could pass campaign finance and ethics laws. North Dakota passed a ballot initiative last year with the strongest transparency and disclosure rules ever enacted into law. So this can be done, and the, the trick is, is finding those policies that sit at the intersection of real transformative game-changing impact and political viability, meaning they can actually win. And what's interesting is when you take these policies that I've just outlined, and you call them the American Anti-Corruption Act, look what happens. 87% of Americans support them, 87%. 91% of Democrats, 83% of Republicans. Now the naive amongst you might say, nine out of 10 Americans support it. I'm sure Congress will pass it. But you also know that this is what's going on, right? You're asking the fox to put a lock on the hen house on this issue more than any other issue in America. And so when that happens, the only choice is to go around Congress. You have to go around Congress and pass laws at the state level. And you're aided by the fact that state law, not federal, regulates most aspects of elections in the US, including primaries, the eligibility of voters, the running of each state's electoral college, as well as the running of state and local elections. That is power and it's been proven by history. Bloomberg did a study that looked at the arc of a few issues, these are just three of them, over time. And look at this, how change happens. Let's look at women's suffrage. The, the horizontal line is time, so that's 1890 to 1920. The vertical are states. You see a few states that pass women's right to vote in Wyoming and Utah, bet you didn't know that was the place it started, a few more states over time until there's this blue line. So note the blue line. Let's look at a longer arc. This is 180 years from 1787 to 1967, interracial marriage, a few states. They go 70 years without any real change. So, you know, conventional wisdom, I'm sure, was you guys, it's never going to happen. And eventually, blue line, shorter arc from 2004 to 2014, same-sex marriage. Again, our state, Massachusetts, and then a few more states, and then eventually blue line. The conclusion of the study <clears throat> was that a key event, often a court decision or a grassroots campaign reaching maturity, triggers a rush of state activity that ultimately leads to a change in federal law. History shows that this is what you do when you run into insurmountable obstacles in Washington, DC. So our goal is to replicate their success by passing these laws from coast to coast at the city and state level to fix our democracy, but with three innovations. One, right-left coalitions, two, corruption, and three, a movement. What do I mean by that? This is how the American people self-identify. Are you liberal, moderate, or conservative? Only 26% of Americans self-identify as liberal. 35% is moderate, 35% conservative. But for the last 40, 45 years, efforts to fix democracy have lived here on the liberal side. Meanwhile, these folks overwhelmingly support all of the policies that I just outlined at the, at the outside of this, of this presentation. So we have to embrace them and bring them in. Number two, money in politics, gerrymandering, election reform, campaign finance reform elicits this response in a healthy human being. <laughs> but if you ask people about corruption, is it very important to you to reduce the influence of corruption in politics, as opposed to money, say, you see a 30-point increase in conservative reactions saying yes. So if you wanna bring a bigger piece of the pie in, change how you talk, and three, movement, 3.5%. What is that? 
there was a study done by a Harvard professor recently that looked at political movements in the United States and around the world between 1900 and 2006, 106 years, and found that every political movement that had active involvement by more than 3.5% of the population prevailed. Every single one. For us, that means we need active participation from 11 million people in the American democracy movement to pass, to implement, and to protect these laws. Now, here's the good news. I alluded to it earlier. In 2018, we saw more democracy reforms pass in the United States than at any time in our nation's history. That's an applause line. Look at this map. It's stunning. I mean, from coast to coast, you saw resolutions to reverse Citizens United. You saw the anti-gerrymandering in Missouri and Michigan and Ohio and Colorado and Utah. You saw ranked choice voting in Maine. You saw ethics and transparency in North Dakota and Arizona. You saw automatic voter registration in Nevada. The list goes on, getting us closer to that rush of state activity that ultimately leads to a change in federal law. So as we look ahead to 2020 and beyond, we're seeing a raft through ballot initiative and through lobbying legislatures and city councils, anti-gerrymandering, automatic voter registration, all of these different reforms that I've, that I've rattled off earlier. And you start to see a future for this country that gives one a, a cause for hope. This was 2018. In a few years, if we do this right, it'll look like this. And in a few years after that, it will look like this. If we work together, we will get closer to that blue line. And if we do that, we will have a country. We will manifest a country where politicians put country over party, where voters matter more than big donors, where we have real meaningful choices when we go to vote on election day, where we have civility and compassion defining rather than defying government where we have sanity in government, and where your, where your issue, where your issue that you thought about at the outset of this presentation actually moves forward in an intelligent and rational way. This is how we get the leverage. So I want you to just keep something in mind. It's not easy. It wasn't easy for this woman who was fighting for her right to vote. It wasn't easy for these people fighting to end the segregation of schools. So I am imploring you to think differently, to make this issue at least part of the issues that you fight for, to leave your comfort zone and to be part of this fight to get 11 million people united behind a better democracy. So whether you do it for love of country or your kids, that's why, that's why I do it. I want all of you to do what I did when I got back from Peru and make this world better together. Get involved. Go to represent us. We don't take you in as a member. We share you with this movement and tell you where there's good stuff happening, where you can be part of it. But join us to unrig the system. Thank you very much. Okay, now, okay, now Robert Reich. Robert Reich's going to... Now this video by Robert Reich is going to explain the 10 steps to save American democracy. And then, and then I'm going to go further in depth into the, into those pro in depth into them. And for those that I don't, and for those that I don't fit, you could, and for those that I don't fit, you can click that little, uh, and for those that I can't fit in the video, you can click that little I button at the top t to be redirected be directed to one. Okay, without further ado. Let's get started. Ten steps to save American democracy. The midterm election saw massive turnout, but also massive failures of our democracy. 
As big money floods our political system, and some in power are intent on making it harder for certain people to vote, we need a movement to save our democracy. Here are 10 steps. Number one, make voter registration automatic for all eligible voters, using information they've already provided the Department of Motor Vehicles or another government agency. This has already been implemented in several states, including Oregon, and it works. In 2014, just over one in five Americans were eligible to vote but did not register. Automatic registration would automatically change that. Number two, pass a new Voting Rights Act, setting uniform national voting standards and preventing states from engaging in any form of voter suppression, such as voter ID laws, the purging of voter rolls, and inaccessible and inadequate polling places. Number three, implement public financing of elections in which public funds match small donations, thereby eliminating the advantage of big money. Number four, require public disclosure of the sources of all political donations. Much of that is now secret, so no one is held accountable. Number five, end the revolving door between serving in government and lobbying. Members of Congress, members of their staffs, federal employees, they too often take lucrative lobbying jobs after leaving government. In turn, lobbyists take important positions in government. This revolving door creates conflicts between the public interest and private greed. Number six, ban members of Congress from owning specific shares of stock while they're in office. Require that they hold their investments in index funds so they won't favor particular companies while carrying out their public duties. Number seven, require that all candidates running for Congress and the presidency release their tax returns so the American people know of any potential financial conflicts of interest before they're elected. Number eight, eliminate gerrymandered districts by creating independent redistricting commissions. Some states, Arizona, California, Michigan, and Colorado, for example, have already established nonpartisan commissions to ensure that congressional maps are drawn fairly without racial or partisan bias. All other states should follow their lead. Number nine, make the electoral college irrelevant. The presidency should be awarded to the candidate who receives the most votes, period. States should agree to award all their electoral college votes to the winner of the popular vote by joining the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Ten, and finally, fight for a Supreme Court that will reverse its Citizens United decision, which interpreted the First Amendment to prevent Congress or state governments from limiting political spending. Follow these ten steps and begin to make our democracy work again. Thank you, Robert Reich. So now you know the 10 steps. Let's get, let's get right to work. What do you think? In your opinion, how can we restore a government of the people, by the people, and for the people? If you found this video helpful, be sure to also watch our video of the three things you didn't know about money and politics with Heather McGee. And as always, be sure to subscribe to this channel for more videos like this one. Thank you, move on. And inequality media, civic action. Now, first up is the. Now, first up is the is voting, voting rights. Voting passing the Voting Rights Act, and and this Voting Rights Act is in memory of John Lewis, civil the the last civil. The last of the big six civil rights leaders. I, st I still wish that I could have met him. This video is by Bernie Sanders, so let's get started. 100 years ago, in 1920, women secured the right to vote. It took 72 years and was not easy. When half of the adult people in the United States who were considered citizens could not vote, 
you really didn't have a functioning uh, democracy. The 19th Amendment was ratified on August 18, 1920, giving women the right to vote. Of course, that is not actually the end of women's quest for voting rights because many women were not able to vote after the 19th Amendment was approved. The 19th Amendment gave basically white women the right to vote. People of color were routinely prevented from voting. African Americans had to pay poll taxes and pass literacy tests before they could vote. They were harassed and intimidated. So race played a very heavy part in who was going to vote, even after the 19th Amendment had been ratified. One of the main reasons I believe we must vote is I had an opportunity to march with Dr. Martin Luther King and the late Congressman John Robert Lewis. I watched Bloody Sunday, and I watched people being killed in order for the Voters' Right Act of 1965 to pass. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 prohibited racial discrimination in voting. However, voter suppression, suppression tactics remain prevalent today. Anybody who is suppressing the vote, anybody who is intentionally trying to keep people from voting because that candidate knows that those people will vote against him or her, that person is a political coward. That person is undermining American democracy. Voter, voter suppression tactics, voter ID laws, making it difficult to register to vote, gerrymandering, purging the, poll, the voting rolls. Purging the, purging the voting voting rolls, cutting early, cutting early voting, closing polling locations, inaccessible voting methods also suppress participation. You know, all all that that that, that was just explained should be considered a crime against democracy. There's many ways that voting are inaccessible to people with disabilities. People that have mobility disabilities may not be able to access their polling place. Even now during COVID, you know, we're thinking vote by mail, that's a great system. But how is it that somebody who has a visual disability is gonna be able to vote by mail? If we believe in a vibrant democracy, we want to have the highest voter turnout in the world, not the lowest. And we must oppose ruthlessly and as hard as we can any effort to suppress the vote. As a first generation immigrant to the United States, I believe in the power of the vote. We need to get involved in our politics and make things better and to make sure that we have a seat on the table. I think when we look at the women's suffrage movement, we realize that these rights should not be taken for granted. We women, black women, white women, we have to get together again, like we did in the early part of the, of the 19th century. We should never give up the fight to make sure that everyone has the right to vote and that their vote counts. This is not a personal Dang ads. class. This is a personal disruption class. I'm Vishen Lakiani, I'm the founder of Mind Valley and the author of the Code of the Extraordinary Mind. Okay, now we're going to talk about gerrymandering. We're going to get an in-depth look, how to in depth in depth look at it and how to and how to undo it. How to stop it, if you know what I mean. So Hi, I'm Craig, and this is Crash Course Government and Politics, and today I'm going to talk about a topic in American politics that tends to drive people crazy! Ah! No, it's not partisanship or horse race journalism or the state of political punditry, although we could easily do episodes on all three of those, and we might. Nope, today we're going to look at the election districts and how they shape electoral outcomes, and that means, you guessed it, 
we're going to talk about gerrymandering. Thank goodness. Gerrymandering is a blight on our American election system. It completely thwarts the will of the majority, and it's responsible for our lopsided House of Representatives. Not so fast, my left-wing sore loser friend. Gerrymandering is not nearly as responsible for the 2014 Republican Congress as the fact that people like you self-segregate into urban enclaves of socialism. All right, calm down, clones. Gerrymandering is a little more nuanced than that. Let's talk it out. <laughs> Congressional apportionment, how many representatives each state gets, is super exciting, even though it, it only changes every 10 years. Since the number of representatives each state gets is based on population, it's important to know how many people are in each state. That's one reason, at least in the Constitution, that we have a census every 10 years. The most populous state, California, has the largest number of representatives, 53, and the least populous states have only one. Sorry, Alaska, Delaware, the Dakotas, Vermont, and Wyoming, and Montana, and the state of loneliness. One is the loneliest number. In those sparsely populated states, figuring out the election district, which geographic area is represented by a congressman, is easy because there's only one district. This makes elections in these states effectively at-large elections, like a state's choice for senator. Even though there are two senators from each state, they represent the entire state at large rather than only a part of it, like representatives are supposed to do. The Electoral College, the system through which Americans choose their president, are also a type of at-large election. The rest of the states are divided into what are called single-member districts. This means that each election district chooses one representative. Now, you might think it would be simple to divide a state into as many pieces as it has representatives, but why would you think that? Nothing is simple. Districts are required to be equal, or almost equal, in population, and in most states, populations are not evenly distributed across the entire region. The notion that election districts must encompass equal population is the 